And all right. Um, the first thing up will be roll call. However, um, as Chief of Staff Jeffries um, indicated before we do that, um, Alder Stoyer asked me to, um, as the chair of the committee, um, asked me to indicate um, and communicate that we will be implementing a speaker time limit um, in light of the very, very robust agenda that we have this evening, uh, essentially to ensure that everyone has a fair opportunity to participate and to speak um, and to voice their thoughts and comments on the variety of items that we have on the agenda tonight. Uh, the time limits are similar to what we have in council meetings, um, so it should be familiar um, that five minutes per all order um, twice on each um, agenda item and three minutes for members of the public uh, when the floor is open for public discussion. Uh, with respect to item number five, um, I know there was a little bit of a confusion uh, with some members of the public that wanted to participate uh, in discussion on that particular item. Uh, the public speaker um, for that item will have five minutes for presentation um, as that item was a direct communication um, uh, filed by Alder Gavin, Galvin on behalf of the constituent. So in lieu of Elder Galvin presenting to the committee, the, um, the constituent will be, will be taking that five minutes to, to do their presentation. And then thereafter, uh, any members of the public that, that wish to comment um, on that item, once the floor is open, will have three minutes each. Um, and then uh, staff will have a stopwatch, um, I believe shared on the screen for those that are um, viewing on Zoom via web, um, and that will indicate the time for each speaker. Otherwise, we will give um, a, uh, a warning when, when that time is approaching uh, the end and when it is uh, completed. So with that, um, Alder Stoyer, I turn it back to you, and we can start with roll call. Okay. Thank you again, Attorney Bungard, for doing that. And uh, uh, let's get a roll call first. Uh, Alder Stoyer, I am here. Do we have Alder Vanderleest? You're on mute. Present. Uh, Alder uh, Stevens. Present. Alder Lefebvre. Here. All present and accounted for. All so right, next. we are on to the approval of the agenda. The approval of the agenda. Do we have a motion? I move. So moved by Alder Lefebvre. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Stevens. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? That passes unanimously. And approval of the minutes. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Motion by Stevens. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Vanderlees. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All, all opposed? That passes unanimously. All right, we are on to item number one. Okay, regular business, number one. <clears throat> Consideration with possible action on an application for a Class B combination license for Trista's Lunchbox LLC at 1542 University with a licensed premise is as main floor, bar, coolers, pool room, back office, tiki bar with indoor, outdoor patio. Previously discussed at the June 8th Protection and Policy Committee meeting, previously licensed as Elisa Marie LLC staff. Yeah, so this was uh, referred back to the committee uh, from our last council meeting um, as there wasn't a signed stipulation agreement in the, in the report or in the packet. Um, I did reach out to uh, Lieutenant Mahoney who is um, signed on um, and uh, so he can speak to it a little bit further, but. Um, there was a, a stipulation agreement signed by the licensee and um, we're not sure why it was just inadvertently um, not uploaded or included in the packet um, but I will defer to Lieutenant Mahoney with additional information. Okay. As Lieutenant. Attorney Bunger said the, the stipulation and the business plan was done. Uh, we do apologize there some got lost in terms of when I submitted back over to the city clerk's office uh, but it was done uh, in fact, I went back out and double checked the business. Uh, they do have cameras up and the police department has no issue with them having a license. So, so we're good both on law and, and police. 
Okay. I would entertain a motion to approve. Motion by Vanderlees to approve. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Stevens. All any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? That passes unanimously. All right, item number two. Okay, number two. Consideration with possible action on the Class A liquor and Class A beer license for Mi Favorita Supermarket LLC at 1908 East Mason Street with a licensed premise description of coolers previously licensed as Mi Favorita Supermarket staff. A law department has no objection. Police. No, please concur. That would entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Motion by Vanderlees. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Stevens. And here the discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed. That passes unanimously. All right. Item number three. Number three. Consideration with possible action on a Class B combination license for Little Jamaica LLC at 1332 South Broadway with a license description as bar area two small closets, bathrooms, closet at back entrance, small attic, outdoor patio, side yard, previously licensed as Sunshine and Wally's Bar, Inc. staff. Yes, so this is a new bar, um, but a previously licensed location. Um, it was sur surrendered prior to June 30th. It's in the Broadway moratorium, but um, it does qualify as an exemption as the uh, location was previously licensed within the 60 day surrender window. Um, it, the outdoor patio and side yard complies with our ordinances. It's impervious to um, the passing of drinks and it's uh, six feet in height. So accordingly, law department has no objection. And police? Uh, please concur. Okay, I would entertain a motion. Uh, Mark, Mark. Yes, go ahead. Do, do, they, do they feel, uh, from the pictures I got you, they feel that they have enough spacing on that patio, you know, with social distancing and that. You can't tell exactly from the picture, but it did look, you know, a little small, but I just, I just got the question. That I'm not sure um, as far as what their plan is for so social distancing or if they are gonna be taking advantage of any um, of the, um, well, there's any of the temporary expansions or if they're mm -hmm. doing a temporary sidewalk cafe, but those are always available to them if they feel that there is not enough room, but there wasn't a concern that was expressed by the licensee. Okay. Okay. Are you okay, okay with that? Have that question. Sure. Okay. Well, I would entertain a motion. Make a motion. motion to approve. Motion by Stevens. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Second by uh, Lefebvre. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? That passes unanimous, unanimously. All right, item number four. Number Excuse four. Cons uh, number four, consideration with possible action on a Class B beer and Class C wine licensed by Aldo's Pizza of Green Bay LLC at 1247 Belt Avenue with a licensed premise as cooler, dining room, currently licensed as an individual, Gene Cleary. Yeah. yeah, so this is not a new location. This is a, just a legal entity change from an individual to an LLC. Um, it is in the Fort Howard moratorium, but it's accepted because it is a restaurant. Um, law department has no objection. Okay. Uh, police. Uh, please concur. Okay. I would ent entertain a motion. Motion, motion to, to approve. approve. Motion by Stevens. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Vanderlees. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, that passes unanimously. All right, item number five. Number five, consideration with possible action on the 2020-2021 renewal application for a Class B combination license for Chip Stacks, Inc. at 416 Dousman Street with a change of agent. Yeah. Law department has no objection. Police. Uh, please concur. A motion. Motion to approve. Motion by Stevens. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Lefebvre. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? That passes unanimously. All right, item number six. 
Number six, consideration with possible action on a renewal application for the 2020 2021 license year for Strats Inc. at 2850 Humboldt Road, submitted June 29th, 2020. Staff. Yes, so this location is currently not, not operational and um, they've made their intentions clear to the clerk's office that they're not intending on, on opening back up and going into business. Um, our ordinance does require that licensed establishments are operational on an in continuous use unless otherwise authorized by council. Um, accordingly, the um, recommendation is to deny um, as the licensee has no intention of operating this establishment. Um, I do want to note that um, I don't know if this has been brought up with our new committee um, since our election in April. Um, however, when um, whenever we do deny a licensee or um, deny a, a renewal application, we do have to state for the record the basis for that denial. Um, and in this case, the basis would be um, to deny as the premise is not operational and would violate section 33.06 of our Green Bay Municipal Code. So you're, den you're in denial for this? Correct. Okay. On the basis that it's not operational and would violate our ordinances. However, council does have the authority to give them additional time if they so um, wish. So would the case be to, if we denied this, to give us a deny and then give them a stipulation as to what to do to get up to code or what no the only way that they would be able to get up to code would be to open up um and they've indicated that they they're they're closed and they're not, not intending to open i believe their hope is to essentially try and sell the restaurant and to hold on to the license to be able to sell the restaurant license however um, there is no, you can't sell a liquor license. Um, right. Even if they sell the business, the new licensee would still have to apply for that particular license. Um, our process in order to be fair and equitable because we, we are up against our quota limit for available licenses um, is that it's unfair for other businesses um, who are ready um, and willing to go um, with a licensed establishment for other businesses to be holding on to their liquor licenses right. for an indefinite period of time, um, leaving others having to spend that $10,000 right. on a reserve. So to be cool. fair and consistent whenever there's a business that is not operational, doesn't have any intention, uh, our department's recommendation is to, is to deny um, right. unless there are some other um, surrounding circumstances that the license is there, wants to share. Is there a time frame on this as far as what's no. the last day for them to do this or not? Um, at this point, um, no. Okay. Um, they, I believe they, um, they renewed, but they renewed late. So they're shut down anyway. Um, and so they wouldn't, um, they just wouldn't resume business. Hmm. Uh, my my understanding. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm Go, sorry. Ahead, Kathy. Go ahead, Kathy. Yeah, my understanding is, and if I I think it's in our report, um, are there weren't there some that did not get in their um, applications to renew their um, liquor licenses? Weren't there some Class B in there? There are some. Um, that's going to be coming up in um, in number eight. Um, there were some licenses that um, no action was taken for the 2020, right. 2021 year. Um, I believe that would be bringing seven back. Right, okay. so, so so my motion would be to deny it right now. And if they do sell the restaurant, there's a good possibility that there will be uh, one of the class B liquor licenses still available. Mm -hmm. Because cause we don't, but we don't know how long, you know, he, would take to sell the the business, so I think that I think really we have to deny it right now. So my motion is to deny it. I, I just that sounds good, uh, uh, Lieutenant Mahoney. I just wanted to hear your take on that. Uh, we concur with law. Um, I know I've driven by the business numerous times over the past month, and they've been shut down or closed down um, uh, before the whole COVID thing that I recall. So they haven't okay. been open for quite a while. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay, we have a motion, do we have a second? I'll second. Second by Stevens, any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. 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 Oh, opposed? Nobody opposes, so it passes unanimously.
All right, and that it moves us on to item number seven. Consideration with possible action on the renewal applications for various liquor and or beer licenses for the 2020-2021 license year with approval of the proper authorities. See attached. Law department has no objection. Okay, police. Uh, please concur. Okay, uh, I would entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Motion second. by Vanderlees. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Stevens. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? That passes unanimously. All right, item number eight. Number eight, consideration with possible action on the release of the 2019-2020 Class B combination licenses to the pool of available licenses due to no action taken for the 2020-2021 license here. Staff. Law department has no objection. Okay, police. Uh, please concur. Okay, I want to entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Motion by Stevens, do we have a second? Second. Second by Van, or I'm sorry, by uh, Lafave. Any other discussion? Say aye. 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 All opposed? That passes unanimously. Do you hear that, uh, Attorney Bungert? I don't know, there's some kind of. There's a little bit of a feedback, yes. I don't know if we need to be on mute, some people, or what? Yes, we would recommend um, anybody that, that's not currently speaking to just mute their phone or their um, their device just to. Okay. Kind of curtail and, that, yeah, that background noise. Yes, and I will also make sure that um, any noise I hear, I will mute that person. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item number nine. Number nine. Consideration with possible action on a request by Hagemeister Park, Amy 25 North Washington Street, to amend their liquor license to include a sidewalk cafe permit adjacent to 325 North Washington Street. Staff. Uh, yes, the licensee has obtained a revocable occupancy permit from DPW um, in accordance with our ordinances um, and accordingly staff has no objection. Okay, uh, police. Uh, please concur. Okay, I would entertain a motion. Motion, motion to approve. approve. Uh, I'll give that one to Alder Vanderlist and seconded by Alder Stevens. Any other discussion? I, I have... oh, yes, go ahead. Um, yeah, to me, I wonder why they really need that. They got the big patio outside. I just don't understand why they want to expand even more. I don't know. It seems like, well, again, is there enough room, I suppose? I think part of it's the consistency of other businesses would have it on Washington Street. You know, it'd be hard to have it. I think that's part of it. That's just my thought. Mm -hmm. Attorney Bunger, was that... Yeah. I'm not, I'm not yeah. sure. Um, I, I know that Hagermeister does have a uh, fairly large square footage. Um, and while they do have that back patio, I'm not sure if that in, in just on its own is enough to, um, to be able to, to cover the amount of square footage that they're losing with social distancing for dine-in. Okay. But that I'm, that's, I'm, I'm just speaking as to my, my own observations as a patron. <laughs> So once COVID ends, Lisa, uh, will that does that change anything in terms of that, or that's just the way it is? This is just this is a permanent installation. Yes. So this isn't this isn't a temporary expansion. This is a permanent um, sidewalk cafe that they are that they are requesting. So um, if and when we are out of the, the pandemic situation, um, they will they will be able to continue to use this um, sidewalk cafe. Um, oh, thank, thank you. I didn't realize that was part of the, uh, I thought it was that they could continually use that. Thank you for that classification, clar clarification, sorry. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion and a second. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? That passes unanimously. All right, item number 10. Number 10. Consideration with possible action on a request by Scogan's Food Liner Inc. at 2430 University Avenue to amend their liquor license to include part of their parking lot for click and collect curbside pickup staff. Yes, so the licensee has submitted an operational plan in accordance with the ordinance 
Um, the, the plan was uh, reviewed by the police department and it has all the elements that are required in the, uh, in the ordinance. Um, police department has no objections and law department concurs. Um, I'll defer to Lieutenant Mahoney to Okay. As well. <laughs> okay, Lieutenant. Uh, after reviewing the plan, yes, we work with law. We have no objections to the plan at all. Okay, Father Lafave, did you have something? I know you, this was a concern of yours. Right, right. You know, we had denied this before, and then you, everybody, you know, <clears throat> the majority of the board went and changed the uh, ordinance. So not now we're approving it. Right. It well, it right. So we. That, yeah. So we previously we were denying um, staff's recommendation was to deny um, because we didn't have an ordinance regulating this type of activity. Um, and so um, I believe it was about a week ago or so the ordinance was published. Um, and so it's it's now officially part of our code. Um, and so festival resubmitted their request in accordance with those regulations. Um, which requires a variety of things to ensure that they're complying with state statutes, um, including that um, IDs are checked, that the sale is done by a licensed operator, um, um, that they have you know recording capabilities of the transaction and of the vehicle of the license plate, um, and that they also have the ability to cancel a transaction um, in the event that the person is not that the person placing the order and picking up is not um, of age um, or is potentially intoxicated um, or under the influence. So we, we set, out, um, set out all the parameters in our ordinance to make sure that, um, that the activity is, is in line with all, all state statutes and our ordinances and festival has submitted a plan um, to be operating in, in line with those ordinances. So therefore we don't, we don't have any legal objections. Father Lefebvre, Sorry, I was muted because my husband was doing dishes, making noise. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I know. There's nothing that you write. We can't stop him, no. And I just wanted to let everyone know, others who are waiting for other things to speak, to let them know that um, I tried to put in that this should have been just for the as long as the pandemic was, because otherwise then people can walk in. Their concern was that they didn't want to go in to get, you know, they order their groceries online, they want to do the liquor too. But that didn't happen. They just right. said open it up permanently. So that's the way it is. Thank you. Can't do anything about it now. Okay. A motion to approve. Motion to approve by Stephen, second. Other discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. I'm sorry, Alder Storyer, I had a little bit of a hiccup in my connection. Who was the second? I have a motion by Alder Stevens. Uh, and second, second by Vanderleest. Vanderleest. Okay. All right. I will log that in right now. <sighs> all right. Item number 11. Uh, 12. Okay, 11. Consideration with possible action on a request by Scogan's Food Liner, Inc. at 2250 West Mason Street to amend their liquor license to include part of their parking lot for click and collect curbside pickup. Staff. Staff has no objections. Again, the licensee has submitted an operational plan in accordance with the ordinance. Police. Uh, please concur. It's similar to the other one, but I well, want to entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Motion by Stevens. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Vanderleest. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? That passes unanimously. All right, item number 12. Number 12. A request by Alder Weary for an update with possible action on changes to the ethics ordinance policy that were requested in 2018 with explanation as to why it is taking so long while other newer programs, policies, and ordinances are placed ahead of this item. Um, I did get something this afternoon from uh, <clears throat> Attorney Chavez. I didn't really have a chance to really look it over. So I would defer to our law department to speak to this at the moment. Thank you, Alder Spurrier. This is Vanessa Chavez. 
Clear. So what is what is in the email is um, we've received a request um, from Alderary before this communication got put um, put onto the agenda, and so I provided the information to him, and I wanted to make sure that everyone was getting the same information. And so, um, essentially, what what we indicated is that the attorney, board, attorney, could you speak up a little bit? You're a little hard yeah, to hear. Yeah. Just a little bit more. We we need to hear you. Is that better? Yes. Okay. So what I was saying is that I had um, provided this information to Alder Weir and Alder Burnett, and I wanted to make sure that everybody was receiving the same information across the board, which is why I sent it to everyone. Um, but essentially, the reason that the ethics or doesn't come up is because we have a number of priorities within our department that have to be addressed, and the way we choose our priorities internally is based on um, potential for exposure to litigation. And so when there's potential for liability, it takes precedence over everything else that we're working on to make sure that we are bringing it back up to um, what needs to happen. So for example, our records retention schedule, um, it, that actually took a very long time for us to be able to put into the works because it required so much effort. But failure to comply with records retention schedule um, is one of the one of the biggest areas for liability for the city because we do have that um, legal obligation to provide that. So when we make our determinations uh, in our department, that's what it's based on. Um, and then as far as staffing goes, we have four attorneys within our department and we don't have overlap in what happens. We have a city prosecutor who doesn't do a um, drafting for the rest of the department just because there's not any availability to do it. Um, the deputy city attorney, she handles primarily all of the licensing stuff related to PNP, and she does a, a numerous contracts um, for the city. So her time is pretty much used up trying to make sure that the operations seem to happen on a day to day basis are happening. Um, we have a legislative attorney who is Attorney Mather, who handles a number of things for the, or has been handling all, all of the drafting for the city for um, the last year. Um, and it's just drafting ordinances takes a very long time. Like people look at these things and think that it's a really um, simple process to put them together, but to make sure that they are um, internally consistent, that all of the, the issues with them have been thought out. Um, it takes time to get those put into place properly. And when we have rushed through in the past, you'll notice that we've had to come through and bring you back revisions because we have to get those those um, ordinances clean because they affect the entire populace. And then, um, obviously, I handle everything else within the department. And so we just we just haven't had a chance to bring it um, to the forefront. Okay. Um... You know, I, you know, I understand. I, I understand you folks are busy with with a number of things, but you know, every once in a while, some of the alders may want to know, you know, why what's taking this and that. And I would think that a lot of it could be done in house if we would ask. Um, I, I don't know. That might be your preference, but there are times where we just need information. We just want to know, you know, what the process is and if we're on schedule or or what. So, so what do we, Chairman? Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Alder Lefebvre. Yes, um, I want to know um, how can I put in a request for the um, something I would like to see written into the F ethics ordinance? Uh, um, I, you can just talk to us about that as we're making the revisions to the code. Um, we do accept revi um, recommendations or requests from the alders directly, so we will consider anything that you provide to us. Okay. I should send something into the law department. Okay. I don't know who's. <laughs> we got to mute. We got to mute some people here. It's distracting. Sorry. All right. Do we have? Are we back to normal here? Okay. What? Uh, what do we? What do we need to do here? The motion would, if, if the committee doesn't have any action, the recommended motion would be to receive and place on file. I'll make that motion. Okay, by Alder Lefebvre. Do we have a second? Second. Alder by Steve, no, second by Stevens. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? That passes unanimously. All right, item number 13. Well, 
13, okay. Consideration with possible action on a request by Alder Scannell to make a city ordinance requiring, requiring employees in the public and social situations to wear masks and practice social distancing. Um, before we start, uh, I know there's a lot of folks that have called in on this issue and either by phone, via email. Um, I would ask everybody to be respectful. Civility is very important here and we need to honor that. So as Attorney Bungard said before, we'll have like three minutes, correct? For, correct. for maximum on that. But I would defer initially to Alder Scannell who brought this forward and um, we'll get it going. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have to leave. I have to leave, guys. I'll okay. be right back. We'll, we'll get you later. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Alder Scannell. Okay, just quickly how we got here. Uh, of course, COVID-19 hit, uh, hit the United States at Wisconsin, ended up shutting down to get that under control, that uh, we were shut down for about a month and that worked. Then uh, we started to want to open up uh, our economy again. Uh, I was all for that. We, uh, staff did a great plan for uh, starting to open up. And at the same time back then, the county was considering a face mask uh, mandate, which I thought would be necessary for us to open up. Since nothing has changed since COVID-19 has hit us. We got, it got it under control because we completely shut down. We know a little, little bit more about it. We know that if we open up, we can do so following some simple safety measures and we won't end up like for Florida, Texas and Arizona. Uh, the county, uh, decided that they could not go forward with this. And so since our federal, state, and county has uh, decided to pass on this, it's up to us as a city to uh, look to our safety. Uh, we have the authority to do this, the legal says, so I'm pushing this forward as uh, the responsible thing to do. Uh, I don't believe that we can open up safely unless we have safety measures. Since this has started, I have gotten uh, a lot of support and a lot of negative uh, uh, and I think a lot of that will come out I'm not going to speak to that except for uh, uh, there is one group uh, uh, foster parenting I think they're here they'll speak for themselves but I think they've got an interesting story to tell uh, but I, what I want to speak for is the businesses and workers I have heard from who are afraid to speak up and looking for their city government to protect them there are businesses and uh, workers out there who if, if they if they, since this has become a political flashpoint, wearing a mask, they are afraid to step up and, and, and require it. And if we do this, then it takes the onus off them. Right now, they're in a position where if we don't have these safety measures mandated in place, they have to deal and are dealing, this is what's going on, they are dealing with people who are not masking up, which puts them at risk and it puts all their loved ones at risk and if they decide well I'm not going to work or I'm going to shut my their uh, financial security at risk so I think it's just immoral to open up our economy and not have these basic safety measures in place it's all followed by the CDC guidelines um, the, I don't know if uh, my fellow alders received this today, uh, but a letter came out. Um, uh, it states that this, uh, we support your consideration and adoption of a citywide ordinance requiring face coverings in appropriate circumstances. Uh, the healthcare organizations in Green Bay we, uh, are committed to caring for all people in the region. Our ability to provide health care for all people in the region would be impaired if the number of COVID-19 cases requiring hospitalization exceeds our capacity. And there's more and more, but the healthcare professionals that have put forth this letter in, in supporting a face mask are Daniel Mayer, President, Aurora Bay Care Medical Center, Chris August, Augustian, CPA CEO, Bay Care Clinic. Christine Waleski, President and CAO, Bell and Health. Brian Charlier, 
uh, President and CEO for St. Vincent Hospital and St. Mary's Hospital Medical Center, and Ashok uh, Ra, uh, President and CEO of Prevea Health. So all our local health professionals support doing this. Um, what I'm looking for is to send this to staff uh, for them to look at best practices. I'm not looking for anything onerous. There's plenty of exceptions. There's only really uh, situations where social interaction between people not in your household should require masking up, and that's all I'm looking for. Uh, and that staff come up with something and bring that to our uh, common council next Tuesday so that we can pick it up as a council of the whole and hopefully... Uh, oh, so you have one more minute. Oh, well, okay. And uh, um, as far as enforcement, uh, just individually, I would not looking to be onerous again, started out with a small fine, and but if they're non-compliant again and again, the fines would increase, but there would be a significant fine for businesses not being compliant, who I expect to be the main ones who will be helping enforce this ordinance. So um, if there's any questions for me, that's basically all of it. Uh, to me, it's the people who are put in a hard place where either they're risking their health or their financial security that's just not right to put people in that position. We are in a position to help them. Um, and I think it's irresponsible for us not to help them. Uh, government is number one priority is public safety. Without public safety, you have anarchy, you have chaos, there's no governance. Uh, that's our number one job. And in the middle of a pandemic, following CDC guidelines, uh, I think it's the smart thing to do, it's the responsible thing to do, and it's the moral thing to do. It's immoral to put people in a position where they either have to choose uh, their financial security or their own health. That's just not right. So, uh, any questions for me? From well, um, committee? you know, all this scandal, I thank you for your comments. Um, I think what's going to happen is, you know, we have a lot of folks that want to speak to this. So, what's going to happen is I'm going to probably entertain a motion to open the floor shortly. And if there are questions that are directed to you, uh, you'll, you'll be there. So, um, I would, I would entertain a motion to open the floor at this time. Motion to open the floor. Okay. Seconded by Stevens. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? The floor is now open. Oh, so, okay, Alder Story, this is Celestine. So, yes. um, so for the people who have access via computer, uh, they have raised their hands. And okay. so, um, what I'm going to do is, uh, if you would just wait, your if you have the ability to raise your hand, that would be great um, in Zoom. If you do not have that ability, um, just unmute yourself and I will uh, get to you. And what I'm going to do, um, I'm, Alder, I'm gonna tell you who I can see on the, on the computer. I think you can probably see it too. Right. And um, then what I'll do is I, I will, uh, uh, acknowledge them and then I will put the timer on as soon as everyone sees the timer that you'll see you'll have your three minutes to speak okay all righty here we go Sounds good. All right. thank you Alder thank you everyone okay. um, please please be patient okay. as I share my screen yes, <laughs> thank, you. thank you <laughs> okay the first person is Elliot okay so Elliot what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna unmute you and share my screen all right, there we go. Okay, Elliot, okay, you're on. Me, right? uh, Elliot, are you on? Go ahead. Okay, uh, uh, the connection is super bad, so everybody keeps coming in and out, so I don't know if you guys can hear me at all. A little bit, go ahead. Is that a, is, can anybody hear me? Yes. Yes, yes you should probably keep no. talking. Yes, maybe. Keep talking. Okay, cool, all right. So. Uh, I have a tremendous number of concerns with uh, the super vague proposal. I, I love Randy, but this is super vague. And uh, uh, government's number one purpose is to protect freedom. So I will just start off with that preface. But uh, so uh, first and foremost, we need an end date for this. This cannot be just be perpetual. So uh, well, what's the end date? If we don't have a date, we need firm parameters as to when, you know, what the, what the, 
going to cause this to end? What's going to cause this mandate to end, right? Um, so then um, who? Who is this going to impact? Backing masks? Are we going to give tickets to two-year-olds who don't have masks? Are we going to give tickets to businesses that have two-year-olds in the business not wearing masks? Uh, I think that's a serious question. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hearing like, I don't, I don't understand. We have to really turn this stuff up. So, uh, what, what size of groups are we talking about now? Again, are these groups of two, six, eight, ten, twenty, thirty? What distance? Is it? Six feet? I heard thirty feet indoors, outdoors, everywhere, all the time. I was at a birthday party. There were two-year-olds. Does everybody have to have a mask at a family event because we're outdoors and within, you know, shouting distance of other people? Um, and then uh, how are we actually going to enforce this? Uh, are we going to have the police running down, up and down the streets uh, when we already said we want to defund the police? This seems, this seems sort of ridiculous. Uh, what exactly is a mask? I don't think we've ever defined that. I think we're gonna have an ordinance. We need to define what a mask is. I know I'm gonna run out of time. Uh, trying to pick and choose what the most important things are here. Uh, how are we gonna ensure that this is not racist? Um, when people have masks on, uh, you know, we, uh, we, have, we have problems where we tend to target people of color. How are we going to write into the ordinance that we, that we are gonna protect people of color in this? What about poverty? Are we gonna provide masks for free? Uh, and what about the eating and drinking issue? Am I going to be uh, exempt as long as I have a straw hanging out of my mouth? If I'm walking up and down the street with a Diet Coke, uh, what if I have a taco in my hand? Am I exempt? Uh, you know, all of these things need to be answered if it's going to be an ordinance. This could be a suggestion. It could be a recommendation. I would recommend it. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you, Elliot. Um, I was going to ask Attorney Bunger, do I need to close the floor? I had a question to ask of uh, the attorney. No, you don't need to close the floor. All right. Well, I guess I should have brought this up right off the bat. I guess I, I wanted to ask uh, staff or law department, is it possible for the city to impose an ordinance imposing or I, I want to know if if you don't know, then, then I would, you know, I would like to look into that to see if we we would need to table this to another time. You know, I know there's a lot of people here to speak to the matter, but you know, if we, I don't want to waste a lot of time. If if you feel that our our law department feels that this is attorney Chavez, yes, this is something that would be, would qualify as under the um, council's powers to regulate for the public health, safety, and welfare. So then we can continue as, as stated. Yes. Okay. I just needed to clarify that. All right. The floor is still open. So Celestine. Uh, yes. Know. Give me just, I'm sorry, Alder, uh, Alder Story. Just give me one minute. Okay. It's a good looking crew here, by the way. You too, Randy. And you too, Mike. <laughs> it was rubbing her head. Okay. All right. Uh, All right, one second. And the next person is um, TH. And just give me one second. I unmuted you, TH, or you can unmute yourself, and I will share the screen. And TH, are you unmuted? I am. Can you hear okay. me? Yes. Okay. Go right ahead. Okay. Do you need my name and address, or yes, name and address yes. would be fine. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Tina Hollenbeck, five fifteen South Irwin Avenue, five four three zero one. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay. I actually need to take great offense at what Alder Scannell has said about the health risks. Um, I think we need to take into account that the um, stay at home order and all of that ended on May 13th, officially May 15th, I think when Brown County ended its thing. And so that's almost two full months. And if we look at the real data in Green Bay since then and Brown County since then, um, we are not seeing a spike in hospitalizations or deaths, we're not even seeing a spike in cases in Brown County. I know they're doing more testing, but if we look at the number of people who are really sick, since things began to reopen, the evidence here 
does not say that people in Green Bay are putting other people at risk. Um, I think it'd be perfectly fine for people to voluntarily wear masks. And if I see someone who's wearing a mask, um, even if I don't. And that's a thing that we need to take into account. Um, uh, Alder Scannell was stated in, in a news report saying that those of us not wearing masks are threatening the health of other people. But if masks work, then a person who is concerned and wearing a mask is safe from anybody else. If they're scared, then maybe the masks don't work. But my other issues that I need to bring up that we need to consider are this. Um, there are people with serious respiratory health issues that cannot wear a mask. There are people like myself who are rape survivors who would get PTSD from wearing a mask. And if we go out in public without a mask, are we gonna be harassed? Are we gonna have the police department telling us we have to disclose publicly to a store owner why we can't wear a mask? That's a complete breach of privacy and it violates HIPAA and the ADA besides. And so we need to keep that into account. And the devastation economically that would happen in Green Bay if you pass mandate um, would be horrendous because many people will go out of Green Bay to Howard, De Pere, Bellevue, any place else, and they'll spend their money there. So as our businesses in Green Bay are trying to recover from the lockdown, the worst thing we could do is say that we're going to be sending people away because people will. Um, leave Green Bay. People have told me they will not shop in Green Bay anymore if there's a mask mandate. Um, and how do you protect the people who have can you call, reasons? Can, can, can you call? Um, how do you protect people who have reasons for not wearing a mask from being harassed oh, and bothered oh. by police or store owners or other customers? You can't. So let it be voluntary. If the board wants to say um, we recommend it, that's fine. But to say it's a mandate, I understand it. To say that this is a mandate is immoral. So I'll use Alder Scannell's words in that regard and say to mandate something like this is immoral. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Celestine? Yes, give me one second. Oh, okay. Uh, Alder Lefebvre is trying to get back into the meeting. Oh, is she? Just, okay. She can't Yes, I, when I'm sharing, thank you, you, Alder. When I'm sharing a screen, I can't I can't always see okay. who it's uh, So just All give right. me one. He's okay. working on it for you. Uh, oh, you know why? Um, because there are 100 people. I'm in the middle so, of the um, Perhaps. Yes, we'll try to get in. Attorney, right. attorney Chavez. Um, perhaps you can come back, go out and come back in later. Yes. I'm in on my phone and my computer. Okay. Can you, can you use one? Yep. Yes, yep. thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Alder Stoyer, can you yes. call Alder Lefebvre to try to come back in? We yes. only have a hundred participants. Thank you. Yes. Are you still there, Alder Lefebvre? Yeah. Okay. You're with us. Why don't you hang up and try try again? Try to get in. But yeah, try again. Okay. All right. She's trying to get back. Okay, I'm just waiting. Uh, how many how many uh, do we have? Uh, so we have probably eight people who've raised their hands. I see and, Bernie's, hand, Bernie's hands up. He's getting tired over there. <laughs> uh, yes. Okay. So Bernie, I, <laughs> I mean, I want to, I want to shake his hand, but I can't. They want to literally walk. raised your hand. Okay. So, um, so since you literally raised your hand, Bernie, I'm going to unmute you. Just give me one more second, please. Bear with me. I'm going to unmute you which I'm having to <clears throat> Bernie, can you unmute your, oh, okay, there I you go. Did. Okay. I just did. On, just hold on one second. Okay. <clears throat> All right, please give your name and address. Uh, Bernie Vondracek. I live at uh, 425 East Fox Run Circle, Green Bay, 54302. Great, thank you. Go ahead. Okay, I am uh, calling in support of the mask uh, ordinance. And I believe, at least in my humble opinion, that wearing a mask indoors because of the danger of community spread is uh, a major concern. I have uh, not so much of a concern uh, being outside where it's very, um, or, or it's much less spreadable from what my understanding is. 
Um, I, and the other, the other piece to that is in terms of like age type uh, issues, certainly I wouldn't be wanting to burden young children, uh, 10, and, 10 and younger, or, you know, in that area. Yeah. Nor would I want to burden people that have uh, health issues or mental health issues that might cause them problems. Um, I do believe that uh, we are very fortunate in Brown County because, or in Green Bay because we have uh, not experienced the same issues that they have in, say, Milwaukee County. Um, and I'm concerned that we don't want to get those kind of issues uh, uh, at even the broader um, uh, the broader perspective what happened in uh, Florida and that really concerns me um, outside again does not seem to be so much of an issue as it does inside um, I really enjoyed going up to Door County and seeing that any place that I went in Door County, if you went inside, uh, you were asked to wear a mask. Uh, outside, uh, people were wandering around as uh, without masks. And again, social distancing, I think, was a uh, is always a good idea when you're outside. Uh, I have uh, three of my children are in uh, in situations where they come in contact. One is a teacher, and I'm concerned, you know. Uh, when they go back to school that uh, uh, that somehow that they have some protection even though uh, the high school is you know can be problem oh, man my children are in health care and I don't want them burdened by an excessive amount of uh, people coming and having the COVID-19 uh, because masking or social distancing uh, was not practiced um, thank you very much for the time. I appreciate it. Everybody thank stay you, safe. Bernie. Thanks, okay. thanks, Bernie. Okay, give me one second. All right. Uh, can I, can I Mark, I am in. Oh, you are. Oh, good. 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 Awesome. Awesome. Is Bernie, is yeah, Bernie still you. on the line? Yes, I asked Bernie a question. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Bernie, you mentioned about Door County, and you know, maybe I'm wrong. I just read something about Door County uh, repealing this recently. Did you hear anything about that? I know that they voted that they were not going to pass an ordinance, uh, but I know that every place that I went, and we were in uh, Egg Harbor and in uh, Sister Bay, and any place that you would go into, there was uh, a request at the door, please have a, please wear a mask or we will provide you with one. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Welcome. All right, I'm, I'm Celestine. Okay, Go the ahead. next person is uh, Brenda's iPad. Um, so I'm going to unmute Brenda's iPad or Brenda's iPad. You can unmute yourself. Okay. And uh, uh, we'll wait for you to start talking. Oops. Okay. Say your um, name, and ad name and address, oh, please, Brenda. Brenda Bellinger, and I'm currently staying at 717 Linden Drive, Green Bay, Wisconsin, 54311. Okay, um, TH, who spoke uh, two people ago, literally echoed my feelings. I, too, feel it's immoral to shut, or not shut us down, immoral to force us to wear a mask. There are many, many sick people out there. I, for one, have asthma. My daughter has severe asthma. She is forced to wear a mask. She literally passed out at work being forced to wear this mask. And it's, it's just, again, unconstitutional to take our rights away. Um, we're literally being stripped of our, our rights. Um, I'm not trying to make this political and I don't have any questions for Randy. I'm just stating the facts that um, I strongly oppose forced mask use. Um, the reason we're getting more positives is because they're testing more. Of course, you're going to have more sick people because you're pushing the testing. If we weren't pushing this testing, I don't even think we would, any of us would even know it existed. Um, it's no different than any other year when we have flus. 
Um, and then also when you are wearing a mask, unfortunately, these a lot of people are being forced to wear them because of their employers. I've watched, I, there's any store you can go in and they are constantly, constantly touching their face. Somebody said to me, you know, I realize I touch my face more now than I ever have. So now you are touching your face after you perhaps have touched a dirty surface, you've getting the germs. I, I just don't believe that forcing people to wear a mask is the way to go. We are all adults here. We can make up our own decisions. I'm not trying to get somebody else sick. Um, if you want to wear a mask and be safe, you go right ahead, but don't force me to wear one. Um, oh, I was going to say something else. I lost my train of thought. You had 48 seconds. Yeah, I, I see that. Um, but I, I guess the bottom line is I oppose force children to wear masks is insane. Insane. Because if you're going to force a mask, they're, they're going to be forced to wear one as well. Um, oh, also, what about people who have had it already? Why should they have to wear a mask? I know one person in this whole entire state, one person that has had COVID. And guess what? She didn't even know she had it. She was forced to get tested because of the contact tracing. She had no idea she was even sick. So that's how mild a lot of this is. Oh, I see I'm done. But again, I echo and I, it's immoral. It's, it's unconstitutional and I don't agree. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, next Celestine, up. I just yes. wanted to say I wanted to say something. I I know there's a lot of folks that want to speak to this, but if if the folks are listening to what is being uh, spoken, you know, if you're repeating yourself at all, I would I would ask you to you know try to temper that as well as you can. If you come up with some new items in that, I would really appreciate it. If you have your personal opinions, I think it's very important. But uh, you know, just Try to avoid repeating if you can. All right, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Alder. Um, so the next person is Lacey Lewis. Lacey Lewis, can you please unmute yourself? And uh, I will share my screen here. Are you ready? Yep. Okay. Can yes, we sure can. Give your name and address, please. Uh, Lacey Lewis, 1216 9th Street, Green Bay, 54304. Okay, go ahead, Lacey. Okay, I am one of your public members who has a disability. I have not uh, been able to, number one, breathe out of my nose for the last four months due to severe sinus infections and allergies to put a mask over my mouth within 10 minutes of hyperventilating. I have started to see spots, I get headaches, I'm a, I'm a member of the society who has worked their way back from severe disability. I work with uh, people who have traumatic brain injuries. I take them around so that they can participate in the community. And most of my job is taking them in and out of stores so that they can get their tasks done. And everywhere we go, somebody is giving me a dirty look like I am immoral for not wearing a mask. I have heart murmurs. I have other problems with my health, but as somebody who is disabled, I should not legally have to identify my disability to every store owner. On top of the fact that most of those stores that are actually putting those mask ordinances into place are publicly traded companies, which means that the public owns a piece of that information. So regardless of that fact, out of the 200, or sorry, 200,000, uh, 266,408, we have had 2,238 positive cases, which is a equivalent of a 0.0084%. And that's people testing positive with corona in, in Brown County. Out of those people, 32 have died, which is a 0.00012% of the population. This flu, is no different than anything else. If you're going to start saying that people need to wear masks over their face when they are not ill, you're not actually protecting anybody. Number one, it's man-made material. Viruses can still go through it. You're breathing your own bacteria in all day long. It's very bad for people's health, and you're trying to make people into monsters 
who are not complying for other reasons. I too am a rape survivor. I don't want somebody's hand over my mouth. That's what a mask feels like on top of not being able to breathe out of my nose, on top of my heart murmur. There are many people like this in this community. Should we walk around saying disabled across our chest? How do you identify everybody? And small children should not have to wear masks either. It's very unhygienic. Have you ever known a little kid to stay clean all day long? How do you prevent that little kid from touching their surfaces, getting dirt on their mask, getting it wet? It doesn't prevent anything. You know, it's just a security measure is basically all it is. It's comforts people to make, you know, I'm sorry. Thank nervous, you so much. So. Your time has expired. Yep. Thank you, Lacey. <clears throat> Give me one second, Alder. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> and the next person is Jen Beyer. Jen Beyer, can you please unmute yourself? Hi there. Hello, Jen. What's your Jen, name? Oh, hi. Address? Give your name and address, please. Uh, Sorry, so, Alder. I think I stepped uh, on your toes there. <laughs> why don't you? You can do that, Celestine. I'm okay. With that. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Go okay. ahead. So my name is Jen Beyer, and I live at 2021 Parkwood Port here in Green Bay, 54304. Um, and I actually also own Air Force Gymnastics. Um, I've been a very proud business owner here in Green Bay for almost 15 years. Um, and I know we said we weren't going to speak to exceptions, but this greatly affects my livelihood. And I want to be sure to advocate for myself and my business partners and also, most importantly, my athletes and my customers. Um, I just want to be sure as this motion proceeds one way or the other that an exception for those exercising is considered. Um, the CDC and the World Health Organization, neither of those recommend mask wearing while exercising, particularly when social distancing can be observed. Um, and that's very easy to do for many of us that own these types of businesses in our area. We have very large facilities and we care very much about cleanliness and we care very much about our customers. So. I just wanna make sure that as this motion proceeds one way or the other, that that exception is considered um, as we offer services that cannot safely be provided while our athletes are masked. That's really all I have to say. <laughs> oh, well, very well, thank you, thank you, Jen. Okay, thank you guys. I appreciate the chance to, to get to speak. I have a question for Jen. Yes. Yeah. So, how many of the people in your establishments by chance wear a face shield? Um, we actually don't have any at this particular time. Um, we are requiring masks for all of our staff and we are requesting them for everyone that's in our lobby area. The athletes that are participating in gymnastics um, are not wearing masks at this time and face shields um, actually wouldn't be a good choice either because there's a lot of going upside down, they're flipping and twisting. I don't believe that either a face shield or a mask would stay secure, and I'm worried about potential um, obstruction of their vision, or in the case of the face shield, actually landing on that particular piece of equipment, which would not be safe. Okay, great, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you very much. Much. Jen, I'd like to ask you a question as well. Sure. So, have you noticed a, a, a downtick in your business because uh, you're staff are wearing masks and some people will not come in because of that or what is your take on that as far as your the thought of your business i mean it's really hard to say what the reason is i, we're, I mean we're currently at about 50 percent of our normal enrollment which isn't great um but that is allowing us to really double down on social distancing and cleaning and also i mean completely unrelated just offering a really great class that has a low um, level of students per staff member no one has really said to me that they're not going to come to the gym because the staff are wearing masks. And I am thrilled to keep my staff wearing masks. I am thrilled to continue to have them in my lobby. Actually having a mandate keeps me from being like the mask police. I can't have them on my athletes. Um, and so that's what I'm really, really requesting that considerations are made for gyms like mine, cheer gyms in the area, CrossFit gyms, gyms that can't safely offer their services to clients with masks on their clients. I'm thrilled to participate in every way that I possibly can. Um, we just can't have them on the kids when they're safe. Right. Thank you, Jen. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I have a question. I have oh, a go question ahead, again. Alder Lefebvre. Yes, um, I wanted to know too, uh, what type of uh, air conditioning and heating system do you have? Do you have 
filters in place that um, I guess there are some that work really well for different pa pathogens and things like that and if that would be an option to help you? Sure. We actually have three different HVAC units that work within, we have a 25,000 square foot facility, so it's a very large facility with very high ceilings. Um, and we have those filters switched out on a very regular basis because there's a lot of chalk in our facility and it helps keep our, our facility a lot cleaner. And if those filters aren't changed out on a regular basis, the unit actually doesn't work properly because the, clock, the chalk does clog the filter. Um, so we And we are running those units 24 seven just to keep new air coming in and old air coming out. Um, not only does it keep everyone a lot more comfortable, especially our staff who are wearing masks and are very hot, um, but it just keeps the gym just a lot nicer, more pleasant place to be in general. So I feel that's something we would normally do that's actually working to our advantage a lot in this situation and keeping the gym a healthy and safe place for everyone to be. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Actually, Jen, one more question. Do you feel that if a mandatory ordinance was put in place that that would take the pressure off of you to make that decision? Is that helping you with, you know, your business or not? I mean, provided that my athletes don't have to be masked, I have no issue with the, the mandatory ordinance. My only concern would be, you know, for me as a business owner, if someone chooses not to come in and wear a mask, do I have to then question them on their health care okay. needs? I don't wanna get into HIPAA violations. I don't wanna get into arguments with my customers about it. Um, but I would like to see more customers wearing masks in my lobby if I can. I mean, to me, the masks make people more comfortable to come back into my business and to get back to life as normal. And if they keep even one person healthier, I'm happy to do that. Um, but I do feel like it may put me in a bad spot as far as talking to my customers about why they're not wearing a mask. There are some privacy issues there for sure that I don't, that I don't really wanna get into policing. Okay. Well, thanks for your honesty. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I just want to acknowledge that we have Minister C. Johnson. Um, it looks like William Melinda Eck, Mike Shea Jr., Nicole Scal uh, Seleski, Andrea Johnson, Brown Co County Tavern League, Martin W., and Kimberly, Kimberly Voigt. Um, those are all the people that I see who've raised their hands. So I'm going to go through that list. And then I will also just make sure that if there's anyone who basically has unmuted themselves and is waiting to be heard, I will get to you um, after I get to those folks. Okay, so next is Minister C. Johnson. Minister C. Johnson, can you please unmute yourself? I'm currently unmuted. Okay, awesome. Just give me one second. Sorry, give me one second. All righty, go ahead, give your name and address, please. Minister Conardo Johnson, 1525 Capitol Drive, Green Bay, 54303. Okay. All right, um, I just wanna say that I am completely for uh, the mask mandate, the ordinance to wear masks. Um, the more people I see with masks, the more comfortable I feel. I understand like, um, as far as like uh, health conditions and and things of that nature. I believe those are some some valid points. Um, I myself went through a very um, extreme surgery on my throat and nose where um, I was in the ICU for um, almost a month going in and out there. But I still wear a mask because I wanna be able to protect the next person. Um, I think that a lot of times we still have the misconception that people only put on masks to protect themselves, but the CDC and the WHO has completely and um, consistently told us that wearing a mask protects the next person from the droplets that you spit out of your mouth. Um, even speaking a normal phrase, the droplets come out, sneezing and coughing, of course, expels it a lot harder and a lot further. You know, So wearing a mask helps protect the next person. When I walk into a business, um, especially a food um, type of place that serves food, I hate to see anyone that's um, serving not having on a mask. In those type of instances, I pretty much walk back out because then that, that to me is, um, you're putting yourself, you're putting me and other people in danger. The, um, the fact that number of cases, um, as far as percentage goes, I don't believe that we should wait to more people to die in order for us to say, hey, let's start wearing masks. I believe that'll be going the opposite and doing something very backwards. Um, 
me and my family, we have lost three people to COVID-19. And um, we believe and know that this is a very real thing. And I understand that like um, not that many people have died in, in Brown County, but the people who have died and their families, like those families, it's a very real thing. And I believe that wearing a mask can really help a lot of people. It's been shown that, it's been proven scientifically. So I believe that that's the way that we should go. Thank you. Thank you, Carnado. Thank you very much. Okay. That's great. We'll just hold on, Alder. Um, uh, Celestine, is there, is a Leanne Kramer trying to get in? I just, she's calling me. That, that's because there are 100 people in the meeting. Okay. And um, we only have room for 100 people. I see. Okay, um, Alder Scannell. Go ahead. I would just like to just offer my condolences. That's all. It's just very sorry for your loss. Thank you, Alder Scannell, for that. We, we concur. Okay, the next, thank you, Alder. Um, the next person is, it looks like William Melinda Eck. I will please unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go right ahead. Okay, address, um, so I know that a lot of people have already said- oh, Sorry, your name and address, please. Oh, I'm opposed to the ordinance. So, excuse um, me, Ms. Eck. Oh, Melinda, what's your address? Give your name oh, and address. I apologize, uh, Melinda Eck. 1634 Bert Johnson 54304. Did you get that, Celestine? Yes, that's right. Go right ahead. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I am opposed to this ordinance. Of you in an email, but I also wanted to join into the meeting. Um, and without repeating what other people have said, um, some of the things that I want to add is. If you look at the box, um, those masks that that um, people wear that are, I guess, quote unquote, disposable masks, it says right on the side of the mask that it does not protect you from, some of them actually specifically say the coronavirus. So with that said, it seems pointless to require people to wear a mask and they may say that it keeps you other people from you but if it goes through one way it comes through another um i'll i could tell you a few experiments i did with the mass um with fine powders that went directly through in um and you know so i was just trying to myself see just how effective these masks are against things that are small particles. It didn't work because they came right through and right into my lungs. Um, so that, that whole point is, in my opinion, not valid. Um, I don't think we need more um, dates, something that actually is taking away someone, uh, it's taking away our rights to choose as um, you know, someone has said, we're as an adult, I don't think I need somebody to mandate me wearing a mask. One tenth percent death rate of this virus, which is actually less than the common flu. Um, and I also think that such a mandate would put extra burden on our law enforcement that they could be using their time wisely elsewhere. So um, there's been conflicting evidence or um, I guess things coming out of our CDC and the they change their minds on a regular basis and I've even seen some videos where they've said that masks are not effective and I think that it's a good point of people touching their mask or if they're not keeping it clean there's a lot of and I don't think that mandating wearing a mask is going to be effective in reducing the virus. I think that you know we've heard the com the herd immunity, and I theory before we're all you know going to be safe from it. I guess you would say. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. Just give me one second, Alder. Okay. The next person is Mike Shea Jr. Mike Shea Jr., please unmute yourself and give your name and address. Thank you. Mike Shea, I live at 2751 Woodstock Court, Green Bay, 54311. Go ahead, Mike. Thank you. Last night I sent a letter to everybody in the council. Um, I do hope that you each, if you have not yet, take time to read that email and that letter. It's filled with a lot of scientific studies and they are cited in reference to peer reviewed articles and specific statements um, at news conferences and such by medical experts from CDC, Mayo Clinic, Illinois Health Department, all of which point to why the general public wearing a mask can be more dangerous than not. Um, I would like to address a couple of things that were said. Um, first off, I'm a business owner as well, and Alderman uh, Scannell said that business owners and workers are afraid and they want this, and I can flat out tell you that is not something that you can make a blanket statement about. Um, as a business owner, the policy in my shop and for my customers is simple. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you don't, don't. We're not going to shame anybody. We're not gonna point anybody out either way. That's a personal choice at this point, And that's the way it should be. We talked about uh, Door County this evening. Somebody mentioned they went there and saw everybody wearing masks. Door County absolutely did not pass an ordinance requiring masks. The local businesses, the business owners will do what's right for the community. They'll do what's right for our customers. Um, you don't need to tell people what to do to make the right things happen if it's right for their customers and their community. A lot of misinformation right now and to pass a law or a rule or anything at the governmental level using misinformation, inconsistent data is irresponsible. Um, I also found that uh, using the terms immoral if you're not wearing a mask, if you read what I wrote last night and sent you, you will see how wearing a mask can be a problem. Not, for, not because of effects of your own health, that you have health conditions and whatever, but being untrained and wearing a mask has the potential to spread the virus more. Right now, our deaths are going down. That proves that we flattened the curve, done what we should do, and our excellent healthcare professionals have learned how to handle this. It's time for us to keep moving forward, looking for good data and making decisions based on good data, not based on emotions and not based on inconsistent data. We need to take a step back and see what's going on. Thank you, Mike. Um, I did read your uh, email. It was very comprehensive. You know, I, I find that a lot of the folks on both sides of the fence that are sending in emails um, or calling, some of them just say yes or no without a reason. And, and I, I will give you the credit that you, you put in a lot of effort on that email. So I appreciate that for either side. You know, if you can state your case well, uh, that helps us as alders. Thank you very much. Okay, next is Nicole Seleski. Nicole, please unmute yourself and give your name and address. Hello, my name is Nicole Seleski, representing the Wellness Way at 2638 Tulip Lane, Green Bay, 54313. Um, and so um, my name is Nicole Seleski. Like I said, I'm actually a family nurse practitioner. So um, I come with some medical background and um, with all due respect, they had said that all medical professionals are behind a mask mandate. And I can tell you as one medical professional, I am against it. Um, the cases are rising, which to the lay person may look like a concern. Some things to consider, of course, like we've already discussed that tests are more widely available. And now through contact tracing, the number of positive cases, you can read this on the CDC 
CDC website shows that it also includes probable cases, people that haven't even been tested, um, but have been in contact with someone that had it. In spite of more positive costs, um, cases, the hospitalization and mortality rate continue to decline. Mortality has been declining for the 11th week in the row per the CDC website. Currently, it's below the epidemic threshold. It's decreased from six uh, death 9% last week to now 5.5%, which is below the threshold of what's now considered an epidemic. Um, in the most recent states for Wisconsin, we currently have 85 patients in the ICU right now with a positive COVID-19 test. Um, and keeping in mind that some of these patients, anyone who is admitted to the hospital, say you come in for a heart attack, you and if in order for you to be admitted, you have to be swabbed for COVID so they know the proper precautions to take for you. So they could be in the ICU with a heart attack, but they're going to be counted as one of those 85 beds. Um, right now, we have 414 total ICU beds available in the state of Wisconsin, and so our hospitals are not um, overwhelmed in spite of no mask mandate. We've had 44 people die in Brown County because of the coronavirus thus far. Of 264,542 people in Brown County, that brings that percentage to 0.017%. Um, I hardly see this as a threat. Um, also, in 2015, a research article from the British Medical Journal um, by McIntyre et al. entitled A Cluster Randomized Trial of Cloth Mask Compared to Medical Mask in Healthcare Workers found that there was actually a 97% penetration rate um, in cloth masks and that it actually increased your rate for infection. This was published in 2015. I'm happy to send you the link. Um, but it's not, not about you. It's about protecting our vulnerable population. Well, if we go with the aerosol theory, well, aerosols can penetrate a mask, so you're not protected. If we go with the droplet theory, then um, if it travels via droplets, it has to come from a symptomatic individual. Forcing an individual to wear a mask is not enforceable. And so actually, the Wellness Way has actually hired constitutional lawyers. We have a document here that we've sent to each of you. We will not go down without a fight, and we have lawyers here to protect our rights um, in regards to this mask mandate. So thank you so much for your time. Nicole? Yes, Nicole, sir. did you yes? Did you say that you would send that to the council members? I would be happy to send that to the council members in addition to the research study if you'd like. Yes, I would. Thank you. Okay, the next person is Andrea Johnson. Ms. Johnson, can you please unmute yourself? Hello. Yes, go right ahead and give your name and address. Okay, my name is Andrea Johnson and I live at 387 Windward Road in Green Bay, 54302. And I just want to thank you for um, taking the time to let us speak, those of us who are among the lucky 100. Um, uh -huh. I just want you, everyone to step back for a second as others have asked and think about it before COVID. Did you walk into a doctor's office and everyone, including your nurses and your doctors, were wearing masks? Did you walk into a dental clinic and all of your hygienists and your dentists were wearing masks? Why? Because the virus, any virus, penetrates masks. Unless you are wearing a special respirator that costs thousands of dollars, your virus, any virus, will penetrate that mask. Bacteria depend on, ma on the mask. Um, I am a retired RN, been retired for 20 years, but I remember my schooling and I remember my education. And I just want you to know that the people who are speaking up about, let's, let's just make some sense out of this. We all feel for anybody who has lost anybody through COVID. It's not, it's not something that we, um, want to brush off. Nobody wants to brush off death. Um, it's important to us. People are important, and that's what it's all about. CDC issued guidelines. They did not issue mandates. That's because our Constitution doesn't uphold the mandates. Also, our Supreme Court also supports not having mandates. Um, therefore, our Green Bay City Council should not support the mandate or an ordinance whatsoever, even if there is a parameter of time where we're going to say everybody must. Um, for all of the reasons that have mentioned, been mentioned above, I want you to think also 
Weren't we told from grade school on, and didn't medicine over the years prove that hand washing does a lot to deter? Are we also going to have a hand washing mandate? Because hand washing takes care of all kinds of things. Flus, are we going to require every time a flu hits the area for everybody to wear masks? Um, a lot of people I find lately in politics and involved in, in political things today other people. But I have to tell you, I'm really proud of Green Bay. I walk into a store, there are a lot of people wearing masks, and there are some people who aren't. In some stores, a lot of people are not wearing masks, and some stores um, there are. But I'll tell you what, I've never once got somebody give me the evil eye because I didn't wear a mask, and I don't give them the evil eye. But there is no proof masks work. Hand washing does. What should we do about it? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Delestine, I'd like to ask Andrea a question. Andrea? Absolutely. Yes. Andrea, yes, uh, a friend of mine, his name is Mark Abakowitz. He's a bio, he's a retired biologist and worked in the pharmaceutical in, industry. And he, he lent me this information, and I was just wondering if you if you've heard anything like this. He said the only mask that works is an N95, and that is only good for a single use. He goes, masking is symbolic to mitigate irrational fear, even in a hospital setting. Uh, he said, virtue signaling exists, uh, which is the irrational fear for no scientific reason. You know, I mean, I wear a mask when I go out too, but you know, is it perfect? Maybe not. But did you hear anything about that as far as the N95 being the, you know, state of the art, but you can't use it that often and it would be very expensive to try to maintain that? Well, I just know that it's expensive. I haven't worked in the field in 20 years, but... Okay. Um, I can't speak to that except for, look, years ago, the HIV virus could go through a surgical glove. So tell me, really, should we really mandate people wear masks? Okay. Well, there's... I have a question. Go ahead, Alder. I, um, I wonder if she's aware that there is a vaccine for the seasonal flu. You said, you know, <clears throat> this is just like the flu. No, it's not because we do not have a vaccine yet. It's very uh, harmful. Yeah. But are you aware there is a vaccine for the seasonal flu? It's been effective for how many years we've been doing this? Are you aware of that? Alder person, um, you asked us to be um, polite. I believe that that's pretty facetious. No, I'm no, I'm asking you. Are you know you you stated? I'm that, an RN. Do you think I don't well, you know said that? It, you know. No, I'm, I just want to make sure that people know that there is a vaccine for the seasonal flu. That yes, I want there you is to know. for okay. the seasonal flu, but that vaccine carries only certain strains, and it is not effective for every seasonal flu, nor is it effective for every strain. So please don't use that as a foundation for wearing no. a mask. No, 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 I'm not. I just, no, the way you stated it, I just want to make sure that that was out, that there is a, there is a vaccine that is pretty much effective. It depends, yes, you're right. You're exactly well, right when, when on the different strains. Effective, but, it's important to know how effective. And until we know exactly, then there's no way to make a mandate to force people to even have a vaccine injection for COVID, let alone a mask. Mm -hmm. So I'm just asking our own city government to respect the constitutional rights of the people. Andrea, I thank you for your testimony, you. and I, I thank you for your service to the community in the medical field as well. Thank you very much. Well, thank you oh. for hearing. Okay, next is Brown County Tavern League, Don Meldy. Unmute yourself and give your name and address. Uh, Don Meldy, 641 North Huron, De Pier, 54115. Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, first, I had a couple other issues prior that I, I wanted to speak on, but the floor was never opened. Um, I know this is virtual. This is all new. I just asked to follow Robert's rules of orders for each uh, specific item. 
ask if anybody in the public would like to speak on an item and open up the floor for them to speak. Uh, once again, this is all new for a lot of people at virtual meetings. Not a lot of people know of uh, hand or raise and don't want to interrupt. Um, anyways, um, I have a lot more tab owners trying to get on here. We're at our full capacity of 100. So I can't express the views of all my members in three minutes. Um, but I also feel like a lot of people made a lot of great points that I'm going to repeat to advocate. It needs to be heard. Um, some alluded to hospitalizations and death rates, not locally uh, rising greatly. There's uh, privacy issues, people that have already beaten the virus that would still have to wear one. People in poverty or financial hardships that would have to get one for every time they go out. If somebody has one but doesn't put it on properly, are they doing more harm than good? At a restaurant or a bar for a straw or a drink, do you wear a mask? How will you monitor how you enforce? There's no age limitation to wearing one. If someone has a disabling health condition and cannot wear one, uh, must they bring proof of their illness or disability to opt out of wearing a mask, let alone them being cast away in public by being the only citizens not wearing one? Uh, there are a lot of jobs that are high energy, including our industry, uh, that actually bring more bacteria and carbon dioxide into our body, which is unhealthy. Um, and on top of all those things that a lot of the other people have said, uh, there's no answer to who enforces this, the health department or law enforcement. There's no established fine. There's no established ordinance uh, made to approve tonight that could be looked over. Um, I, I talk with the health department often. Um, I know that they are understaffed with this health situation and they were not going to be able to enforce this uh, greatly. Instead of the perception that people have that we're working against the health department, we instead are working with the Brown County Health Department on showing a joint effort in restoring public call by traveling together to showcase businesses that are adhering to WEDC guidelines. I've been talking to the environmental health director and we're gonna start traveling together to show um, that there are many other guidelines, including and besides masks that we follow. Wrap straws, sanitizing everything from doorknobs to faucet panels to darts and pool sticks. Gloves for drinks, I receive condiments. Signage inside and outside that I provide to our members that create and maintain awareness for social distancing. We are working together harder than large stores and corporations in the retail sector, and we are getting results. I'm constantly working with local tavern owners to successfully follow WDC guidelines, and we don't need an ordinance to be responsible. I think it should be up to the citizens, it should be up to the businesses, and it should not be up to our local government. I thank you guys for your time. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Don. It's good to see you again. Good to see you, too. Next is Martin W. Martin W., please unmute yourself and give your name and address. Okay, I'm calling in a phone. Can I, can I be heard? Yes, yes, you certainly can. And yes. okay. uh, Martin, what we'll do is we'll let you know when you have 30 seconds left. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Martin Weber, 30, 3307 Beach Lane in Green Bay. Um, yeah, I'll make this quick. Um, you know, first of all, this is a major government overreach. Um, you know, as other people have mentioned, you've got HIPAA issues here. You know, if you're mandating that masks are to be worn, you know, I've got asthma and, you know, I, it's hard for me to wear a mask. I do it in where I'm required to. I go to Menard quite a bit. That's their policy. I'm fine with that. You know what? But I don't like wearing it, but I need to go into that store sometimes. Um, I've, uh, I've consulted with my attorney on this. Um, you guys are opening yourself up for major litigation and I really don't think the city can be affording uh, lawsuits here. And I will be one of the people involved in a lawsuit. Um, I've got a couple of studies that I could submit to you guys. Um, uh, one of them from, uh, it, not so much a study, but a report from the World Health Organization as recently as last month that in, in uh, simple terms, they did not say that masks were effective outside uh, health facilities. Okay, I can submit that if, if, uh, if you request it. Um, also, there's another actual study that was done um, that said the same thing, that masks do not work outside health facilities. Uh, and that's due to as other people mentioned, um, you know, touching of faces, not properly trained on them, they're not fitting properly. This is nothing more than a, a false sense of security for people. And finally, uh, oh, uh, one other thing here with health regarding health facilities and people coming down with COVID, 99% of people who are stricken with COVID recover. 85% um, of people that have entered hospital hospitals to cover. And then finally, 
Um, I don't know if you people are aware or not, but the world, uh, uh, there's major worldwide pandemic, um, tuberculosis. 1.5 million people die a year from tuberculosis. Where's the panic? Where are the lockdowns and where are the masks? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Martin. You said you were willing to share that. If you're more than welcome to send those out to each of the alders, I would we would appreciate it if you could do that. Yeah, I can do that. No problem. Thank you. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Okay. Next is Kimberly Voigt, I believe is how you pronounce your last name. Please unmute yourself and give your name and address. Wait, wait one second. Sorry. Okay. So Kimberly, I think what the issue is, is you have, you must have, um, zoom on in a on a phone and on a computer that's why you're getting that feedback yeah. so so you should mute one of those devices so that you don't have feedback the issue is in your place Okay, try it again. I, I only have it on my computer. Yeah, so sorry. Okay, so you know what? Just keep your hand raised. And like I said, you the best thing for you to do is to maybe just come back in. We've got 99 participants. If you're on your phone and your computer, one of those, no, you're not. Oh, that's odd. I don't want her to. I don't. I don't want her to go go to the back of the line either. So no, no, no. So, um, darn it. All right, let's let's try this one more time. Unmute yourself and see what we get. No, we can't hear you. No, muted. unfortunately not. She's on mute right now. Yes. So you muted the wrong device. <laughs> I only have it on one. There we Wait, try it one more time. Can you hear me now? I don't know why. Did she call could she call in on the phone? Um I just have you on one computer. Yeah. She could she could call in on the phone. <laughs> Um, so Kimberly, you know, I'm not sure why you're getting that feedback issue. That issue is like I said, at your place, not at our device. Um, so, uh, perhaps if you could call back in, that'd be great. I, Mike Shea Jr. Just said, move the mic away from the speaker. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Mike, you're all on it. Thank you, Mike. All right, so hopefully uh, Ms. Voigt will join us again. Uh, we now have Arthur. Um, Arthur, I see you're ready to go, unmuted. Just give me one second. Okay, go right ahead. Please give your name and address. That's Arthur. Are you there, Arthur? I just hear garbling, little garbling. Hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> I know, technology. Um, let's move on to Noah yeah. Reef. Intelligent. <laughs> okay. Noah, okay, uh, unmute Andrea Johnson. Thank you very much. Noah Reef, can you please unmute yourself and give your name and address? Yes, uh, Noah Reef, uh, 
I live at uh, 3502 Layden Drive in De Pere, Wisconsin. And although I know I'm not technically a Green Bay resident, I'm still very impacted by the community and uh, do a lot of, have a lot of interaction with folks in Green Bay. So this still feels very important. Um, I want to just lead off by saying that I personally am deeply in favor of a mask ordinance. Uh, I have a, I'm immune, I'm immune compromised. I'm a type one diabetic and everything that we're seeing from this, from accredited medical sources, whether it's a world health organization, the CDC shows that immune compromised individuals are at much greater risk um, than those who do not have a preexisting condition uh, for negative outcomes with this virus. And I also want to take this as like an opportunity to, to answer a few of the questions that I know have been brought up and raised. Um, in my day job, I do healthcare advocacy with an organization. Um, and I can say that I've heard a lot of, you know, oh, well, do masks actually work? And the answer to that is yes. Everything from the World Health Organization and the CDC shows that masks are very impactful and very, uh, very important at slowing down the spread of COVID-19. Uh, that is also in conjunction with social distancing. So this is something, it's one element of this puzzle that we need to solve, right? Another one that I've heard is that it is, you know, isn't it convenient for certain individuals to have to wear masks? And I can absolutely say there probably might be some inconvenience. I know it might be hard when we think about reopening schools in the fall, which I know we're having those discussions on and what that looks like, right? But I also think it's very inconvenient that we have to shut down local businesses, the local economy, because we haven't done a good job of getting a handle on this virus. And COVID-19 is shown to be significantly reduced by the wearing of masks and mask ordinances. A lot of countries have already done so and shown a very good, has shown a very good grasp on, you know, being able to go back to some semblance of normal. It's also very inconvenient to pass along these kinds of this virus to individuals who are immune compromised. That includes family members who, even though y'all might be strong and might be able to handle the virus, those who are directly compromised, like myself, I have family members who are type one diabetics or who really can't weather this. That's a big problem. We needed to think about that when we, you know, are talking about what a mask ordinance is. It's about more than just individuals like taking action. It's about all of us coming together as a community to take action together. I feel very, very strongly that all of us have a part to play in this. Um, and wearing masks can be a little inconvenient, but I think when we come together and we have these, these moments where we can really make a difference, where we can prevent the worst from happening, I think we need to take care of that. And I just want to commend the elders for taking this leadership role and really looking at what we can do as a local community when we've been kind of left on our own, unfortunately. And I think it's very important that we come together and take care of not only ourselves and our neighbors, but those who are most vulnerable. So thank you for your time. Thank very, you, well, very well said, Noah. Very well said. Okay. Next we have SH. SH, please unmute yourself and give your name and address. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes we certainly can. Great, great. Thought I'd get that out of the way before I said everything. <laughs> um, my name is Brian Higginbotham, address 850 Neufeld Street, Green Bay 54304. Um, I would like to just start off by saying I am against any kind of mandate, uh, particularly the mask wearing or, or facial apparel mandate. Um, I do appreciate Alder Scandal's, um, you know, sense uh, of, of, of concern or, and, you know, what, what he said so far. Uh, but uh, personally, I, I think uh, he possibly, and, and like and many others, are under coming under fear i think it's a huge fear so we've heard some great comments from folks um i think it's in my opinion it's, it's quite clear the data just is skewed at best and um we have a global pandemic of fear really um we i've i've talked with people overseas and it's just amazing it's just really sad how, how impact how much impacting impactful this this level of fear is and I think that is a, a, a big issue here. Viruses, you know, I I agree. We have to and, and have always taken care of proper care of of uh, staying clean with, with uh, sanitizers and how I respond around people who are sick or if I'm sick. 
And um, I just don't think an overreach, I think it is an overreach of authority and a violation of constitutional rights to, to issue such mandate, you know, mandates. Um, viruses are here, here to stay. Uh, I'm sorry to say they really are. Um, for us to, I believe for us to have this sort of, uh, you know, thought that we're gonna outrun it or outrun any virus um, isn't gonna happen. There's, there's certain, like that the lady mentioned, there's vaccines that uh, have an effect on certain strains and, and, um, and, and in certain cases, but it's not gonna be effective for every person in every place. Um, so I do believe that, you know, setting up a mandate is a serious overreach. Um, we, I don't want to sink the ship uh, when the sailors need the ship to survive, um, you know, uh, impacting businesses. People have to put food on their tables. We're all necessary. I believe we are. Every, every one of us is necessary. We shall not be, should not be telling people you're not necessary. Churches are necessary. Fellowshipping is necessary. Let the citizen have the, have the right to put an apparel on their face or not to put an apparel on their face. Um, and we've already spoken to the fact that some of these things are not effective um, or they're not going to be worn right. They're not going to be cleaned right. They're going to be restrictive. I have a health concern myself. That's a you know, comor comorbidity issue. But I, I will not support any kind of mandate. And there are legal issues on top of this all. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, thank you, Brian. Celestine? Yes. You know, I know we've, we've had a lot of folks from different communities speaking as well. And, you know, I don't know how, how we can couch this, but uh, it'd be nice to get the Green Bay citizens in as much as possible. I don't know if that's possible or not, but. Uh, that, that's a question for Attorney Bungert. Attorney yeah, Bungert? Yes, I'm sorry, what was the question? Go ahead, repeat that. I mean, I think everybody's uh, voice is important on this, but we have many, many people and there are folks from Green Bay because it's it's impacting the city of Green Bay at this time. Just to, to find out if there's a way to get the citizens here in Green Bay, the ability to speak initially or, or what, or is that a slippery slope? Um, as far as differentiating between citizens and um, non-citizens, uh, I'm not sure if we have a feasible way of being able that. to do that. I'm more right. or less, I'm getting some calls from citizens, that's all. So I, I'm i fine either way. I, I, I'm preparing to stay up all night, so to speak, you know, to listen to everybody. But, um, you know, I realize the pandemic and et cetera doesn't know city lines at all. But I, I, I was just uh, asking on the behalf of some citizens. So that's fine. Thank you, Alder. <laughs> So I see that Kimberly, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, go, go ahead, Attorney Chavez. Yeah, so just to think the council could do, but we would need to be doing that at the outset, um, dictating right. who is able to provide comments since we've already started with the comment period. Um, I don't believe that we'd be able to change the rules mid-course. Okay, that's, that's, that's fine. I appreciate that. Okay. Okay, so I see that Kimberly Voigt has joined us again. Um, and as Mr. Shea had suggested, Ms. Voigt, if you would separate your, um, the, your microphone from your speaker, and that would prevent the feedback. So, uh, Ms. Voigt, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself? Arthur, I also see that you have your hand raised and are unmuted. I'm going to take Ms. Voigt first. Ms. Voigt, are you ready? Ms. Voigt, Kimberly. Okay, we'll give Ms. Voigt a few more minutes. Um, Arthur, are you ready? Can you hear me now? Yes, we certainly can. Hold on one second. Uh -oh. Okay, please give your name and address. Yeah, Arthur Hill, 1675 Birch Street, 54304. First okay, thing right first, ahead. I'm adamantly against this ordinance. It violates as far as i civil rights, constitutional rights. If you looked in the paper today, 760 new cases were identified yesterday. 264 statewide are hospitalized. That's not overrunning our medical community. And that's out of 
36,448 that were tested positive. And out of that positive number, 174 of those 264 are still waiting for results. So having the symptoms does not necessarily mean you have the disease. Presently for me, I had the disease. I had the virus. I survived. I did not die. In the December, I had the flu. It was 10 times worse. It was the worst flu I ever had. And I had the flu vaccine. So if you're going to hang your head on the vaccine, it's false hope, folks. But they do work in some cases. But I did go to Red Cross, donate my COVID-19 plasma and platelets so I could help those who didn't handle it as well as I did. CDC guidelines are that. They're guidelines. This ordinance would be unenforceable. What are the police going to do when we have the next uh, protest and half the people aren't wearing masks? Are they going to rush in and start arresting them, start writing tickets? I don't think so. It's unenforceable. Washington County just put it unanimous mandatory mask. We should call suit. What we should do, pass resolution urging people to use the mask, use PSAs, you know, and let the businesses also offer, follow in suit. Next thing is don't open a can of worms. People will not forget if you trample on their civil rights and constitutional rights. It'll cost the city dearly with all the lawsuit. Please think wisely before you, you, know, you go ahead. I will not live my life in fear. Now, when I do go out, I will wear a mask when I go to the fans or I go to the festival. But that's not for me. That's just because it may, if it makes other people comfortable, I'm for it. But when I go into an eating establishment, I don't want to have to mess around with the mask. Do I think it's necessary? No. Get off this political roller coaster driven by the media that hypes the numbers for sensationalism. We need to end this, and we need to use some common sense. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Okay. Now, Ms. Ms. Voigt. Can you hear me? See, you're on here. There you go. Can, if you can hear me, please unmute yourself so that we can um, get you back in the queue to talk. Can't hear anything. Yeah. Is that Ms. Voigt? We really want to see her and visit with her. Yeah. Okay. I do see that she has a a uh, alder. A I don't know if you can hear me. Oh I can't yes, hear you are. You can hear me? Yes, yes. we sure can. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> Give me one sec. Audio <laughs> delay. Well, I'm hoping you can hear me, and we're going to go with that. My name is Kimberly Boat. I live at 3071 Gothic Port in Green Bay, 54313. Um, first, I just wanted to say thank you to Nicole Seleski. She really went over a lot of the items and the data points that uh, I was going to talk about. Um, and she did it so eloquently that I'll just go more from a personal feeling of, of what I'm seeing and the fact that um, some of the, the people in the government power here are going on news channels and making statements to the fact that uh, we are immoral if we're choosing not to wear a mask. Um, and with that being said, um, it's really, in my opinion, it's the government's job to protect my constitutional rights and it's my right to choose. And we've heard that in a lot of different areas. But specifically here, it's my right to choose masks, um, and it's it, it's really a choice. And when you're going to put a mandate and say that people have to wear it, I guess one of my questions would be to um, the police force, would be to the government, uh, who's going to enforce this? How is it going to be enforced? What kind of um, term length is going to be put on these mass situations? Uh, beyond that, what is the right mask? Uh, there have been some conversations back and forth, and if you look at several of the studies, um, Stanford Medical, June 19th, Southern California University, 
Um, they state the N95 masks with the valves, they only protect one way, and it's when you're breathing in. So you don't breathe in particulates, but it's not, uh, it's not protecting anyone from what you're breathing out. Because of that, California has now said that that's not acceptable. Cloth masks, um, they're saying on several of these, the websites, uh, the government websites, it needs to be a three-layer system. And... And these are, you know, particular layers to make sure that it's, it's, you know, filtering. But above and beyond, if you go into any store, half of the population that is choosing to wear the masks aren't wearing them properly. Their nose is hanging out or it's off of their chin or they take it off and hang it off. Um, so who's going to go around and dictate that they're wearing them improperly? They have them on. Um, and then let's go a step further. If we're talking about particles and some of the studies, the particles can get in your eyes. So now is everyone going to have to wear a face shield? So this really is about personal choice and it's not about shaming people either way. So I would reserve um, the government to step back and not shame us for not wearing it and we won't shame you for wearing it. Uh, my last issue would be again for the police, if you're a concealed carry person, if you have a mask on, can you carry legally? And I think that's my time and thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Kim. Thank you, Kim. Now, Alder. Let me just, just go, go through. Yes. How many, what do we do? Where are we at? So I don't see, there's no more hands raised. Um, is there anyone who would like to speak? Please just unmute yourself if you can't raise your hand and just, you know, say your name and um, I'll get you going here. Anyone who would like to speak? Oh, yes, I see someone. Sorry. That's Dean. Dean yes, Holder. Dean. Okay, just give me one second, Mr. Hager. Is that how you pronounce your name? Okay, give me one second. All right, Mr. Hager, I think. Go right ahead. Just unmute yourself. Sorry, I was raising my hand for the next topic. Uh, oh, for the next topic. Oh, okay. So I'm not... finished with masks. Sorry about that. Okay, so you do not wish to speak on masks. No, thank you. Okay, awesome. All right, thank you See so you much. See you later, Dean. Bye-bye. Okay. Uh, Ms. Stoudemire, do you want to speak? Um, I just want to mention one thing. Brenda? Uh, Brenda? Brenda? Yes. Brenda? Yes. You'll have to give your name and address. Okay, Brenda Stoudemire, uh, 1278 Doty Street, Green Bay. Um, a lot of people have been reaching out saying they can't get on to this Zoom call. So can people, when they're done speaking and they're not going to say anything else, if they can switch to the city uh, YouTube page, they can view this live, so then they're not on Zoom hogging up. Oh, That's all point. I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Double screen, that'll work? Yes. Okay. Oh, I see. All right. Let's see. Lower hand. Anyone who would like to speak to the mask ordinance, please unmute yourself so I can, now uh, we can get you started here. Oh, Kimberly uh, uh, Alder, I think that Kimberly would like to speak again. Um, um, I, I believe we have just one time for every person. Right. Um, how how long was she was she thinking? Normally, it's for a rebuttal or it's something. Three, it's me. It's three minutes for everyone, one time. Kimberly, no, no, I don't think so. What we could do, Kimberly, if if you want to say something else, I would email uh, the committee and or the council. I, I, the I, don't know. I was having technical difficulties. I didn't know if you heard me, and I didn't yes. know if anybody yes. answered my question regarding who's going to um, who's going to mandate this, who's going to police it, what about the conspiracy? I couldn't hear anything. I see. Well, we'll okay. we'll talk about some of that. Um, you know, generally speaking, when when there is an ordinance, you, normally the police will do that. And uh, we, we will talk about that when we get in back into the committee. So we, we, will, we will speak on the enforcement Thank issue. you. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 
Is there anyone else who would like to speak to the mass board? I would. Okay, that's Rob XS, XS Max, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, just give me one second. Okay. Go ahead, please give your name and address. Robert Heinrichs, 1807 Lost Dauphin Road to Pier, Wisconsin. I operate a business at 1106 Main Street in Green Bay. Uh, I want to uh, give credence to uh, Kimberly, uh, Tamara, and uh, the other lady, I forgot her name, but they did a very eloquent job of uh, speaking this topic, and I wholeheartedly support their opinions on that, as well as uh, the Brown County Tavern League's opinion on this as well. Uh, my main concern for um, the committee here is enforcement. Alderman Scandal said he wanted to see heavy fines for businesses that were caught not enforcing uh, this ordinance. Uh, my concern is we have HIPAA guidelines that would be impossible for a business owner to ask a customer not wearing a mask why they are or why they do not. And that would open us up to a can of worms. And I just really want the community to take that into consideration when trying to draft an ordinance that would require us to do something that would be in violation of federal law. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Rob. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Alder Stoyer? Yes. Oh, I uh, see there's one other person. Owner raised his or her hand or their hand. Um, owner, can you please unmute yourself and give your name and address for the committee? You're going to start crying. You <laughs> calm down. Can you hear us? Your hand was like shaking, your voice was like cracking, like a bag of fewer tears. <laughs> Okay, so you have to actually speak in. I didn't have my stuff with me in front of me that I wanted to talk about when I had my computer in front of me. I had stuff that I wanted. <sighs> okay, so owner, if you would like to speak, please give your name and address for the committee. Okay, uh, Gary C. You're next, you raise your hand. Please unmute yourself and give your name and address for the committee. My name is Gary Cohen. I live at 6841 Chester Drive, apartment B, Madison, 53719. Go right ahead. Okay, so uh, I'm speaking uh, against an ordinance. Uh, I used to be a chemist have a Bachelor of Science degree and PhD in chemistry. Uh, I wasn't planning on speaking, but I, I stay because the, uh, the speakers are very eloquent. And um, one of the things that in Madison, uh, the health department says that they're following OSHA's guidelines, and that's the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, federal government. And it turns out, they're not following the guidelines. The guidelines require, uh, if you are uh, working in a business, that all the employees have at least oxygen levels of 19.5%. And I saw a demonstration of uh, someone, someone uh, they, using a surgical mask, and they showed that before they put on the mask, the oxygen level was right by their uh, nose, 20.5%, which is normal. They put on the mask, and within seconds, the uh, level of oxygen dropped to 17.6%. They were using a OSHA certified meter, which started beeping like crazy, and uh, said, no, this is no good. You know. You got you to raise the level. So that's with a surgical mask, which doesn't really do a great job filtering the air. An N95 mask, you can hardly breathe. I, I find breathing with these masks very difficult. So you're, all these uh, laws, all these uh, regulations are violating federal law. 
and you should take that into account if you decide to pass a regulation. And that's all I have to say. Any questions? No, very, very well done. I appreciate your your testimony, Gary. Thank you. Better committee, anybody from the committee? I'd like to speak, uh, Mark. Yeah, go ahead. Go Are we going to close the floor, Mark? Are we going to close the floor first? I think we should close the floor first. Uh, well, sure. Well, well. Uh, Alder Vanderlees, let me just solicit to make sure that there's nobody else. You know, given the technology, it's a little harder sometimes to find people who want to speak. You know, when we're in person, we can see people raise their Good. hands. Um, so let me just ask, um, is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this issue regarding the mask ordinance? Celestine? Uh, yes, Alder. You were trying to get a hold of uh, somebody named Owner was trying to get in? Yes. And she wants to get in, yeah. Oh, okay. So, Owner, please go ahead and uh, state your name and address for the committee. No, uh, she just said it's not working. Okay, hold, <laughs> she, hold on, hold on. She said she's viewing your your screen, so. I, you know, we do have uh, room for 13 people, so mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. Or just give me one second, Alder. Scroll here. Yeah, I don't see. Oh, owner is, you know, what I see, I don't see all owner as either with a phone or a video. So I'm not sure how this person is connected. Um, I would suggest that owner call back in. Okay. All right, I'll tell her. Okay. So uh, I, I leave it to you, Chair. Yeah, that's fine. I'll... Move ahead. How many? Well, I was going to ask Alder Vanderlis. Is this something that you wanted to discuss with the committee, or is it just the? Uh, we'll, I'll, I'll wait till the till the public's done and we close the floor, and then I'll give my comments. How is that? All right. Well, thank you. That's that's fine. I mean, Alder Alders can chime in. So, <laughs> all right, all right. Go ahead, Celestine. Thank you, Alder. So uh, SH, um, as, as we had discussed before, uh, we only have one, someone can only speak one time. So if you have something else you'd like to say, we suggest that you email the, the council. Yes. Um, is there anyone- Hey, Mark. Yes. It's, it's Leanne. Oh, okay, okay. Ho hold on one second, Ms. Kramer. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Ms. Kramer. Please give your name and address. Uh, Leanne Kramer, 702 Neville Avenue in Green Bay, 54303. <laughs> First go off, ahead. Um, I would like people, the aldermen, women, and the mayor to remember the day that you took office, that you swore on the Bible and took the oath of office that you would uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. Part of that is our civil rights. And slowly, some people say, well, it's just a mask. Well, yeah, it might be just a mask right now. But my point is, it could be next week, a year from now, it's going to be something else. There's no timeline of when, if this mask ordinance goes into effect, when is it going to expire? When are we going to say, hey, yeah, everybody can take them off. We don't need them anymore. So th those are some of the things that worry me. We're headed down the path of communism. And people think that I'm a lunatic about it. I'm not. I'm definitely afraid of it because we're headed that way. And I'll, I'll come back in 10 years and I'll tell you, you know, remember when you called me a lunatic 10 years ago? on that meeting and we're in a communist state and country, then I'll, I'll look at people and say, now nah, laugh at me. But furthermore, you know, it's, um, when, it's uh, when it's flu season, we, we don't walk around with masks. There's a reason why. You need to build up your immunity because 
Otherwise, by wearing a mask continuously, you're just telling your mission the natural defense that the, that God gave us when we were born. You don't need to fight because we're we're not letting any germs into our body. So then, the minute we do take those masks off, be it two months, three months from now, four months, five months, who knows? It could be next spring. It could be next summer that we finally take the masks off. Then. How many germs are going to come into our body? Then everybody's going to be sick with God knows what. So we've got to, you've got to let your body build up the immunity and fight every disease that comes after your body. You have to. That's the only way we can, we'll ever survive in this world. Number Another thing, I'm a mouth breather. I have nose issues, cannot breathe out of it. So you're going to put a mask on me? So you're going to basically, you're going to, if it goes through, I'm going to be, I'm going to be the minority and forced to live in my house because I cannot wear a mask. Along with them steaming up, going in and out of temperature rooms and not being able to see. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. I'm glad you finally got through. So am I. Technology is a great thing. Oh, yeah. All right. Thank you. Celestine, I'll wait for you. Yes, thank you, Alder. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to the mask ordinance? Please unmute yourself and start speaking. Okay, one more time. Anyone else who would like to speak to the mask ordinance? Please unmute yourself and start speaking. Okay, Alder, I think we are done. Well, I would entertain a motion to close the floor. Motion, motion to, to close, close the floor. floor. By Vanderlees, seconded by Stevens. Any other discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 The floor is now aye. closed. Alder Vanderlees, do you want her to speak? Yes, thank you, Mark. Uh, I'm not in support of the ordinance, uh, mask ordinance. I don't want to infringe upon uh, people's rights for number one. Uh, most of the people in my district that called me about it they were not in favor of it. And I had quite a few calls, quite a few emails as well. And um, I, I just feel it's not, it's not right. Uh, I'm not supporting it at all. It, it's just, I, I think the public is doing a good job. Uh, you know, certain businesses require a mask, certain businesses don't. And, and I think that we're, I think we're doing a good job. I think the numbers are dropping. I think Brown County is doing a pretty good job. And uh, so I'm not, I'm not in support of the, of the mask ordinance at all. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, thank, thank you. you. Uh, all, I was gonna ask you, hold on all this scale. Committee, is there anybody else that wants to speak to this? Right now? I'd like before. to speak. Okay, go ahead, Alder Lefebvre. Um, yes, um, I'm not gonna support this ordinance because I believe that it should be for indoor only because of, uh, all the uh, research that's been out there and I'm sorry yeah there's a lot of people can say is this research that research but look at the overall the studies have been done they show that indoors is where the problem really is because of the airflow they had a um, they did a study and they showed that um, in the in a restaurant this table had five people and the one person had it. The people, of course, they're eating, nobody's wearing a mask. The table, six feet to the left, three people got it. Nobody on his table, we see, got it. Then the table, six feet to the left, two people got it. It's because of the airflow that you have and everybody, the CDC, the World Health Organization, they've all recognized that the indoor is the prob is the main problem. I also, you know, I'm sorry, I do get upset when people talk about the Constitution. Do they really believe that you can do whatever you want? You have this personal freedom to do what you want? No, we don't. Mm -hmm. You, we have, you know, we put in um, a law 
mandate that you cannot smoke in buildings. Why? Because secondhand smoke can give someone cancer. You do not have a right to give someone cancer. This is a health issue. It has nothing to do with politics. Keep politics out of it. This has to do about health. This virus is mutating. It went from animal to human. Now it's in humans. It has mutated. This is not the seasonal flu. Even the seasonal flu can kill people. Some people do die from it. But this virus is vicious. It's becoming more vicious. Why do you think they call it a pandemic? It's all over. What's happening with Florida? Texas, Arizona, because they were opening up and people weren't wearing masks and they were, they were gathering in big groups, spreading it. That masks are not 100%, it's true. They will never be 100%. But the N95 is pretty much 100%. There have been studies on it. And if those masks, they talk about, oh, all the people, the health ones, that they're not, they don't even stop it. If that was true, you'd have tons of our medical people getting this virus and dying because they're around so many people. They're treating the people who have this. Another thing, getting back to personal that you you do not have the right to give this virus to anyone because you don't know that person's condition. You don't know if they have underlying conditions that this could kill them. You do not have that right. So I would like the ordinance something done for the indoor. That's the problem. And the city has go- gone over backwards to help the businesses like the, the bars and the restaurants. We're allowing them to have sidewalk cafes. Now we're doing the parklets where they can uh, have a, a spot and a parking area. A lot of them have their own beer gardens. They have outdoors. We're bending over backwards to help these businesses so that they can be in business. So they can apply for these different things. So that people can be outside and I will not go to any restaurant that does not have outside seating I will not so so, so there are businesses who say it's their right well fine I'm not going to I'm not going to patronize you and there are other people who will not patronize you okay. and this is personal responsibility I'm also going to say we are the United States we're in this together I hate this where people are fighting over this. I want us to come together and realize that this is serious. Okay. Are we? Okay. Thank you. Are, good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, Alder Scanna wanted to say something. Is it okay to let Alder Dorf say something first? Alder, Alder Dorf? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I wasn't aware that there is a draft already of an ordinance. That's correct, isn't it? There, There is no draft, is there? Mm-mm. No, this is a so, uh, that is correct. I I am in very much in favor of what um, uh, Kathy said just said. Uh, very very much in, in favor of some sort of mask ordinance, but with a number of exceptions. And I think that we have to look at outside versus inside. I think what I would love to see the committee do tonight is refer this to staff so that they can look at drafting something. We don't have anything concrete. We're not, people are assuming that we all want you to wear masks 24 seven. That is not what any of us are talking about. Um, In my mind, in places that people need to go, such as for food, clothing, supplies, not where people choose to go, such as bars and restaurants, where people need to go, that's where I'd like to see the protection. 
and that we need to have an age, you know, a lower age limit on it. We need to have exceptions for athletes, um, for people in gyms, for health. There, there's all kinds of things. So this isn't some all-encompassing, never intended to be an all-encompassing um, ordinance. I am going to definitely support some sort of mask ordinance, but it would need to be time limited to the end of this emergency that we're in, and there would need to be many exceptions within it. Okay. And thank you very much. All right, thank you. All the scanner. I concur. <laughs> uh, thank you. It's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, many of what uh, people have brought up that are against this, I agree with you. There's many instances where masks are not needed or required. Uh, there might be a few instances outside, but I think mainly it will be focused on the outside. Uh, I think, I, I mean, on the inside. Uh, I think uh, uh, I'd like to see staff put something together for us to chew on. I think they, they, I mean, it's not like they have to invent the wheel. I mean, Dane County's done this. Milwaukee has done this. We certainly have the authority to do it. We're not uh, you know, trampling on anybody's rights by working on public safety any more than we're setting uh, a street speed limit is, uh, or uh, as Alvin LaFay said, you know, not smoking indoors. That's not infringing rights or safety. People's safety always comes first. That's our government's first and foremost without safety. I mean, the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Life is first because without life, nothing else comes after. And the reason with our constitution, public welfare comes before liberty. So it is our responsibility. I'm not in a panic over COVID-19. I'm doing what I think is responsible. Nothing has changed from when we went in to a point. Virus is still out there and it's incubating and it's waiting to hit us again if we don't take enough precautions to keep our numbers down. All the health professionals in our area, all the hospitals, every one of the CEOs and president are supporting this. Uh, the CDC, we can follow their guidelines. They, we get their, they're up to date. They're the ones who have looked at all the studies and put together that information. So uh, if you can't trust the CDC, well then you can't trust anybody. That, then that just uh, val invalidates every, there's no science and it validates everything. You have to be able to trust the professionals who go through all the information and do the best that they can with it. Um, so I, I'd like to see staff, uh, the committee at least, let this go to staff, see what they can put together so that we can go over it at council. Uh, thank you very okay. much. All right, thank you. Thank you, Alder. Uh, Alder Stevens, anything? Alder Burnett, anybody else want to chime in on this? No? Um, you know, I've got, as I've looked through the research and Believe me, I've been spending a few days on this, to say the least. Um, first of all, I do commend uh, Alder Scannell for bringing this forward. Whether I vote for it or not, I, I commend him for, for bringing it forward. It's a, it's a hot-button issue. It's tough. You know, and it's uh, a lot of times it's a lose-lose situation when we vote. Very difficult. But... Um, I think one of the problems I'm having is that, you know, I, I contacted the police department just to see if this was enforceable. And, you know, of course, you know, we make the rules, we make the laws, the ordinances and such, and the police enforce those. I think what they stated, you know, I talked to uh, Commander Warwick, uh, it would be very difficult to enforce. I think that's one of the issues that I would have. Um, granted, you know, I know the mayor sent a letter, you know, with all the different hospitals and they all signed on to it you know if there's been good testimony either way on this today uh, I will state that I got unsolicited emails from 53 people 43 said no and said yes to the ordinance tonight we had 16 that said no and four that said yes you know that's not always a slam dunk but you know it's a pretty pretty strong statement there so um, you know, I'm not to say that, it's not to say that something won't develop eventually, um, but I'm not I'm not comfortable mandating something at, at this time. You know, I may change my mind before city council, but right now I just I don't feel comfortable moving ahead 
with with the calls that I've gotten and the emails that I've gotten as well. So I, I would propose that we put this to a vote unless Alder Dorf, you want to say something else? Go ahead. I don't understand why you would think that you would be mandating. Anyone that's voting on this, on this committee today is simply, we're asking, refer to staff. We don't, we're not voting on a thing idea that hasn't been written down. And met, most things that Alder's asked to get referred to staff are referred to staff. And then okay. you decide whether you want it or don't want it, or whether you want to take things out or put things in. I you just, know, I, I don't think oh, it's right not to refer oh, to staff. Thank you. Alder Dorf, I was just reading what, what the statement said. Whoops, I lost my uh, agenda here. You know, just reading it, um, consideration with possible action on a request by Alder Scandal to make a city ordinance requiring employees in the public and social situations to wear masks and practice social distancing. You know, I, I looked at it and there's a couple different ways to look at it. You know, it, it was, it left some room for interpretation. So are you saying that by sending it back to committee that um, back to staff that that would tighten that up a little bit? It would create it. I don't think it's even created yet. So I, I, I don't think that you're passing something Brandy. that and you know. can change the wording as well in emotion. Right. I mean, they, 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 they need to make an ordinance. There's no ordinance there. Right. They, staff needs well, to I'm make just, an ordinance. I'm reading what you stated. That's all. Mark, the statement is to make that. an ordinance. You Hold have no a ordinance right now. The only right. way to make an yeah. ordinance is to refer this to staff. That's a given. Okay. How do you make it? How can we make We don't make ordinances. Staff does. Staff has we to, vote. we have to refer this to staff to do. Alder, if I can there's very few really communications that say. Alder Scannell, Alder Scannell. Okay. There's very few communications that say, you know, refer to staff. It, All right. You spoke your point. You spoke your point. We need some other people here. Alder Stevens. Oh, um, Attorney Burnett. Or Bunker. Yes, I just wanted to clarify very quickly. Um, essentially, if, if the committee wants to just refer this to staff to research, to come up with a draft, staff can take into consideration, not necessarily what the communication says verbatim, but the committee can give directives as to a draft that encompasses certain points, um, like an end date, indoor only, exceptions for certain things, and to bring back a workable draft, which and also can be changed at committee level. It doesn't have to be approved at that point. Um, it's just a, a beginning point um, for staff to begin drafting with whatever specifications, directives the committee wishes to give. And then staff would bring that back for review and further discussion and potential further revisions. And, Mark, like and public input as well. All right, hold on. Alder Vanderleest? I don't, I don't want to really re refer this back the state. I, I think that you know the public has spoken, and uh, myself personally, I think that the community is doing a good job. I don't, I don't think we need any more laws. The police department doesn't have time for this. For number one, and, and I, and I think is getting the message out: people to wear a mask in certain situations. I, I don't think we need any more laws or any more infringements upon people's rights at this time. And, and, and I'm not going to support it. And, and I, I think that we can handle it right here at our committee. We don't need any more, we don't need any more action on it. Uh, I'd like okay. to put receive in place on file. Thank you. Thank you. Um, regardless of what happens tonight, this is going to the full council anyhow. So this is just a recommendation. So it's going to, every, everybody on council will be able to weigh in next Tuesday. Alder Scannell for the last time. Yep. I'm sorry. No, 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 that's fine. I, I just, I would like council to go way in on an actual ordinance. That's why I would like staff to come up with something and bring it to the committee as a whole so we could all look at it, decide, and it can be killed there, amended there, fixed there, and passed on. We don't really have time. If this is going to happen, we really don't have time to stretch this all out. It, if it takes too long, it's going to be pointless. Uh, we were How opening up. We, How long will that take? the cart before the horse. Uh, we got council on councils on Tuesday, right? And you think they can do it in a couple of days? Yes, because they're not reinventing the wheel. 
There's a lot of information there already that's out there. I mean, other places are done this. It doesn't take much to put this together. Okay. Alder Burnett. Um, Alder Burnett. Can I, can I, yeah. Uh, thank you, Chairman Strayer. I, I disagree with Alder Scandal. I, I believe that if this committee makes a motion, then the full city council has to approve whatever or disapprove whatever the motion is. This committee cannot dictate right now staff work on such a policy. I don't think that that's appropriate. That decision has to go to the full city council. The legal team of the city of Green Bay is very far behind on projects, very far behind on creating ordinances. And you have an agenda item later on in this meeting, I, I think, if you haven't already discussed it, where the city legal team will be explaining where they are at with a variety of projects, very important projects. Not to say that this wouldn't be a, an important project, but which of the numerous ordinances and legal matters is this committee or is this council comfortable with telling the city legal team to push down the list in order to move forward with drafting an ordinance that might not even pass? I've received so many contacts, calls, texts, overwhelmingly people are against such an ordinance. I don't know how you can enforce it. That's the biggest thing. You really want our police officers to be engaging people for not wearing a mask. Alder Scandal, you had mentioned in a Facebook post, $20 fine. You want to engage our officers in a highly tense, potentially volatile situation for a $20 fine? I don't think that that's the proper thing for our police department to be doing. And furthermore, the governor of Michigan has signed an executive ordering requiring mask, I believe. And she's putting the onus on first to be that first line. Yeah. You really think it's appropriate for business owners to be engaging people, their own customer base, scolding them, reprimanding them, making them feel you know, what they're doing is the absolute worst thing. You can't do that to people. An ordinance is only as good as it can be enforced. And if the police department is already saying they have concern about enforcing such an ordinance, other municipalities and counties also have come forward that they're concerned about enforcing it. What makes us think that Green Bay, that we have all kinds of police officer time to enforce such an ordinance? And I refuse to put our business owners in such a situation that they have to go to their customers and refuse entry. Look at the videos all across the country. People don't want this overall from what I've, what I've heard and what I've seen. I'm not saying that the COVID's not a serious thing, that people shouldn't be wearing masks. I think that each person has to make decisions uh, as they see fit. Not, it doesn't have to be one or the other. Simply saying, why are we creating an ordinance that is going to be very difficult to enforce Second to that is why are we telling our legal team to create an ordinance and waste a lot of time on something that may not even pass? Thank you, Chairman. That's all. Okay. Although, yeah. Scandal, I know you want to keep talking, but you've no, no, talked no. three Chairman? times. Chairman? Yes. Go ahead. Yes. I... Uh, yes. Um, I, I'm sorry. Um, Older Burnett, I'm going to mention this. Well, we have businesses that do demand masks. Menards, they will not let you in. You don't want to wear a mask. You don't come in. There are businesses doing this. It's not just Menards. It's others. And this ordinance would be where the businesses have to have a sign out. I would believe that it would be the businesses. You don't have to go after the individual. It's the business. If you do not wear a mask, you don't come in. And if we put a, a if this ordinance is for all businesses in Green Bay, people can't boycott them. <laughs> They're not going to go to anywhere. You have to have everybody doing this to have it effective. So I'm, I'd am i like to make a motion that we uh, send this back to staff to come up with a reasonable ordinance, as Alderdorf mentioned, with the exceptions, the different rules, and a way that we can reasonably enforce this. And that, would I would say, would be on the business owners. Attorney, Attorney Bunger? Yes, we, uh, we do already minimum. have a motion. Yeah, we already have a motion on the floor. Alder John Vanderlees uh, did a motion to receive and place on file, but we do not have a second yet. So we need to dispose of that motion first. I will second that. 
So that is a motion by Alder Vanderlees to receive and place on file, second by Alder Stoyer. Do we have any other discussion? We, we can take a vote. May, may I respond to the questions that were asked of me by Alder Burnett? Uh, un unfortunately, Alder Stoyer, um, Alder Scandal has already spoken three times. All right. Three times you spoke, yeah, sorry. So we made a motion and a second. All in favor of that, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Opposed? No. Okay, so it's two to two. Um, we, I will have to do a, a voice call vote. Go ahead. Um, Alder Stevens? No. Alder Vanderleest? A. Vote. Yes. Yes. Alder Nate. Stoyer. Yes. yes, for my, my vote. I, I have that noted, Alder Vanderlees. Thank you. Alder Lefebvre. No. Okay, so that fails two to two. This still goes to council, though. No, it's dead. Receive and place on file failed. Well, unless somebody wants to pull it, correct? Receive and place on file failed. That means your yes. that should know. Right. I have a question for the attorney. Yes. If we were to bring this to you or suggest you to do this ordinance this week, would it be ready for council? Um, that's a question for me, for Attorney Chavez. Um, so we actually had been looking into this for a while when we knew that this request was coming um, to see what exactly others have been doing. So yes, a, lot, a little bit of the, of the research has been done at this point. We'd be making best practice decisions um, basing it off of what the recommendations of the council actual or the committee actually are. Um, and then we would be um, making sure that it's consistent with Wisconsin law because as you're aware, there have been a number that have happened across the country, including some some places such as Texas, Minnesota, Minneapolis or um, Michigan, and only recently have Wisconsin state locations started doing this. So yes, we could, have something in time for council next week. And also the other ordinances in play right now because we are in a nation, nationwide public health emergency? Everything or, that is occurring under the emergency ordinance is taking precedence, yes. Yeah. So that would answer all the uh comment earlier. Correct. Thank you. Okay, Alder Burnett for the second time. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Stoyer. Uh, Attorney Chavez, how is that appropriate? Like, if this committee made a motion and voted to receive and place on file and it failed, how, what action would allow you to take that action to create an ordinance? Because this policy committee is not making that recommendation. Under what authority are you moving forward with creating an ordinance? Um, well, okay, so right now the only thing that has happened is there's been a, a, a motion to receive and place on file that failed. That does not preclude another motion from occurring um, or from coming forward. Um, and so if this committee directs us to do something, we've had um, kind of differing opinions um, as to when the, the council or when the committee will actually bring something forward ahead of time. It kind of depends on what's directed of us. If we are asked to bring something for council's consideration, um, which I believe was done at this point, it was asked to be our um, committee the whole, I believe, um, then we do that. There have been instances when we've waited for council's direction, um, but it's usually something that's pretty contentious that is not time sensitive. What I'm suggesting is that it's not appropriate. If this committee is is not moving forward with uh, forwarding to the council an action to refer to staff or for staff to create an ordinance, why would it be appropriate for you to move forward with drafting an ordinance? Is this under the mayor's direction? Is well, as I said, now all this all that has happened is there's been a, a motion to receive and place on file that has failed. So this item is still on the table and subject to another yeah. essential vote if the committee chooses to do so. So if the committee doesn't make a vote, another vote or doesn't affirm moving forward with drafting an ordinance, you will not 
work on drafting an ordinance. Is that correct? Uh, I, I couldn't tell you that for sure. The mayor has has authority to to have us work on stuff outside of that. So kind of a beating around the bush way saying that if the mayor wants an ordinance to be drafted, that he can disallow what this policy making body wished per the vote today. Well, the, the policy making body establishes the policy. Um, it doesn't dictate our workload. So the mayor is directing you to create an ordinance? Nope, I have not received anything. You asked me if it was possible that something could be directed to our authors to, do, to, to bring something forward, and I'm giving you an honest answer. Yes, the mayor has that authority. If the mayor chose to move forward with something, even though this, this um, committee has not told us to do something, it is totally within the mayor's purview to do that. Okay, so if the committee uh, receives and place on file or does not make any other motion, the mayor could direct you to create an ordinance to be presented to the city council next week. Potentially, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I just want to make a comment. Go ahead. That's poor government. The mayor hasn't talked to us about any uh, mandate as far as masks, that he wants to you know, put this in effect. He, he never called me about it. He never, has he talked Let to the, clar the governing body? The has, not, has not given me a directive. You guys asked me if there was any conceivable way that this would still be worked on, and I'm giving you an honest answer. Okay. I have not received direction to work on anything from the mayor. Okay, that's fine. But uh, myself, personally, I, I feel that you know we don't have much communication going on here about, about you know bringing stuff forward and want to get in it slam-dunked. You know, have it, have it the next meeting, have it ready to go for the next meeting. That's not good. That's not good government. Thank you. Is there anybody Chairman? else? Yes. Uh, uh, you've spoken a few times, oh, three times, two times. We got, we got to. Uh, no, I, I want to make a motion. Okay, go ahead. Go, go ahead. I want my motion to go forward. Go ahead. We'll re restate that. Okay. okay, let's see. Um. Alder Dorf, maybe you can help me. <laughs> she does it so well. Uh, here, how about let's let's go to let's um, transfer to the staff, and the staff can return to Common Council as a whole next Tuesday. But we want also the directive was to put the, some of the exceptions in. What I heard that, heard, um, uh, was being requested was that any ordinance be considered be limited primarily to indoor environments that exceptions mm -hmm. for people who, uh, the exceptions be permitted for people who either have some form of disability or some need or the, um, or any other reason that, that, is, that comes up, um, that it be mandatory for places that people must go versus places that people choose to go and that it be time limited. And age, okay. age for not for young children, maybe 10 and under, eight and under, whatever the CDC guidelines are. Okay. Thank you, Barb. That's my motion. We have a motion, do we have a second? Second. Uh, Alder Burnett for the last time. Thank you. Uh, I would, your, your committee, uh, Chair Stoyer and members, but I would vote against the motion. You already, made a motion to receive in place on file. That failed two to two. This is a way around what has already been decided. If the mayor wants to direct staff to create an ordinance to be ready for us to discuss next week, then that's his prerogative, obviously. But the action of this committee will be sent to the city council, and if we are doing government properly the way that we should, the council will then decide at that meeting to forward to staff to create an ordinance. This is a very wacky way of doing it. We've now, never done it like this. We never vote down something at the committee level to then direct staff to have it ready for the full council meeting. That is absolutely ridiculous. And for members of this committee to say that that is in any way appropriate, you are not being consistent with some of the things that have come up recently. I had an agenda item to allow the public to address the full city council before uh, on non-agenda items.
and I was told by Alder Dorf that the council should adopt such an idea before or we wait before we use any staff time to move forward with that idea. There is so much inconsistency going on right now. I think it's appalling. If the decision of this council was to receive and place on file, that failed two to two. Then to come up with another motion to basically get what, what is wanted, that's not appropriate. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, we're going to vote. Attorney. Alder Stevens. Can the attorney chime into what Alder Burnett just spoke with? Sure. Attorney? Yes, yeah, so we, we have actually received requests before to have documents prepared in time um, for council. Um, it has not been consistently. A lot of times it really depends on whether or not things are time sensitive, which is the the reason that things move faster. Um, so it, it isn't to say that, that that hasn't been the case. It also isn't to say that it is that it is or isn't the case. It just it's what the council ultimately tells us what they want to see and we we do that. Um, so I I I can't speak to how you guys want to do things proceeding moving forward, but I'm just telling you that we do we have done it both ways in the past. Um, where we have been we usually wait for direction from the council, time sensitive stuff or things that need to be drafted come up um, not usually at PMP, but we do it frequently for plan commission. We do it for um, the stuff coming out of DPW where they need stuff. Um, they need the, the recommendations from the, the committee documented for council to act on and we turn those into an ordinance. Attorney Chavez, um, I think there's other council members that aren't at the meeting that probably would like to weigh in. So what is your take on that as far as moving forward? I mean, I, it would be nice in some sense to have other, other voices from the council as well. So if we deny it here, you know, I don't know, can it be pulled again? You know, I, I just want to know what, what the process is on something like that. What I would recommend is that, um, so what I, and this is basically what's coming out of the um, the motion that I'm hearing, is staff is being directed to draft it and bring it to council for consideration at that. So that is an appropriate way to do it. Um, otherwise, it's just if, if the council, or I'm sorry, the committee wants to wait until after council has a chance to weigh in on this, then that is when it should well, be I personally without okay. an ordinance being drafted. I mean, I, you know, like I said, I voted against the, you know, initially this, the request, but, you know, my feeling is that I would like the council to weigh in on this, this situation. So if there was an ordinance drafted in a few days that we could look at, I don't have a problem with that, you know, just to look at it. And like I said, we may deny it anyhow, or we may accept it. Yeah. But my feeling is that I would like to have the input from, from the rest of the council as well. Mark, I'd like to speak to that. Go ahead. I don't feel that we need to draft anything before the, the city council meets. We don't have to have anything drafted ahead of time. It was already voted two to two. I don't think we gotta jump around a bunch of hoops and buzzers and whistles. Take it, city council, they don't have to have anything ready. This is just a discussion. Uh, we're not looking to draft anything tonight, and, and we, should, we should discuss it at city council. This is not a real popular issue. No, it's not. Uh, you know, as far as you know, having it all ready for city council for next Tuesday, I don't think that's appropriate. It was a two to two vote. Well, I don't let think me, we let me Mark, 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 yes. Mark we, we have to move on. We got we people move on. waiting. To we, we have to move yeah. on. I just have one thing and, to say. And let, we need to if vote. Alderdorf, okay. 10 seconds. If we, have, if, if we don't have something to talk about concrete at council, then how do we know what decision to make? We're going to just do the same thing we did tonight. And so we're going to, I think we just need to have something to look at and then say, no, that's not good. Or yeah, that is good. I want something concrete to look at. That's all I'm asking for. Thank you. So, Take it up on a question. 
Elder Storm. Oh, call the question. Yes, go ahead, Attorney yes. Bunger. Yes, go yes, ahead. So we have the motion um, made by Alder Lefebvre, seconded by Alder Stevens to refer to staff with director directives of indoor only restrictions, exemptions for disabilities, age, and other condi conditions, and to bring a draft to the next common council meeting to be considered by the committee of the whole. And now we can vote. Um, I'm presuming we should probably do a voice uh, call vote. Uh, Alder Stevens. Yes. Alder Vanderleest. No. Alder Stoyer. I'm gonna have to change my mind and say no. I'm sorry about that, but I, I feel no. Alder Lefebvre. Yes. That vote or that motion fails on two to two. So at this point, the committee has no recommendation on the item. Which it can remain that way and um, it can be acted upon by council at that time. Okay. Thank you. Before our next item, I'd like to take a five minute break. Okay. I'll so second that, Mark. To... Yeah, go I'll ahead and sell us. So what we're going to do, everyone who's here uh, via Zoom, just stay on the line. Um, we're not going to go anywhere. Uh, we do need a motion to get up and uh, we do need yeah. a motion to recess, though, Alders. Yes. Yeah. I'll second make that a motion to recess for ten minutes. And then uh, do we have a second by Vanderlees? Uh, Se Stevens made the motion. Vanderlees seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 We'll meet at 8.30, day 21, how about 8.30? Uh, yep. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. Back in session. One moment. Yes. yes. Okay, One thanks. Second. Okay, you bet. All right, good. Thanks. All right. Bye. Okay. Sorry about that, everybody. Yeah, we are uh attorney bunger. We are also recording again. Thank you. Okay, sounds good. We are on item number 14. Okay. Number 14, consideration with possible action on a request with Alder Galvin that the city consider taking fluoride out of the treatment process for the city water. Uh, another hot button issue. So I, there's a lot of folks that want to speak to this matter, unless some of some of the uh, staff wants the staff or uh, committee members want to say something, I, I would make a motion to open the floor. I'll second that motion, Mark. Okay, I made the motion, I guess. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes. So the floor is now. Hello? Um, you're, we can hear you. Just okay. Okay, we're, I couldn't hear anything. I thought maybe I no, lost. We're waiting. It. We're waiting. Oh, okay. Okay, good. Thank you. I'm gonna put you on mute for right now. Tell us, Dean. She's currently muted, so she may be doing something in the background. Sorry. All right, whoops, sorry about that. Um, okay, so Mitch's iPhone is first. Um, but, you know, all this story, I just wanted to let you know that we did have um, this arranged so that uh, Brenda Stoudenmeyer could oh, make yes. a verbal presentation. Right. So I would suggest, uh, Mitch's iPhone, if you would just be so kind as to okay. allow Brenda Stoudenmeyer, 
Stoudemire Indeed. to make her present verbal presentation. And uh, Ms. Stoudemire, I will give you five minutes if you just give me one second. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the clock up for three and then I'll start it again for two. Okay, just give me one second. Okay, go right ahead, Ms. Stoudemire. Thank you, Ms. Stoudemire, 1278 Doty Street. Good evening, City of Green Bay Protection and Policy Committee. I'd like to Alvin for recommending this topic and you all for giving it your close attention and care. We're here to discuss rescinding the fluoridation resolution that was approved in July of 1957. The mayor at the time called fluoride a poison and wanted a referendum before the program began. Instead, with pressure from special interests, council took it upon themselves to require the addition of 1.5 parts per million artificial fluoride chemicals to our drinking water. In the decades since then, and especially the past few years, much has come to light on what a mistake this was. The amount of 1.5 parts per million has been concluded to be a cognitive neuro neurodevelopmental hazard to humans by the National Toxicology Program's systematic review uh, draft last year. This shows how easy it is for something to be touted for decades as safe and effective, while in reality it's not. Presently, the level of fluoride allowed in drinking water is much higher at two to four parts per million, while the promoted safe level is now at 0.7 parts per million. Either way, the margin of safety is either very low or non-existent, and at the dosage, we cannot be controlled on the individual level. This goes against all modern principles of pharmacology. I want you to be sure that you all understand that there is no federal or state mandate to fluoridate. Since 2016, 16 communities in Wisconsin have stopped adding fluoride to their drinking water supply. Council has the unilateral ability to end this and are responsible for any harm coming from fluoride if you decide to continue it. It is in your purview and your responsibility to supervise this program accordingly. It is time to end it. I'm part of a federal lawsuit against the US EPA over the denial of our petition, which included almost 200 studies demonstrating that fluoride is a neurotoxin. I come before you today with my two lawyers, Michael Conant and Chris Nidell, and some of the leading researchers on fluoride to share the information we have learned since our 2016 petition. Much of the most important fluoride research on levels found in water and neurotoxicity have been done in the past few years, showing there is clearly an unreasonable risk present. It can damage the brain at critical times of child development. The National Institutes of Health has funded the most rigorous and well-done studies to, to date on imp in the impact of fluoride on neurodevelopmental. These studies were done long after most fluoride-promoting talking points were created. The artificial chemical hydroflow silicic acid that the Green Bay Water Utility uses for fluoride is a toxic waste byproduct from the phosphate fertilizer industry. This substance is not a pharmaceutical grade chemical and it is not used in any dental product. It is not sodium fluoride. It is not a mineral. It is not like calcium fluoride. It is not a nutrient. It is not like iodine or anything the body needs for proper function. It is not used to clean the water. It is not chlorine. It is a highly reactive halogen and is a toxin. Swallowing fluoride comes with many risks. It is harmful to the thyroid and so has a severe effect on those with thyroid disease. It is specifically harmful for developing babies in the womb and infants up to six months. When baby brains are damaged from exposure to toxins like fluoride and lead, they are more prone to behavioral issues, learning disabilities, ADHD, higher crime rates, and mental health issues. Stopping this program will help alleviate stresses on schools like Washington Middle School and other local schools where behavioral problems have shadowed learning. When I was pregnant with my son in 2010, living in Green Bay, it was difficult to avoid fluoride. I was low income and barely had enough money to pay rent and bills. I did not know what I know today about fluoride and the effects to developing infant brains. I am sure I exposed him during pregnancy and the critical times in life to neurotoxic fluoride from the Green Bay City water supply. He repeated kindergarten at house school because he had behavioral issues. If you're worried about teeth, we have a great free oral health program through Oral Health Partnership in the parking lot of house school, where there is an epidemic of tooth decay in a fluoridated community. There is also free dental programs at the Salvation Army Croc Center, Oral Health Partnership West, and NWTC. Fluoride can be used topically by those desired, and it is entirely unnecessarily to force everyone to drink it. There is no use for fluoride in a developing baby or infant until their teeth erupt. 
Adding fluoride to city water harms the most vulnerable during the most critical time in their life, and it cannot be fixed. A tooth can be repaired. A broken brain is forever a broken brain. Like I said earlier, broken brains lead to higher crime rates, burdens on schools and special educational programs, and increases in mental health issues. I'm asking you to please support me in voting to turn off the artificial chemical fluoride dosing pumps and protect the vulnerable brains of our children and our future citizens of Green Bay. I would like to end with a quote. Don't mess around with fluoride, it's dangerous. Turn it off and never turn it on again. It is not the job of the city to dose any substance into the community drinking water for the sole purpose of achieving a medical re result. If you continue, you're morally corrupt. Aaron Brockovich. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I like yes. to wing it and I hate reading, but. Well, you did fine. I thought you were a newscaster. Um, are there any questions that anybody would like to ask of Brenda? Otherwise, we'll keep moving along. And Brenda, what may happen throughout the course of this uh, point is that, you know, if we have questions, that we, we can direct them to you. I'll probably Thank have you. some maybe toward the end. So. so I'm good for now. So Celestine. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair. Next is Mitch's iPhone. I see you're already unmuted. So just give me two shakes and go ahead, please state your name and address for the record. Wonderful. Um, I am Dr. Mitch Sutton. I'm representing the Wellness Way 2638 Tulip Lane, Green Bay, 54313. Um, I am the clinical director um, at our health clinic and I am 100% in support with Brenda that we need to remove the fluoride from the water. Um, and she reiterated this more than enough, but definitely like talking about the, you know, hundreds of studies that are out there that fluoride is technically a neurotoxin. So it's considered just as deadly as lead or arsenic or mercury that can be found in the body. Um, not to talk about the countless endocrine dysfunction orders, talking, you know, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, um, also Hashimoto's thyroiditis, um, what that halogen can do actually has the same receptor site as you know what iodine will do in the body and iodine is used to create thyroid hormone but when there is fluoride it pushes out iodine which creates a toxicity which will elicitate the autoimmune response um, <clears throat> Also talking about renal dysfunction and actually the renal cancer um, that it can create with um, systemic use of overuse in the body if it does build up to that toxicity. And there are you know millions of people that have a difficult time with actually flushing out things in their system and that will build up and over time that creates dysfunction and that's what creates disease. Um, so basically, as I said, I'm 100% in support with Brenda um, on that and that we do need to remove this, you know, toxic, you know, neurotoxin from our water supply in Green Bay. Um, thank you very much. I'd like to ask a question of Mitch. So, Go right ahead. So Mitch, you, you are a dentist, correct? I am not a dentist. Oh, you're not a dentist. Okay. No. So what, was your, what was your profession? Um, I'm, a car, I'm a chiropractor. I see. Okay. All right. Um, I was just wondering, right. and, well, I'll, I'll ask it anyhow. Uh, mm -hmm. In your position, you know, I know some, there are some medical folks that have been afraid to, you know, they've talked to me or talked to some of the alders, but they're in fear of their positions a little bit or retribution. Do you have any feelings like that at all? Or do you feel like you can speak openly? No, I feel, yeah, I feel that I can speak openly on a lot of these things because there are, you know, patients that I see every day that have gone through countless different doctors that are trying to fix issues, but um, there's different ways of, of looking at things. It's not necessarily responding and just say, hey, take this medication, take this medication. It's more so, okay, let's figure out what's actually creating that dysfunction in the first place. So okay. it's looking at what creates that inflammatory response in the body. Oh, great. Well, thank, thank you for that. Celestine, I'm good on that. Okay, thank you, Alder. Uh, next, we have Michael uh, Connick. Uh, Michael, can you please unmute yourself and state your name and address for the committee? <clears throat> Hi, uh, good evening. My name is Michael Connick, and I am an attorney. And I'm actually coming from Los Angeles, California. And as Brenda had mentioned, I'm the Excuse lead attorney. Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Um, you will need to give your address yeah. in okay. Los Angeles, California. 
Thank you. I wasn't sure. So yes, my address is 3454 Vinton Avenue in Los Angeles, 90034. Thank you. Um, so I uh, was the uh, lead attorney in this case that's still going on. We finished our trial in June of this year, and we're still doing some post-trial briefing. But it's a case that's lasted about three and a half years, and we've deposed a number of federal scientists, including a representative of the Centers for Disease Control and a representative of the EPA. So today, I know I only have a couple minutes, but I just mentioned a few highlights or a few things that I think are important to consider when looking at this question of whether Green Bay should continue to fluoridate its water. And the first point is, in 2006, the National Research Council issued a, a landmark report on fluoride toxicity. It's a 500 page report where the NRC identified data showing that fluoride damages the brain in animals. And based on that data, and some, initial, some early studies in humans, the NRC recommended that we needed to do rigorous human studies to examine the effects of fluoride on IQ. They specifically called out IQ. And subsequent to the NRC's recommendations, you now, you've had two study teams funded by the National Institutes of Health, the NIH. One study team has done, this, has done studies on fluoride and IQ in Mexico, the other study team has done studies of fluoride and IQ in Canada. These are NIH studies that had careful vetting of the methodology by specialists at NIH. There have now been four publications from these, from these NIH teams in the past three years, and every single one of the NIH studies has found significant and large adverse effects between early life fluoride exposure, principally prenatal exposure in utero and reduced IQ and in one study, ADHD symptoms in the offspring. So you have very well conducted studies funded by the NIH, which have unanimously found neurodevelopmental harm from the fluoride exposure at the levels that people are receiving in fluoridated areas. And uh, I deposed a, the chief scientist on fluoride at EPA's Office of Water in this case, Dr. Donnie She testified that these studies warrant an entire reassessment of fluoride safety standards, not only in the United States, but around the world. I also deposed the, the representative of the CDC, and he testified in this case that there's no benefits from fluoride exposure prenatally and no benefits from fluoride exposure during the first six months of life for an infant. These are the periods of time of greatest risk based on these NIH studies. And the CDC admitted in this case that there's no benefit during this period of life, which is of greatest vulnerability to harm. So if, if you look at the most vulnerable population. Uh, I'm sorry, your time has expired. Um, there may be an opportunity though for us to ask you questions later too, so. Thank you. Okay, next we have uh, Kelly Archambault. Um, Kelly, can you please uh, unmute yourself and we will get going. Okay, thank you. My name is Kelly Archambault. Um, I'm a registered dental hygienist and work for, oh, the address is 1245 Main Street, 54302. Um, I'm a registered dental hygienist and I work for, for Oral Health Partnership, a profit organization dedicated to improving the oral health of the underserved children in Brown County community by providing dental services and education. We serve children on medical assistance, birth to 19 years old and the uninsured in need. Along with our four clinic locations throughout Green Bay, we also have a school-based program where we turn a school classroom into a dental office and see children during the school day. We also see children with severe dental needs in the hospital setting. Fluoride in our drinking water is one of our best and most cost-effective ways to help protect the children of Green Bay from a common childhood disease of dental caries. Of the roughly 4,000 children we served at schools alone, about 40% of those children had dental disease. If fluoride is taken out of the water, we will see those numbers rise. Even with the important program that Oral Health Partnership offers, there will be an increase in decay that causes pain, which leads to missed school time and impacts the child's learning. I'm asking you to keep the fluoride in the drinking water to help keep all the teeth in not only in our school system, but also our entire community strong. Thank you for your time. 
Thank, thank you, uh, Kelly. Thank you much. May I okay. ask a question? Oh, oh go yes, ahead. Yes. Oh, Alder Lefebvre, go ahead. Um, I'm not being facetious or anything like that. I just wanted to know, do you have studies that show that the fluorination in the water has actually improved uh, the health of the teeth? Um, because I, I, I'm just going to give an example. When I grew up on a, I grew up on a farm, and we weren't really, we were kind of poor and everything. And I did not brush my teeth like I should have. Not till I was older that I do this. Um, I think what we're probably seeing is that it's improving. Teeth are improving is because now we have access to toothpaste, toothbrushes. And because you do have a good organization like yours that you are getting to these young people who are in households that don't have a lot of money in that, and you are helping them with the proper dental things like toothpaste, toothbrushes, showing them how to brush their teeth, uh, different things that can be done. Do you really feel or do you have any documentation? That's what we need to know documentation that shows that just the fluoride in the in the water is doing this um yes studies show fluoride decreases disease in communities by 25 percent um, and i can share a study with you i'd also like to um refer you to matt crispine he is the um, president of the Children's Oral Health Alliance in Wisconsin. So he can also, I believe he's on this call and can answer questions as well. Okay, thank you. Kelly, if there's anything that you can send to the council, uh, I'll say that to anybody. If they have anything that they want to share with us, they can send it to the council members because we'll be looking at this at council next week on the 21st. Thank you. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, and there's one other thing. Have you uh, seen the uh, testimony that was presented in this case um, with the claims about the uh, toxicity of uh, fluoride? Kelly? No, I have not. Okay, that's something too that you, you should look at also, okay? Just, just to, you know, to be rounded on this, okay? Thank you. All right. All right. Okay. So Tell Thank you, me. Alder. Um, next, we have Chris Neuroth. Um, Chris, can you please unmute yourself and give your name and address for the committee? Uh, sure. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we sure can. Nope. Uh, my name is Chris Neurath. Uh, I'm the research director of the American Environmental Health Studies Project I live in Lexington, Massachusetts, 21 Byron Ave, 02420. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. I'm not going to give you my opinion on the neurotoxic risks of water fluoridation for children, but the opinions of the world's leading experts. The National Toxicology Program of NIH has spent the last three years reviewing the evidence that fluoride is a developmental neurotoxin. They concluded, quote, fluoride is presumed to be a cognitive neurodevelopmental hazard to humans based on a consistent pattern of findings, unquote. The NTP identified 149 human studies and 339 animal studies. The large majority of these found a neurotoxic effect. What are experts recommending based on this scientific evidence? They advise pregnant mothers and infants to avoid fluoridated water. I'm going to read a few short quotes from these experts that were published in leading scientific journals within the last year. First two are Dr. Howard Hu and Dr. Bruce Lanfear, both world experts uh, in early life exposures to environmental chemicals, including lead, pesticides, and other things. Both have done groundbreaking work on lead's effects on children and more recently on fluoride and its effect on IQ. They write, quote, there is no benefit of systemic exposure to fluoride during pregnancy for the prevention of caries in offspring. We found that fluoride exposure during infancy predicts diminished nonverbal intelligence in children. In the absence of any benefit, it is prudent to limit fluoride exposure using 
non-fluoridated water. A third expert is Dr. Philippe Granjon of Harvard, another recognized world authority on neurotoxicity. He writes, quote, elevated fluoride intake during early development can result in IQ deficits that may be considerable. There is little doubt that developmental neurotoxicity is a serious risk associated with elevated fluoride exposure due to community water fluoridation. That's what the world experts in environmental health say. What do the editors of leading scientific journals like the Journal of the American Medical Association say? In a podcast editorial, two editors said this, Dr. Rivara, the effect size is really quite large. The results are really startling, Dr. Christakis. Right, an effect size which is sizable on a par with lead, Rivara. So if mothers now come into their doctor's offices and ask the pediatrician what to do, what are you going to say, Christakis? I think I would advise them to drink bottled water or filtered water, Rivara. Yeah, you know, the other thing is that some people may not be able to afford bottled water. Thank you very much. Your time has expired. Sorry, Chris. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we have Dr. Beth Neary. Um, Dr. Neary, can you please unmute yourself and uh, we will get going. Please also state your name and address for the committee. Can my video go up too? Um, you know what? Uh, hold on one second. I tried to start it, but it said I can't. Let's see. Okay, hold on. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, you gave me permission. There we go. Yes. Hi, okay. All right. Give me one more second. Really fast. Um, my address is 428 Virginia Terrace, Madison, Wisconsin. Okay. And I am a pediatrician. I've practiced general pediatrics in Madison for many years. I've actually taught at the UW Medical School, but I'm not representing the UW Madison today. I am representing myself. Could you speak up a little bit louder? We can't quite hear. Yeah. Okay. All right. I said, I am representing myself. I am not representing UW Hospital. Just want to make that very clear. Okay. So I want to say that if you asked me last year how I felt about fluoride in municipal water supplies, I would have pounded the desk and said, it is the greatest public health advance in the last 50 years. And people who want to remove it are on the fringe. That's what I would have said last year. But today, I have a different opinion. And here's why. New research changes thinking and new research should always change thinking. The study that was published in the JAMA Pediatrics in 2019 was an impressive study in a credible peer-reviewed journal. And the data in that study was so contradictory to long-held beliefs that about the medical world and fluoridation that that paper was scrutinized so hard that I actually spoke to the researcher and he told me he had to go through many hoops to get that published. So they really looked at that very vigorously and they found that Male children of pregnant moms who drank fluoridated water had drops in IQ scores from three to five points. So you say, Dr. Neary, what's three to five points? Three to five points is a big deal. Three to five points was what Dr. Lampier found in lead, in low levels of lead. And that changed what the CDC recommended about lead. It actually, he made the CDC change the recommendation or his research did um, it's impressive. A change of three to five points is significant. So, and I don't want you to think it was one study that has changed my mind. I've read numerous studies, and as somebody already posed, uh, numerous people have said the National Toxicology Program reviewed many, many studies. And so here's the thing that I say to myself now. Am I willing to sacrifice cognitive development for the child's rest of their life? to prevent a cavity or two when we have other ways to prevent cavities? And the answer to myself is no. If my daughter said, mom, should I drink fluoridated water? I'm pregnant. I would tell her no. And if she was going to make formula for the zero to six month old baby, I would tell her don't do that. So I'm a pediatrician. I've had firm beliefs for the last, um, I won't say how many years, <laughs> um, but I'll tell you that I'm changing my thinking because I'm not going to sacrifice a brain for a few cavities. And I want you to look at the research carefully. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. Doctor, could you, what was the paper that you were um, 
referring to, the research uh, paper? Was, uh, the paper that was published in JAMA Pediatrics in 2019, um, and Dr. Lampier is one of the uh, authors on that paper. What is it called? Um, Brenda, do you have the full title in front of you? <clears throat> oh, wait. It's, um, I can send it to you. Could you send that to the council? Okay. You know, send that out to all of us. Thank you. Okay. So let's okay. Do. Thank you, Alder. Uh, Chair, next is Lisa Hansen. Uh, Ms. Hansen, can you please unmute yourself and give your name and address for the committee? Sure. Lisa Hansen, 217 Allard Avenue in Green Bay. Um, I, I don't come to this knowing, claiming to be an expert. Um, Brenda has done a ton of work on this over the last decade that we've been in contact regarding this. And um, I've only really started looking into it when my son was born and he's 10 now, so it hasn't been that long. But I come at this kind of as, as a parent um, to three children. Uh, I grew up in Alloway in the 80s when the fluoride levels were very high in the water. Um, and I still have dental fluorosis from it. My teeth are stained and have been since I was a kid. I also had numerous dental caries, and I realize that this is very, um, you know, causation does not equal, but um, it's very anecdotal. I understand that, but, you know, we're trying to do the best thing for our kids, and obviously mm -hmm. I had issues with the fluoride, and so then it takes it to a whole different level where I have to be, and luckily I'm privileged enough to be able to do this to you know, put expensive filters on my water so that I can take all the fluoride out because even bottled water doesn't necessarily protect you. Um, but as far as the dental care, we see a dentist in Sturgeon Bay, uh, Dr. Jennifer Olson and Dr. Kevin Clare, and they do not use fluoride in their practice. Um, you know, as far as dentists go, I, you know, if you're looking for what the experts are saying, these are people who will not use that on children or anyone. We don't get fluoride treatments at all. Um, I, going back to what Brenda said about how this is really what blows my mind about this is that we would never think to add a drug to our water source. And the fact that we do that with fluoride and saying that it's a one size fits all situation I just I have a really hard time with that that you're adding something to my water without my permission and I got to pay for it and then I have to pay to have it filtered out of my water um, you know you know even toothpaste tubes say don't swallow the toothpaste and I, you know I know that there are all those old studies about how fluoride is the best thing in the world and top 10 inventions medical whatever but you know they the the first studies that I was aware of, was about topical application, not ingestion. How can you equate topical and ingestion in the same breath? Um, and a lot of those studies as far as ingestion were flawed as well, not blind. You know, there was a lot of bias in there. So I just, I would really love to not have to worry about my kids drinking the tap water. And, you know, I already have the filter, so I guess that's a moot point, but I don't want to have to worry about that. I don't want other people in the city to have to worry about that. People who are not as, as you know, don't have the ab ability to buy a filter for their water. I want them to have the same consideration that I do. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I was gonna ask a quick question. Um, uh, let's see, where is that? You said you have a filter at home? What kind of filter is it? Um, we, uh, we started first with a Berkey Royal, um, but then we did, um, which is a freestanding huge, huge thing on my counter. But we did independent testing where I, we used brand new filters, sent it into a, um, a place actually in the valley somewhere, and it came back that those filters, the fluoride filters for the Berkey, did not filter out the waters. So now we use an Aquasana um, reverse osmosis under the sink thing. So, you know, the little spigot comes out of where our soap holder would be. So, I mean, but I mean, neither of those were cheap. And, uh, right, but it filters everything because we had that independently tested and it took out everything. Okay, and I, I realized I did some research on some of the filters out there too. And they were mentioning they had a, a study about a Brita filter that didn't really get the fluoride out, zero water and pure filters did. But like I said, it is an expense, so. Well, and any filter style, 
take it out. If you get a Brita, I mean, I've had Brita pitcher filters because I thought it was doing something, but none of those filters really do anything. You need something. There are like uh, gravity filters too, like the Sandgen, I think is the name of it, where it filters through like sand. And I mean, they're just very intricate, but they're also a, a huge expense and a huge, there's, you need to have a place to put these things too. Right, right. Well, thanks. Thank you for that. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, yes, next is, okay. uh, thank you, Alder. Next is uh, Griffin Cole, um, DDS. Ms. Uh, Dr. Cole, can you please unmute yourself and give your uh, name and address for the committee? Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, we certainly can. Okay. Yes. As you said, I am Griffin Cole. I'm a dentist in Austin, Texas, 1301 West 25th Street, 78705. Uh, I've been in practice for 27 years. And in the first year, I promoted fluoridation. And I, I applied fluoride to my patient's teeth because that's what I was taught. That's what I was told by my professors. And so I believe it. Why would I not? But over the next year, I just spent a little bit of time, very little, and this is back in 94, looking at the science. And I started to realize that I wasn't told everything. And it became a very easy decision shortly thereafter to stop doing that, to stop promoting it. And since that time, I've spent 20 plus years now trying to fight this in many cities in, here, uh, in Texas. Um, I gave a, uh, a presentation to about 400 dentists in September in Boston, and I only had an hour, which was not enough time, but in that hour, all I did was rebuke the comments that are, that are, that are, that are stated as facts by the ADA, by the American Fluoridation Society, by CDC, all these people that, that write out these things saying that they're facts, F-A-C-T-S. And I can just tell you, if you go to the ADA's website and look up their fluoridation facts, you're gonna find almost nothing factual. It's, and I'm not even joking about that. You can find science to dispute every comment that they make about how wonderful this toxic thing is. Um, I can make this real simple for people who don't know about the science, because you got a lot of great experts on this panel. I mean, these are some of the greatest in the, in the country, if not the world, that are speaking tonight. But I can make this down to three issues, three inherent critical flaws with water fluoridation. And I do this to all these little small, all these small towns that are, are trying to actually decide on this. Number one, it's not medical grade fluoride. We've already heard that. It's not sodium fluoride. It's not calcium fluoride. It is a toxic waste product from the fertilizer industry. And don't let any dentist try to tell you yeah, we hear that, but when it gets in water, it dissociates like regular fluoride. That's not true. That was disproven by PhD Westendorf back in 1975. Not medical grade fluoride. Number two, it doesn't do its intended function. There's never been a clinical randomized trial to prove that it actually works because it doesn't. So it doesn't do the function of trying to prevent cavities. And number three, and most important, there is no dose control. Okay, a, an infant baby that's being fed you know, through a bottle where most of the diet is water is getting way more fluoride than somebody say my size. So it's not even a comparison. You can't prescribe any medicine without having a dosage based on weight, height, size, all those things. And I think this is what it really comes down to because you can buy all the filters you want just like I can too, but the people that can't afford it are who we should be fighting for. They shouldn't have to make that choice. You should have clean water that's safe to drink. Thank you, doctor. Could you take a question or two? Absolutely. All right. I just, you know, I, I've, I've written up sheets, uh, bullet points against fluoridation and bullet points in favor of fluoridation and just the research I've been doing, looking at it and just trying to be as open-minded as possible. Uh, in favor of fluoridation, one of the comments made in testi testifying some time ago uh, maybe three years ago, it says the majority of cavities occur in 20 to 30% of the population. The disadvantaged bear a disproportionate burden of these cavities. And this is an example of people who live in non-fluoridated areas. Can you comment on that at all? So you're saying that you read somewhere that people who are in non-fluoridated areas have higher amounts of cavities? Yeah. yeah that's not true. Okay. Um, well, I just true. wanted you to comment on that. Yeah, there's been plenty of studies to show that that's not true. And in fact, the largest landmark study back in 1986 by the NIH, where they said, look, we're looking at 39,000 kids, which is a huge study, right? They looked at it and they, they said, 
we were comparing floor data versus non-floor data. When all was said and done, they said there was a, an 18 to 30% reduction in decay. So the Safe Water Foundation says, let us see your data. Let's see if that's really true. When all was said and done, it came down to about 0.06%. One sixth of one surface of one tooth. It, it's not even a contest. It doesn't do what they say it does. And the, and, and the systemic effects that you've already heard from lots of people today far outweigh that small little benefit that it may have. You've, you also find that fluoride can be ingested through the skin and through the lungs instead of just the mouth? For sure. For sure. So now you got to have your whole house filtered, right? So I'm just, I'm just reading some things and I just wanted you to answer that. I may, we may talk to you late, later on too. Can you stick around for a little while? I'll try. I've been on since 530. <laughs> yeah, I, I, thank you. You can see what local government's like. It's a lot of fun. Believe me, I've been up with my city council many, many times. So I know. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I'm impressed with most of the alders, by the way, because I love the most? way they're dealing with the other issues. So you're thinking. Uh, All right. Thank I, you, doctor. Celestine, whenever you're ready. Okay, yes. Uh, next, we have Jeff Harpt. Um, Jeff, can you please give your name yep. and address? On you, Paul, can you give your name and address for the committee? Yeah, my name is Jeff Harpt. Uh, I live at 440 uh, South Van Buren, right here in Green Bay, and uh, 54301. And um, I think it's quite clear from the the experts we've heard tonight that this is a neurotoxin we're talking about um, and that I just don't feel it should be put in my water supply um, that of my children that of people I love and um, I think it's a an expense we could do away with at the water department um, that's always good and um, in, uh, I'd like to address the young lady uh, who spoke about working in the the downtown uh, in the Green Bay uh, school dis schools, the, some of the, the um, disadvantaged schools, and about the amount of tooth decay that was seen there. And I would point out that that's tooth decay found in kids who are drinking fluoridated water. So I don't think the fluoridated water is benefiting them. I think that there's other dental issues in terms of lifestyle and uh, I commend her and her organization for working with them and teaching them probably better uh, better uh, habits in taking care of their teeth. Um, I think diets, I think some of the diets served in the school districts um, are high in, in sugar. I think that's one of the problems we have with, with uh, with tooth decay in this city. But I think, uh, I don't think the city should be uh, a neurotoxin in our water. And I think I'll keep it at that. So thank you for your time and thank you for your consideration on this topic. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. And next we have uh, Matt Crespin. Mr. Crespin, can you please unmute yourself? and state your name and address for the committee. Uh, Mr. Crespin. Can you hear me now? Yes, we certainly yeah. can. Yes. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Matt Crispin. Um, I am the Associate Director at Children's Health Alliance of Wisconsin, which is affiliated with Children's Wisconsin based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I live and wor or I work at 6737 West Washington in West Dallas, Wisconsin. And um, I'm here tonight to um, speak in support of continued fluoridation of Green Bay's water. Um, a couple of key things I want to just make sure I reiterate. Um, first off, fluoride is naturally occurring and it is a mineral and it occurs in nearly every single body of water and every source of drinking water in our country and really around the world. So there is some fluoride in all water, whether it be groundwater or surface water that we drink from our lakes and from the ground. However, we add fluoride to ensure that we help protect teeth. And it is, there are studies, as Kelly shared, 
that show that fluoride does reduce decay by up to 25% in communities that don't fluoridate. Um, there are cities that have removed fluoride from their drinking water and have seen an uptick in hay rates in their community. It's not the fluoride alone that does this, so it's a combination of things. Our organization um, oversees a school-based dental sealant program like Kelly's um, in more than a thousand schools across Wisconsin. We partner with Delta Dental of Wisconsin and the State Department of Health. Um, you, all, the older person should have received a letter from us today um, that is in representation of various organizations that support communication in Wisconsin. So those include Children's Wisconsin, HSHS Children's Hospital that's located right in Green Bay, um, organizations like Delta Dental that ensure uh, children and families across the state who know the importance of fluoridation in their community. Um, it's also from organizations like the Wisconsin Dental Association and the Wisconsin Dental Hygienists Association who are part of la larger national organizations who have policy that support this. These are hundreds of thousands of dentists, dental hygienists, in addition to thousands of pediatricians from the American Academy of Pediatrics who support community water fluoridation. Um, it, it's been talked about that there's this recent um, case that's pending and in regards to uh, more recent studies, there's been a couple of studies. One that debunked a myth that's often promoted by those who oppose fluoride around uh, the cause of osteosarcoma. Um, that's now been disproven with more recent research. There's also studies um, that were published by the Archives of Tox Toxicology, which is a group of European researchers um, that addressed the IQ issue. And I'm just gonna finish by reading a quote. Um, that says they concluded, based on the totality of the current available scientific evidence, the present review does not support the presumption that fluoride should be assessed as a human developmental neurotoxin at the current exposure levels in Europe. Um, so we really need to listen to the experts like the CDC who support this, the Dental Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, and continue to promote this safe and effective practice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matt. <clears throat> Matt, I'd like to ask a question too. Um, and this, this is off the favoring fluoride issue. Uh, one of the comments made was, that I read some time ago was the 2006 National Research Council has reviewed the EPA standard of how much fluoride is allowed in water before health issues begin to show up. Uh, and it has been at four parts per million, which is six times higher than what exists in the water today. The only health effect from fluoride is on the enamel of the teeth. They also found that there are no mus musco I'm sorry, <laughs> musculoskeletal effects, no thyroid issues, no cancer, no neurotoxicity, and no IQ issues among others. Uh, that's these are in favor of fluoride. Can you comment on, comment on that? It, yeah, the, well, I'd like to. Sure. These are experts that have reviewed the science, and they're they're sharing with you that there are no issues when it comes to that. Um, you know, in, in regards to the levels of fluoride in our drinking water, um, in Green Bay and across the state of Wisconsin, where um, more than ninety percent of people that are on public water supplies receive the benefits of fluoridated water. Um, that level is at 0.7 parts per million. Uh, many of the studies who those oppose fluoridation cite are done in uh, rural parts of the world where levels of fluoride are in sometimes as high as 18 parts per million. So you really can't compare those two things. Um, you know, when you, if you want to take a medication, you can take a medication that helps um, address something, but cause problems. But if you take the right amount of it, it helps an issue. Um, and so that is what fluoridation does. And so, you know, fluoride in Wisconsin, um, as I said, the recommendation is at 0.7 parts per million. And this body took up this issue in 2017 and voted to continue to support fluoridation in their community. And there's really not been new research that um, shows that any organization such as the dental associations, the medical associations, the CDC has changed their stance 
um, and is now recommending that communities stop fluoridating their water because of any recent research. And so, you know, this body, along with many other Wisconsin cities, cities like Milwaukee, cities like Madison, large Wisconsin communities continue to provide this great benefit to their to citizens in their community for a very, very low cost that does a great deal of work at preventing disease. There was one other point too. Uh, there was a study done uh, in Calgary, Canada, along with Edmonton some time ago. You may be familiar with it. They said there was at least a 17.9% jump in cavities after they stopped fluoridating the water. And um, the ca their cavity rates climbed at least 71% from the time they stopped. Have you read about this or do you understand that there might be other communities that have taken fluoride out of the water and what, what effect it's had? Yeah, that, that's actually the, the Canadian study and the Canadian cities that I was referring to in my testimony. Um, you know, one of the, one of the more, and, and I'll admittedly let you know that it's not recent, but in the 60s, the city of Anago in Wisconsin removed fluoride from their drinking water and they saw a pretty significant increase in young children in tooth decay. And shortly thereafter, after about a couple of years and seeing that dramatic increase, they resumed their fluoridation project. Okay, I'm familiar with that too. Thank you, Matt. I'm good. Okay, thank you. Next is Lisa C. Lisa C, can you please unmute yourself and state your name and address for the committee? Yes, hi, my name, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, my name is Lisa Crozier. My address is East 327 Lings Corner Road, Denmark, Wisconsin. I want to thank you for uh, giving us this time to talk about this very important um, topic with uh, water fluoridation. And I have a master's degree um, from Wisconsin um, in food science. I've been teaching biochemistry locally here um, for over 20 years. And I kind of come at this topic as a consultant consumer, as a mom, and as a scientist who studied food nutrition for decades. Um, my employer um, is not being represented in any way, shape, or form with any of my testimony. This is me speaking from my heart and my knowledge and my experiences. Um, I want to mention that the last person who spoke in favor uh, mentioned that you can take medication at a certain dose. And so we're admitting that we are medicating everybody for what we think will help a certain amount of people. So here again, I sat through and listened to the last couple of hours of the mask issue. Um, we have to think about group benefits and individual benefits. I really appreciate the dentist I've had for over 20 years, my orthodontist, the ones that have worked on our five children. OHP does wonderful work. Um, we have a lot of good dentists and healthcare professionals in Northeast Wisconsin. But we have to think about that a uh, gentleman from Milwaukee also said, at current, current exposure levels, fluoride doesn't do anything. Well, we know exposure levels differ, differ according to body weight and age, so children get ex exposed to more fluoride than adults would. The logic of this, from my point of view, thinking about the periodic table of the elements and those halogens and the idea that we need iodine in our bodies, and fluoride is right above iodine in the periodic table. It displaces, fluoride displaces iodine. And there is the logic of this that kind of made me think differently than how I learned in college about fluoride is that there is absolutely no enzyme body biomolecule. There's no reason for your body to use fluoride and your body doesn't use fluoride for anything. It displaces calcium in teeth, which is what the perceived benefit might be. Also, not all cities fluoridate water. Right now, Portland, Oregon does not fluoridate its water. San Diego, California, big cities here. Honolulu, Hawaii, Wichita, Kansas. We don't do this to everybody. For years and years, we used DDT, thalidomide. Science changed to always look to the newest and, and best studies that we have. So I do not support water fluoridation. I think we have other ways to deal with cavities. And I hope that the city of Green Bay takes this very seriously and saves money. 
Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Mm -hmm. May I ask a question? Yes, Certainly. Go ahead, Alder. Yeah, I, I think because of your background and everything, um, my question is do you feel that the reason that we are having problems with cavities, we still are getting cavities in our children, and that is it because our diet has changed? We are, I, I think we're consuming so much more sugar than we used to consume. Correct. Is that a valid? The basic teaching. Yes, the basic understanding of cavities is that there are bacteria that normally live in your, your mouth, that whenever there are carbohydrates in that mouth, the bacteria digest, and I tell my students, they poop out acid. So there's acid attacks on your teeth. So if we are chewing gum to increase the salivary flow to buffer the pH and get rid of that acid, or if we're brushing our teeth to get rid of that acid, then we don't have the cavity attacks. We are snacking all the time. We are sucking on lattes all the time. There's sugar in our mouth real frequently. And then we eat soft foods too. So diet really plays a role in um, dental care. That is very, very true. So, something's happening to your... You're, to your you're breaking up. You're breaking oh. up. Okay. Speak, try it again. Oh, okay. So um, as far as dental caries, sugars are eaten by the bacteria that are in your mouth. And that acid that those, that those bacteria will exhaust out will cause dental caries. So we have, uh, we have diets that are pretty high in sugar and that, that will lead to dental caries. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lisa. Okay. Next is Amanda Sleeper. Amanda, can you please unmute yourself and state your name and address for the committee? Uh, my name is Amanda Sleeper. I live at 1416 Road in Landenburg, Pennsylvania, 19350. I'm speaking to you today. Um, I'm a PhD in pharmacology and neurobiology from Yale University. And I wanted to speak a little bit about fluoride hypersensitivity. Um, so in 2012, I was diagnosed personally with a fluoride hypersensitivity. I didn't even know that this existed until I got this diagnosis. Uh, so at that point, I went and I read some of the scientific literature, and I was surprised to find out that um, these hypersensitivities have been um, characterized since the mid-20th century. It affects about 1%, uh, up to 5% of the population, and this is fluoride at the levels of concentration that we get in our public water supply when it's fluoridated. Um, because fluoride passes through the digestive tract lining as well as the blood-brain barrier, this can present with a number of different symptoms, and it varies from individual to individual. So this can include digestive distress, mouth ulcers, fatigue, excessive thirst, headaches and migraines, blurred vision, skin irritation, worsened allergies, joint pain, um, so there's a lot of symptoms out there, and for some people, it's very debilitating. So when I found out that I had this diagnosis, I decided to try to remove fluoride from my drinking water, my cooking water, my toothpaste, and um, beverages and foods like tea and wine that are high in fluorides. And I was really amazed to see the difference that this made in my overall health. Um, I've lived in fluoridated communities since I was uh, born. So I never experienced not having fluoride until this point. My energy was amazing. I got sick less. I didn't need antibiotics. I could exercise more. My allergies got better and um, some terrible rashes that I had on my hands went away and never came back. So having had this experience, my concern for the general public is that there are a lot of people out there suffering because of the fluoride in the water and they might not even know it. And even if they do get a diagnosis, it's very difficult to remove that fluoride from the water. So there's only a few systems that are really effective in doing that, um, distillation and reverse osmosis. And to do that in a whole house level is very expensive and prohibitive for most people. Um, 
I feel that putting the fluoride in the water as a therapeutic agent kind of denies people one of the basic principles of medicine, which is informed consent. So those of us that are sensitive really have a hard time um, you know, saying no to that and avoiding things that are in the public water supply. I just hope that um, you'll consider this population of people when you're making up your mind whether or not to continue this procedure. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Amanda. Amanda, I'd like to ask a question of you as well. Yes. Um, and my bullet points against fluoridation sheet, I, uh, I just wanted, there's a couple things that I, I was concerned about and I'm just wondering if you could weigh in on it. Uh, it has to do with the thyroid. So consequences from fluoride ingestion, well, I'm sorry, let me try again. Consequences from fluoride ingestion may be low thyroid function, aesthetically unpleasing teeth, a poorly functioning digestive tract, and IQ and attention issues. The thyroid produces several, especially thyroxin T4, which influences metabolism, growth and development, body temperature, and crucial brain development during infancy and childhood. Fluoride contributes to low thyroid functioning by displacing iodine, which is instrumental in the production of thyroid hormones. I, I just, like I said, I'm gathering data on both sides, but can you talk to any of that? I guess so what you said is correct and um, it, it does disrupt directly the thyroid function. I also believe that there's some other pathways through which that might happen. There's emerging data that shows that fluoride um, might affect the gut microbiome. If you're familiar with some of this from the wellness space, but um, the bacteria in our gut are very important for our overall health and maintaining our nutrients. Um, so when, if flora disrupts the presentation of the, the bacteria that are naturally in your gut, it can also lead to a lot of nutritive problems that can have an effect on the thyroid. Okay. And so they're also talking of, okay, thank you. Uh, they're, they also talk about fluoride being, or fluorine being natural, naturally occurring in water and, and such. And it sounds like uh, the folks that are against fluoride are saying that, you know, it's a neurotoxin and it's being added. So there, there is some natural element, you know, fluoride, it does occur in nature, but I'm just having a hard time understanding like, is that an issue, just having those those parts of fluoride in, in the system uh, without adding more into the, the water system? So the levels of fluoride that occur naturally vary from area to area, just depending on, um, you know, the ground soil and the area, local pollutants. So in some areas, fluoride might ultimately need to be removed by the water systems as we find the emerging harm from it, if it's natural. Um, but it, it is there and it could be a problem for hypersensitivity, hypersensitive individuals and they would still have to remove that. Well, thank you for your testimony. Okay, thank I'm you. I'm good, Celestine. Hey, okay, May I ask you a question? Oh, yes, May go ahead. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Um, I was wondering if she knows, um, because the natural occurring fluoride, is that completely different from this fluoride? Because this, from what I'm understanding, this fluoride that they're putting in is a byproduct of fertilizer. Is there a difference in those? Do you there know? Are, there are various forms of the fluoride compound. As far as naturally occurring fluorides, um, it might be helpful if we share, I, I'd have to get the references for you, but there are a number of studies that look at toxicity of fluoride that is naturally occurring. Um, there are studies out of India and China, um, and they find similar problematic effects in these communities as well. Okay. Does that right. help? Would, would you like to see some studies or mm -hmm. does that clarify yes. it all? Could you send sure. that to the sure. council? Could you yes. send that to our council? No yes. sense. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, Chair. Uh, next is um, Diego. Uh, Diego, please unmute yourself and give your name and address for the committee.
Diego, are you there? Okay, we will move on to the next person. Um, Mike Shea Jr., please unmute yourself and state your name and address for the committee. Mike Shea, 2751 Woodstock Court, Green Bay 54311. So I came for the masks and stayed for the fluoride. As a- uh, Good for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, as a local business owner, sometimes I look at things a little differently and the city is something I look at as a business sometimes. And in this case, I have some things to consider. Um, when you're looking at the city as a business, there's a couple of questions that need to be asked before you start making decisions on these things. The first is, um, what is adding fluoride to the water supply costing us? Uh, looking at the budget for the uh, Green Bay Water Utility, they list for this coming year a budget of $302,700 for chemicals, but it's not broken out. So they also don't list anything for medications or health or wellness. The only thing I could find that might cover this is chemicals. Uh, in the past, they've spent or about 280000 on this, on chemicals. So the question I would like the council, the city, to consider when thinking about fluorination is, what's it costing, uh, or uh, fluorination, what is it costing us to do that, and would there be a cost savings versus kids getting cavities or finding a different way to treat those cavities or whatnot in the city? Is this the most cost-effective way to do it? Um, the second question to ask is where is the fluoride coming from? Again, looking through the budgets and past financials, I can't see anything that says where the fluoride is actually coming from. What uh, if it is coming from fertilizer plants versus natural sources? Um, is there any kickbacks from companies for taking the fluoride? Things like that would raise flags to me. Um, I'm not an expert in this, I really don't know much about it, but these are just two glaring things that pop out at me. The people that are taking this fluoride don't have a good grasp on where it's coming from before it gets in their water, and they don't have a grasp on what it's costing as a city versus the cost of fixing the cavities or whatever other reason you have for fluorinating water. So that's all I had. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for your patience, by the way. <laughs> okay. Next we have uh, Chris Nidal. Chris Nidal, please unmute yourself and give your name and address for the committee. Hi, uh, good evening. My name's Chris Nidal. Uh, I live outside Washington, D.C. at 15505 Avery Road in Rockville, Maryland, 20855. Uh, I am, uh, my background is in chemical engineering. I've got a master's degree in chemical engineering, and I'm also one of the attorneys that represented Brenda and the other plaintiffs in uh, the, the, the ongoing lawsuit against uh, the EPA under, under TSCA. And there are a couple of things that I wanted to say, uh, a lot of them have been said, so I wanna focus on a few of the pro-fluoride points uh, and I just want to finish up one of the points that Michael Connett was raising when he was saying, you know, if we if we look at the most vulnerable among us, which are clearly when it comes to brain development, those are the fetal development stage and early infancy stage. Um, the studies are clear that when you're exposed to fluoride during those two critical windows of brain development, that there's a high risk of, of particularly neurotoxicity. And at the same time, there is no benefit. So we're not doing a cost benefit analysis there. We're imparting risk without adding any benefit in terms of any public health outcome that could be viewed as positive. But as far as the pro fluoride talking points, uh, a lot of which we've heard, the first one, the idea that fluoride is natural, um, you know, arsenic and lead are both natural, right? We spend lots of money to remove arsenic and lead from our water, uh, despite the fact that they're natural. And I don't think there's anyone here on this call that would willingly ingest any amount of arsenic or lead. 
simply because it was natural. I think that you know th that notion is just it, it, it. Nothing about that being natural makes it good for brain development. Uh, the second point uh, that was raised earlier that the ADA and you know all these various dental and and medical uh, groups have not come out against fluoride. Well, the editors of the Journal of the American Medical Association have come out and said that they would recommend pregnant women avoid fluoride. Well, what does that do for the pregnant women or those women that are considering getting pregnant in your community? Uh, especially when you're looking at the cost of filtration. Uh, a lot of people have talked about filtration. I don't want to get into that, but it's extremely difficult. It's costly when you talk about whole house filters. You talk about filtering your ice supply. It, it becomes a challenge. Another related point, uh, the CDC, we heard pro-fluoride people repeatedly hammering the CDC and saying, oh, they continue to support it. Well, they also say that the evidence of benefit is predominantly topically app topical application to adult teeth. So the CDC, that these pro-fluoride people continue to uh, stand behind, the CDC itself says, it only works to benefit teeth if it's applied topically to your adult teeth, not through ingestion, okay? We, heard, we also heard, and that is true, I see someone shaking his head. Um, uh, thank you very much, your time has expired. Oh, thank you, Chris. Chris, I was just gonna ask a quick question here. Um, you know, you're involved, you know, I think in 2013, we listened to issues on fluoride in the water. 2016 17 as well so this is our third go around with this topic so i think one of the reasons that you know anytime an issue is stopped for a couple of years the reason it's brought back is because of potential new research so i know that i, I guess i'm just asking in your opinion you know part of me says that you know you have you have this uh, court case that was out there and that that takes a, on its own life, so to speak. But what new research in the last three years has been uh, good to the point where we need to reconsider this issue? I mean, that's that's a that, that is, I think, the question because the the fact of the matter is is that in the last three to four years, uh, starting in 2017, the two groups that Michael Conant mentioned and and I think Dr. Neary mentioned as well. Uh, the Element Study Group and the Murex Study Group, both of those groups have done what's called a prospective cohort study, okay? And that is a study on human beings rather than animals. And those are studies done, they're viewed as the, the next best thing to a randomized controlled trial, okay? And one of the points that I would make is that there is no randomized controlled trial that shows that fluoride has a benefit, okay? So we have these prospective cohort studies that just recently came out and in the, last, in the last handful of years. And both of those studies are done at levels, number one, they're done with fluoride biomarkers. So they looked at, for example, urinary fluoride levels in pregnant women. So they're not looking, you know, trying to model or estimate exposure. They're, they actually have measures of exposure. And what those two studies both showed is that the effects of fluoride, particularly, particularly during these two developmental windows, are comparable to that of lead and range anywhere from two and a half to eight IQ points, depending on the study and, and what the measures were that they were looking at. So, you know, there has been a debate, and as you point out, there's been a debate that's gone on for years about fluoride. The evidence of neurotoxicity has been increasing to the point that we now have these two NIH funded, extremely well conducted, extremely peer and critically reviewed that, that all point in the same direction. When we have, to contrast that, the CDC saying that there is no benefit to ingesting this. And so we have a, a large amount of evidence of risk now culminating in these recent studies, coupled against very little, if any, evidence of benefit. And I know there was discussion of cities that show uh, an increase in cavities when there's fluoride removed. There are also studies that show uh, evidence in cities where fluoride is removed and there is no increase. So this, the, the studies on benefits are, are highly conflicting. You can look at that literature any way you choose, 
but the studies on risk are at this point very clear. All right. Um, one other thing, have you heard of a book called The Devil's Poison? Uh, no, I have not heard. Okay. All right. I just, I, I was reading a little bit from that too. Well, I, anyway, I, I, just... I am however aware, I, I, I have litigated against the fertilizer industry in Florida and I am very aware of Mosaic, the one who produces the majority of this fluoride waste product that's, that's used for fluoridation. And, uh, you know, I've seen their rail cars coming out of their mines. Um, so it is, it is not a myth that this is largely generated as a waste product that's, that has no place other than a landfill. Um, and so we're putting it in our drinking water. Well, again, I thank you for your testimony. Like I said, we on council, we need to look at, you know, the last time we heard this issue and then now, and then try to figure out any new developments that have come along. So if there's anything you can share that way, we can talk to Brenda and others too, but so. Absolutely. Thank you guys. Can, can I ask, can I go ask ahead. a question? Yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, would you characterize this as the same thing as, uh, I believe asbestos was a byproduct, and so they were trying to sell it you know they need to make they because it costs money to uh, landfill or whatever get rid of the, some of these byproducts. Would you characterize this uh, the same as the asbestos situation where we found out years later all these studies have finally come out how toxic the asbestos is to people? Well, I, I think it's difficult to compare this directly to asbestos, but what I would say is the comparison where industry has a history of finding creative new uses for its waste products. And, and it's important to point out, I think you made the reference, that it's not just that it's a waste product, uh, it's that it's a waste product that they have a liability for and they have to pay to remove. So originally fluoride was being released into the air by these factories in Florida. And in order to clean that up, they had to start consolidating it with scrubbers and when they did that, then they needed to find a way to get rid of it. So it is this, it is this problem that the industry creates a waste, and then they're looking for benefits, beneficial ways to use it. Another example was MTBE in, in gasoline. That was a waste stream that they found a use for to dilute the gasoline, and that caused a lot of groundwater problems. So I think the theme is something that we've seen before, where an industry has a waste product that's not only uh, not making them money, but actually costing them money, and now they found a creative way to use it to their advantage. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, uh, you know, I noticed that Dr. Johnny Johnson's here. We're, did you want to speak sometime soon or not, or do you want to wait? Uh, Celestine. Uh, yes. Um, well, I, he. Let me just. It's see up to you. Thank you. I'm enjoying the show right now because this is a repeat of what occurred in Calgary uh, back in October, the exact same scenario. Johnny, Johnny, give your address for the record. Uh, I'd like to not give my exact address because I've received uh, physical uh, and overt threats from people here as uh, well as lawsuits, but I'm in Florida, in middle of Florida, okay. uh, but I have, uh, I have no problem speaking about it. But I'm I'm just enjoying hearing the same same information that has been done before. So I would be happy to wait until later. Okay, we'll speak. okay. that's fine. All right, All thank right. you. Thank you. Just give me one second, Alder. Thank you, um, Dr. Johnson. Thank you. One second. All right, we will go back. Excuse me, to the top of the screen. So we have Gary Cohen. Um, Gary Cohen, please unmute yourself and um, give your name and address for the committee. Gary Cohen, 6841 Chester Drive, Madison, 53719. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, the first thing is that even if fluoridation reduces cavities by 25%. Most of the loss of people's teeth when they get old, older is not due to cavities, it's due to periodontal disease. And you don't hear very much talk about how great fluoride is to reduce periodontal disease because it doesn't. That's the first thing. Secondly, 
you've heard people talk about filtering the water. Uh, I live in Madison and we have really good minerals in our water. We have calcium, magnesium, and even strontium, all good for your teeth. Unfortunately, a lot of these filters take out everything. They take out all the beneficial minerals as well as the fluoride. I use a three-stage uh, filter that takes, leaves the minerals in, takes out the heavy metals and organic chemicals that are dangerous. And one of the stages takes out fluoride. It uses bone char. So just for those who want a, a, a good way of uh, purifying your tap water, and, and if you can afford it, that's a good way of doing it. Unfortunately, though, that doesn't help with bath water, and it doesn't help with shower water. And you need to have, a, uh, the best way would be a whole house filter, but those are very expensive. And for those of us who are renters, that's not practical. So that's my second point. And I think that was all, those were the major points I wanted to make. Oh, one other thing. Fluoride is an enzyme poison. I know there's been, it's been found that at least 100 enzymes are poisoned by fluoride. And that's only because that's probably the number that have been studied. Our body can't function without enzymes. We have thousands of enzymes. And if every one of those was studied, I'm sure you would find thousands of enzymes that are poisoned by fluoride. So that's one of the basic reasons I think that fluoride is such a toxic material. It's not just a neurotoxin. And that's all I need to say now. Thank you. Okay, next we have uh, Aaron DeGroote. Please unmute yourself and give your name and address for the committee. Hi, I'm Aaron DeGroote from Green Bay, Wisconsin, 54302-1625 Kimball Street. I uh, appreciate the platform that you guys have been giving us. We've been here since 5.30 just to talk right now. Um, I appreciate all the aldermen taking their time to listen to us. I have the perspective not as a professional, but more as a resident, um, which is pretty much all of us. I don't understand why the city or Wisconsin feels the need to put a toxin in our water supply to improve our teeth. It doesn't make any sense to have them make that decision for us. I expect pure water coming through my, I understand we need that, some additives to get it through the pipes, but we don't need fluoride. I have my own toothpaste. I have a water purifier because of fluoride. I would appreciate pure water coming through the water and I can buy my own fluoride. And think of it like this, why, why would I, what if you put vitamin D in the water when there's no sun? or protein if you need if you're exercising it you would never do that it's not for everyone fluoride is not for everyone it's a, on an individual basis some people need it the majority of us don't we have toothpaste another point is imagine the money that you're going to save taking out the fluoride i heard earlier today a, a sum of three hundred thousand dollars use that money for something else send toothpaste to schools um, awareness i just want to end up i i appreciate griffin cole i learned a lot from his him right now uh, brenda sodemeyer of course jeff and even matt crespin i appreciate your opposing view everything about this has been positive and i really appreciate everything i want pure water coming through my Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. I wanted to thank Gary too before for your testimony. I'm sorry, I'm sorry I missed that, but thank you, both of you. All right, Celestine. Okay. Next we have uh, Galaxy Two. Um, so that's Gal me. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Uh, just give okay, us one I second. Uh, excuse me. Just give me one second. All right. Please state your name and address for the committee. My name is uh, Dr. Diego Calderon. Uh, currently, I am at South 10845 Troy Road in Sauk City, Wisconsin. Okay, um, I'm a doctor in veterinary medicine and surgery uh, with a specialization in uh, food animal production medicine and surgery. Uh, I have more than 30 years experience in my field. Uh, also, I have uh, more than 20 years of experience in um, research. Uh, currently, I am collaborating with more than 10 different research teams at UW. However, I am uh, expressing just my opinion here. I'm not um, talking in behalf of the university. Um, so you may be thinking what a veterinarian is doing talking about fluoride, uh, fluoride in uh, public drinking water. Well, we found out about the, the toxic effects of fluoride just because um, the cattle show us the, the severe damage in uh, the main organs like kidney, liver, heart, se severe skeleton malformation, and um, damage of ligaments and tendons, Degre decrease of uh, the life expan, and especially in young animals. And this occur uh, in a very small dose like 30 parts per million. Currently, the approved concentration of fluoride in public water it goes from 0 0.7 to 1.4 parts per million. And we're talking about a cow of 900 pounds. Can you imagine the effects of a human fetus or a newborn baby? Um, so the, the intake range vary a lot and um, the, the concentration that we found in the public drinking water is all over the place. How we can guarantee that these levels are going to, to be low? Um, I think it's time, and I invite you to use uh, precautionary measurements for the well being of the Green Bay citizens, especially respecting mothers their babies, uh, let's avoid to put uh, our citizens at risk of rice uh, uh, toxicity. Uh, EPA already established that fluoride should be managed as a hazardous material. So let's um, wait and see the results of new research. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Um, I am open for any question. Thank you, doctor, for your testimony. May, may I ask welcome. a question, doctor? Sure. Go ahead, go ahead Alder. Yeah, um, I missed the first part. Uh, when did you do the study and you found out the effects on the, on the cattle? I, I have not done any study personally, but the effects of fluoride are known for a long time. Like since um, the um, 1800s or even before that, um, mm -hmm. Doc, uh, Alter Stewart wa was um, asking before about the the effects of um, fluoride in, in drink in water as mm -hmm. a natural occurrence, and actually that was one of the the signs that people found in the cattle uh, and then we the, the, the people that were looking at that discovered that it was because fluoride was present in the water or the soil okay okay th thank you thank you very much you're very welcome okay um last the last person i have here is uh, Nancy Quirk. She's the director of our water utility. Uh, director Quirk. Okay, my um, official title is uh, general manager. But oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, I wanted to just say a couple of things. 
Um, I'm hearing a lot of this testimony and I think that um, hopefully Robin from the state of Wisconsin Department of Health will come on and Dr. Johnny Johnson too will come on to support what we've been doing. I want to assure you as the general manager of the Green Bay Water Utility, my utmost concern is the health and safety of our citizens. We've taken one of the most aggressive lead service replacement programs in the country and we're down to less than 100 lead services in our city and we'll be finished by the end of this year. So we take this very seriously, the health of, and safety of our citizens. I've been in the water industry for 33 years. I just recently finished a term with the American Water Works Association on the Water Utility Council, where I was a regulatory chair. We worked with the technical advisory groups for many issues such as compounds, lead and copper, microbiological activities, and, and, and fluoride was off, often um, was on some of our talks. I want to assure you that during that, my tenure as six years, and I, I just finished at the end of June, there was no reports that were brought through the federal government or the CDC while I was in tenure that would have alerted me to the fact that fluoride would be harmful to our citizens. I assure you that if a study would have come through that it would have said that to me, I would have brought this to the Common Council because I will not not protect our citizens for the health and safety of our, of our people. Our, our chemical costs, I wanted to address that. We, we, we lump them together because we have to report them to the Public Service Commission, but we have chemicals in our ozone, which is a primary disinfectant that gets rid of all of our viruses. And that's, we have some of that for some of the off-gassing. We have a coagulant chemical that we use to, to get particles together to um, get them settled out into the industry. We also have chemicals uh, that will help with our um, filter beds uh, as we're doing our um, filtering, our, our final filtration process to, to cleanse the water. We do add chlorine uh, in the form of a sodium hypochlorite uh, to keep our disinfection out in the distribution system from um, protecting it from regrowth and other microbiological activities. And we do add a small amount of fluoride, the 0.6 to 0.8, um, is, is what's recommended by the CDC and we follow those recommendations. I, I was just recently, I am a professional engineer by trade and um, I've worked in, in water utilities in Madison and Waukesha and all, both those systems used fluoridated water and they kept asking us, children's health networks keep begging us to, to continue to add them. So I'm the Medical Association, American Dental Association, the Sun EPA. I'm looking to those experts and to the doctors and nurses that work in these areas for the best science that I can find. And I, as I talked to uh, Alderman Stoyer today too, I mean, I will look at studies, but as, as of now, I have not seen anything credible enough for me to stop protecting our, our citizens. Thanks. Okay, um, Attorney Bungert needs to address the committee. Thank you, uh, General Manager uh, Cork. Thank you, Nancy. Alders, before we move on, I just wanted to alert everybody as far as from a time management perspective, we, we have hit um, 10 p.m. at this point. Um, we still do have three ordinances that we need to, um, that are still on the remainder of the agenda along with two informational reports. Um, once we get to 11 p.m., I would strongly, strongly recommend we at that point recess um, for another meeting date. Um, the suggested time would be um, in the afternoon on Thursday to resume discussions uh, simply because we are at that point going into a realm of lacking accessibility for uh, public input with respect to the remainder of the agenda. Um, so I just wanted to alert everybody um, at this point in, in our discussion. Um, and, and whether uh, the alders feel that we can complete the agenda tonight or if um, we would like to go ahead and recess at 11. Uh, I would like to continue, I don't know, committee? I'd like to continue on, Alder Vanderleest. Okay. Would we like to resume that discussion at 11 to see where we are with our agenda? Yes. Okay. 
I we have a citizen with his hand raised. I uh, yes, except just, for the fact that there are other people ahead of him. So, um, Dean Hager, I do see that you have your hand raised. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm going to go on to Mark David Zahn. Can you please unmute yourself and give your name and address for the committee? Hello, <clears throat> my name is Mark David Zahn, 1100 Chantel Street, Green Bay. Um, since we are entering the realm of sleepy time, I'm going to keep this uh, relatively short and sweet. I am generally in support of keeping fluoride in the water. Um, from my own research on the topic, most of the science that I've seen is kind of thin at best and um, requires a little bit more study before I would uh, kind of go in that direction. And my suggestion, I don't know exactly how all the uh, inner workings of city government work, but uh, I would propose that, you know, why don't we put this to a referendum? Let the citizens uh, weigh in and um, make their own decision as far as whether this is something they want or don't want. Um, I know we've had a lot of people um, come here tonight that are clearly all embedded in trying to get this removed from the water and I would personally like to see my ability to have a say in this and have other people in the community um, give their own opinion through their vote. So that is all I had. Thank you, Mark. Actually, that, that has been talked about a little bit and I appreciate you bringing that forward. So that is something that we will discuss. Um, okay, Chair, we have uh, three other people who have okay. raised their hands. Um, so, uh, Paul Knett, Connett, can you please unmute yourself and give your name and address for the committee? Mr. Connett, I know you've been yeah, waiting a I'm long here. time. I'm here. Hello? Yes, you, I can hear you. Please give your name and address for the committee. My name is Paul Connett. Uh, I live in Binghamton, New York, 104 Walnut Street, Binghamton, New York, 13905. I'm a retired professor of chemistry who specialized in environmental chemistry and toxicology. I spent the last 24 years researching fluoride toxicity and co-authored a book on this subject in 2010. Um, excuse me. Okay. Um, water fluoridation has never been science-based. It is authority-based or belief in authority-based. It began in 1945 and it was endorsed by the US Public Health Service in 1950 without a single study having been completed. Uh, endorsements are not the same as science. We've heard a lot about endorsements tonight, but it's not the same as science. Saying that fluoridation is safe and effective over and over again doesn't make it so. I will argue that the evidence that fluoride poses a risk to the fetal and infant brain is far stronger and more significant from a public health point of view than any evidence that ingesting fluoride benefits teeth. Here are some undeniable facts. The placental membrane does not protect the fetus from fluoride. Result? The highest dosage of fluoride in milligrams per kilogram body weight per day goes to the fetus. The blood-brain barrier is not fully protective until six months of age. And again, the second highest dosage goes to the bottle-fed baby. A bottle-fed baby in a fluoridated community gets between 100 and 200 times the amount of fluoride a, a breastfed baby gets. Between 1990 and 2017, there were many human and animal studies that showed that fluoride had the potential to damage the brain. But the bombshells came, as you've heard, since 2017. Since 2017, there have been two rigorous NIH-funded studies that showed that fluoride exposure to women during pregnancy is associated with IQ loss in offspring. Bashash 2017, Green 2019 the first from Mexico City, the second from Canada. Another study in 2020, another rigorous NIH funded study showed that children who were bottle fed as babies in Floridated communities in Canada had lower IQs than children who were bottle fed as babies in non-Floridated communities. 
that's till 2020, nine IQ point difference. Meanwhile, no scientific study has clearly established that fluoride benefits teeth at the fetal stage or before the teeth have erupted. Most agree that the predominant benefit is topical and occurs after the teeth have erupted. Even if a very small benefit to teeth accrues during fetal or infant development, it would be a very poor public health policy to seek such a benefit at the expense of damaging the fetal and infant brain. Now, the National Toxicology Program has been reviewing this issue for three and a half years. And in their uh, draft review, they, which they published in 2019, they concluded- Thank you, Mr. Khan, that your time has expired. Hmm. Perhaps someone can ask me a question about that. Well, we may just stick around. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we have uh, Johnny Johnson. Mr. Johnson, if you would, or Dr. Johnson, can you please unmute yourself and state your name? You kind of already did, but just state your name and your um, general address for the, for the committee. Okay, thank you. Johnny Johnson, uh, PO Box 2450, Chiefland, Florida. I'm with the American Fluoridation Society, and I have uh, very much enjoyed the meeting tonight. If uh, you ever want to go back and take a view at this type of meeting and all of these same arguments uh, by Paul Conant and others here, uh, go back and watch Calgary, uh, Alberta's meeting back in October of last year, which it was a nine hour meeting strictly on fluoridation. And Calgary was considering refluoridating after a period since 2011 that they had stopped. They had a in the first three years, a 146% increase in cavities when compared to continuously fluoridated Edmonton. Now, let me fall back. There are a couple of other wonderful, unfortunately I say wonderful because they are cessations that have shown that absolutely cavities do increase exponentially once fluoridation is stopped. Okay, let me go back. I thought that this meeting was about the emergency in, or the, and what was used in the EPA case. I will like, just kind of mention that the Green Head House study, which I think we should probably listen to the authors of that study on, and it in the, the uh, case, which was about the Toxic Substance Act, not about actual fluoridation. Uh, the primary authors were uh, Till, she was the primary author, Christine Till, and it's called the Green et al. study. We'll be getting that to you. And a co-author, Martinez, Angelis Martinez Meyer, who I know very well. She also served as a co-author on the Mexican studies. Mexico uses fluoridated salt, not the same as the United States. We use fluoridated water, as Canada does. Christine Till jumped out of the blocks after the study, went on Canadian TV and stated how millions of IQ points were going to be lost across the world by fluoridated water and that we were going to have more people on the low end of the spectrum and less high end people of high IQ. A few weeks later, Angelis Martinez came out and said, I do not agree with Christine Till that pregnant mothers can drink fluoridated water. A week later, Christine Till came back out and says, I think I may have been misunderstood. Yes, they can drink fluoridated water. So I don't see why we're arguing about something that the author them, authors themselves say is okay to do. Now, I will be happy to go through any of the questions, any of the comments, including a filter that sells for 160 bucks that takes out 87% of your fluoride. There is no known fluoride allergies to skin ever. I have a reference on that. Thank you for letting me speak to you. Keep your water fluoridated, please. Thank you, doctor. May I ask a question? Yes, go ahead, Father. Um, Mr. Johnson, the fluoride, if we decide, say the whole country decides not to um, fluorinate their waters, what will you do with your product? Does it have to go to a special landfill or can it just be dumped anywhere? Well, the product itself does not have to be disposed of. If you, I live here in Florida, and if you drive by where Mosaic or 
any of the other companies. We have what's called Bone Valley here. We have a large uh, resource of calcium carbonate, which contains fluoride and phosphate. And that is something that is, when, when it is not used, what is left over is sitting in what's called slag piles. They're sitting in piles around the, around the uh, uh, plants. Now we do get products, it's called a toxic waste byproduct by a lot of people, but it's a co-product. We're using phosphoric acid from this same process. If you look at your sodas, phosphoric acid is in your soda. That's what gives it the bite. It's also phosphate that we're getting to feed our animals in uh, fertilizer, which in turns, turns, turns around as well as uh, drywall. Gypsum comes from this product. So it is a usable product, just as you would turn around and say a cow is a toxic waste byproduct of the meat industry. We get purses, we get cheese, we get milk, we get all these different organs and things. It is, it is a misnomer, purposely said that way, and fluoride does not only come from phosphate industries, it comes from two other sources, but the primary amounts come from the phosphate industry it is a very pure and, and uh, pure, a pure product that's very cheap. We don't have to mine rock and treat it, which would give you the exact same uh, acid, uh, that fluoridation acid to use. It is something that we can buy inexpensively and it's pure, it's tested by the National Sanitation Foundation, American Water Works Association, and has to meet the strict uh, requirements of the EPA or it cannot be used. This is not some willy-nilly process. Would your, uh, if your slag pile ended up completely going into a water supply, <clears throat> a river, stream, whatever, would the EPA come in and say that's a um, toxin and you have to take care of it? Oh, with any, uh, if it's chlorine or anything that is um, uh, controlled by the EPA, and that's happened, it happened in a, um, uh, an area in Louisiana. It was not a fluoridation uh, uh, phosphate industry. It was some other industry there. Um, they, they take precautions to line these piles with so that it does not leak. They also put berms around it to raise the area so it does not breach. Have breaches happened? Only one that I know of here in Florida. But yes, the EPA would rush in and take care of that. This is not something that's just off the wall. Well, let's just do this, and we'll turn around and sell it, and make some money. And I have been I have been called a shill for the industry. I don't take a penny for what I do. I'm a re retired, disabled dentist, and I am giving back to my community and those around the world to help have better teeth than I did growing up without fluoridated water. Fluoridated water does reduce cavities by 25% more than even on top of fluoridated toothpaste, fluoridated mm -hmm. products, and juices, and halo effect. It's an additional so, 25%. So you, yeah. So you I'm just, sorry. but I'm sorry, but you just stated it's not a toxin, but if it, your slag piles ended up contaminating a river, going into, going into a, a river, river whatever, whatever, that it would be ending up the EPA would say it's a toxin that you you cannot put it in the water. You cannot dump you cannot dump anything in the water without appropriately treating it. We cannot dump raw sewage into water without appropriately treating it. So yes, ma'am, any time you have I didn't say it was a toxin. Yeah. I said it is a it is a product that cannot be dumped into any body of water, as others have said. They can't dump it, so they get rid of it by selling it to us and telling us it's good for our teeth. You cannot dump any product into the water without first neutralizing it and through proper protocols. Yeah, I liked it. I just I thought it was so cool. It's so affordable. Hello. Um, are you good there, Kath? Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. Johnny, I was going to ask you a couple of questions, too. Are you okay. done? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Well, in 2000, you were, you testified in Green Bay three three years ago, and you you put in quite a bit of information. I'm just going to ask a couple of questions, and it's basically your testimony. But I just wanted you to expound on it a little bit. Um, uh, fluoride is a mineral that exists in all water around the world, as well as the soil and the air. 
seawater has fluoride levels at 1.4 parts per million, which is twice what you'd put in your water. Here to, so it is, you know, I've heard people say that it's a neurotoxin. I've heard other people say it's a natural element. You know, it's, it's a little confusing at times. So, as, as far as tea having fluoride in it, you were saying? Oh, seawater? Oh, no, seawater. Yes, sir. Uh, no, seawater has natural fluoride levels between 0.8 parts per million and 1.4. Uh, tea, if, if you asked about tea, tea has... I didn't ask about... No, I didn't. Okay, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm slurring. I'm slurring my speech. <laughs> you guys have been going at it a long time. Yeah, I, we have. Oh, I'll well. Go ahead. So, yes, it is naturally occurring, as, as Matt Crispine said, in all water, uh, naturally in uh, groundwater, surface water, um, it is typically at levels too low to prevent cavities. We discovered the benefit of fluoride back in 1901 quite by accident, and we did not know that it was fluoride that was helping to prevent cavities. But yes, there was a 30-year research project to go on and look at what was helping those teeth have less cavities, but to have some stains on them. And the Public Health Service found that once a probe was invented to, to fluoride in 1930, they tested areas where there were brown teeth and low cavities, and they tested areas that had good looking teeth and, and low cavities. And they saw that the areas that it was too high, it was not too high, but it was at levels of two to 12 parts per million, you would get a brown stain on your teeth called severe dental fluorosis. And at low levels, you would have reduced cavities. And that's when the project from Mother Nature teaching us was started in 1945, and that's when it showed us that huge cavity reductions occurred. Now, the National Research Council has been mentioned a lot, that 2006 committee, that is a totally different subject than water fluoridation. That is naturally occurring fluoride in water at two to four parts per million and above. Completely different conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm almost done here. I just, I think it seems like the Calgary Edmonton studies seem to be a real big one. And I, I don't know if there's any else around, any other ones around the world that we can look at, but it yes, seems sir. like that for some reason, that one seems to really stand out. And I, 1.3 million, 1.3 million people. It makes a huge impact when you've got people being put in the hospital to be un, put under general anesthesia because of the fluoridation having been stopped. There's also uh, Juno, Alaska, also had a cessation study that was out recently, as well as Windsor, Ontario, Canada, uh, had a similar situation. And Windsor, Ontario, we started refluoridation once we discussed it with them. And so has their, their cities that are on their water. Uh, Calgary is halfway to looking to restart as well. The science, nobody has ever stopped over the science. It has never been stopped in any community over the science of fluoridation. That is crystal clear and it continues to be studied. The overwhelming abundance, overwhelming body of literature is what we base our information on, not one or two new studies. They, they, uh, they add to the body of literature and those are good researchers that did these, but there are they did not measure what happened between birth and three years old. There was no measurements of what those kids had in their diets, whether they had arsenic, whether they had anything else that could have affected their IQ. There's holes in these studies, and we want to know what the, what the bottom lines are as well. But we can't place our hat on one or two studies that haven't been repeated and done differently. Or to be well, re if, there, if there's information to that effect that you can share with the council, I would appreciate it. Absolutely. Yes. So, sir. and I, I was going to ask uh, Mr. Conant if I could. Yep, I'm Mr. ready. Mr. Conant, did you want to did you want to reply to that? I mean, you've been kind of leaning forward. I just wanted to hear what your comments were on that question I asked. Uh, Alder okay. Sawyer, I'm yes, sorry. I can't do I that. Make, no, no, no. I just want to make you aware that there are three other people who oh, have yet are. to speak. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, Mr. Conant, you can hold. Well, can I just ask him? I, I just need a maybe. And 20 seconds. Yes, 20 seconds. Chris Neuroth was on earlier. He testified. Chris wrote a paper which was published in the same journal, which ripped apart this so-called Calgary study. I, I urge you to read Chris's critique, Chris Neuroth's critique of the Calgary 
study. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank All you. right, go ahead. Thank you. Go ahead, Celestine. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Thank you. Um, thank you, folks. And the next person is Dunk R.D. Um, Dunk R.D., please unmute yourself and give your name and address for the committee. Hi, my name is Dr. Ross Dunkel, and I'm actually the Chief Dental Officer and State Dental Director for the State of Wisconsin. And I'm here to speak on, on behalf of keeping fluoride in the water. My address would be one West Wilson, uh, Madison, Wisconsin, in the Department of Health Services. And I'd like to thank the committee for staying on so long with this <laughs> with this lengthy agenda and still staying awake. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You're more than welcome. One of the things my colleague, Dr. Johnson, had mentioned was the Windsor-Essex study that occurred in Ontario, Canada. Um, and just to give a little more information on that, um, in 2013, the city council there voted eight to three to remove fluoride from the water, but to do a five-year study. So over the course of time, then in 2018, they voted the same level, eight to three, to put fluoride back into the water system. And the reason being for that is because of the severe complications that they noticed as a result of having removed fluoride from the water system. One example was that they estimated the average total cost for emergency dental visits within the hospital system was over $500,000 per year because of the advanced dental infections that occurred because of the lack of fluoride in the water system. Another study that's been talked about is the, the green study and the LAMPO study that was done in Canada based on the IQs. Some things that haven't been pointed out is that the average IQ change that they were talking about in young males was from 108.07 versus 108.21. That was the different change in the IQ status that they had. What they also didn't mention or bring out in the study was that what happened is it was, gen it was not gender specific. For example, women or the girls had an IQ that was actually higher in the fluoridated group versus the non-fluoridated group. Other people that have looked at the study have also said that, you know, it was done on a spot urine analysis. Well, if you're going to study any kind of substance that has a very short half-life, you have to do the study as a 24-hour sample, not a spot urine sample, to be to be accurate. So as, as Dr. Johnson pointed out, there was a lot of flaws in these studies, or a lot of holes that couldn't be justified or couldn't be confirmed. And that's what we need to look at when we're looking at these studies, is look at them closely and look at the true science. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you, doctor. Okay. Uh, next we have, and I haven't forgotten you, Mr. Hager. Next we have uh, Robin from, I, I don't see your last name. Um, if you could please state your name and address for the committee. Sure. <clears throat> My name is Robin Kuster. Um, one West Wilson, Madison, Wisconsin. I am a registered dental hygienist and the fluoridation program coordinator with the Wisconsin Department of Health Services Division of Public Health. I work collaboratively on this issue with the Department of Health Services staff, including the state dental director who just spoke, um, epidemiologists and toxicologists on community water fluoridation and appreciate the opportunity to provide your committee with a statement on this important topic. The mission of the Wisconsin Department of Health Services is to protect and promote the health and safety of the people of Wisconsin. Community water fluoridation is a key component in our effort to reduce the burden of oral disease. Studies confirm that those living in a community with fluoridated drinking water have about a 25% reduction in cavities over those living in non-fluoridated communities. Water fluoridation is one of the most equitable ways to improve the health of children and adults regardless of income, insurance status, race or ethnicity, or ability level. In Wisconsin, over 3.5 million people, or almost 90% of the population living on public water supplies have fluoridated water. 
and in Brown County, with only three public water systems not adjusted for fluoride, 96.3% of the population on a public water supply has access to fluoridated water. As a state fluoridation program coordinator, I manage the fluoridation data in the water fluoridation reporting system for the, for the CDC. A review of, I should say for the data that feeds into the CDC, a review of the fluoridation data for Green Bay clearly demonstrates that this community consistently receives the recommended level of fluoride for optimal oral health. The quality of the operations within Green Bay Water Utility should be commended and recognized. The beauty of science is that we are always learning. Fluoridation is an, an area of active research for federal programs. They have panels of experts with knowledge, formal training in various health and scientific disciplines, and the capacity to review, interpret, and analyze hundreds of research papers. After 75 years of research and practical experience, the preponderance of scientific evidence indicates that fluoridation of community water supplies is a safe, effective, and well-tested public health program. The level of fluoride used in drinking water 0.07 milligrams per liter, in other words, a very tiny amount, um, does not pose appreciable risks of harm to human health. Everyone in Green Bay benefits from fluoride in the drinking water, including children, adults, those living with de developmental disabilities, nursing home residents, as well as those that have private dental insurance, Medicaid, or are uninsured. Available data does indicate that cavities remain a public health problem affecting many people. Fluoride has been proven to protect teeth from decay by helping to rebuild and strengthen tooth enamel. Thus, the health benefits of fluoride include having fewer cavities, less severe cavities, a less need for fillings and removing teeth, and less Robin, pain in uh, thank you so much. Your time has expired. Oops. Thank you, Robin. Actually, I have a quick question, Robin, for you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, do you, um, as far as the state of Wisconsin goes, what percentage of communities have fluoridated water? Which ones don't? I mean, can you give us a number as far as, you know, who, who fluoridates and who doesn't in the state of Wisconsin? Um, probably the best number that I can give you is of the entire population in the state that served by a public water supply, 90% of that population has um, access to fluoridated water. Um, the exact number um, of, of communities that fluoridate versus the number of public water systems that don't, I don't have that off the, the top of my head. Certainly most of the bigger um, communities um, are adding fluoride. It's, it's so. economically. I read, I read some things about Fond du Lac. You know, they, they had issues of whether they wanted to keep fluoride or not. What, what is the status of Fond du Lac as far as fluoridation? So Fond du Lac has um, some complex um, infrastructure that we're dealing with there. Um, they have um, a, a lot of wells, 20, well, 20 some wells, 26 I wanna say. I'm not even sure the exact number, but it's a lot of wells. Um, and they all have different levels of, of natural fluoride. Some of them have um, natural fluoride above the amount that they, above the 0 0.7 parts per million, um, and, and some are lower than that. So it's, 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 it's a Fond du Lac's complex. Okay, all right, well, that's good. That's good for me. Anybody else? Otherwise, Celestine, go can ahead. I, can I, oh, can I yeah. ask a question, Chris? Sure, go ahead, Alder. Yeah. Um, has your group done any studies on the effects of this fluoride on the developing fetus or the children, the babies that are being bottle fed? Um, because I do know that children are affected by chemicals a lot more than uh, adults. There, there is a, a big, I know there's studies done that the body weight and development of a child differs from an adult. Have, have sure. you done any and studies on that? So I can tell you that the, the Department of Health Services um, looks to protect all of the citizens in the state. 
we do not conduct research. We re really rely on our federal partners for doing that. Um, and I think, like I said in my testimony, they're the ones um, that really we have to do that. They have the expertise, the panel of evidence, or the panel of, of experts that can really look at that. So we really rely on our federal partners to, um, to, to guide us in that way and to look at the science and help us make public health policies um, that, that, that promote the health and protect um, all Wisconsin residents. They certainly look at that, that, that research and, and take into consideration um, the most vulnerable populations, including babies and infants. Those, that's, that population is considered when that research is done, when that research is reviewed and, and analyzed. So, so you have seen the NIH's last two studies? I have seen them, um, and I can certainly tell you that the the, the federal organizations that are looking at, at that look seen them as well and are well aware of them, and and have not changed any policies or any recommendations um, on what we should be doing with water fluoridation. Um, and, and, and research would come out we welcome that that research and if any new research would come out to, to suggest or to support um, that there may be populations that that uh, would be impacted by something such as the fluoride in the drinking water um, we would certainly um, look at that and consider our, our policies as well okay that's a good chance okay yep. All right, go ahead, Celestine. Yes, thank you, Alder. And uh, now, uh, Mr. Hager, if you would unmute yourself, Dean Hager, uh, maybe it's Hager, but um, if you would unmute yourself and uh, please state your name and address for the committee. My name is Dean Hager. I live at 3731 Big Rock Place in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. Um, I'm the Executive Director of Clean Water Action Council of Northeast Wisconsin where we have about 200 members who live in the Green Bay area. In 2012, the Clean Water Action Council passed a resolution opposing the fluoridation of water, of municipal water. We um, looked at the issue um, and prior to looking at it um, from a number of different points of view, my dentist had brought the issue up with me and and when, I, when she did, I said, well, I, I have a well, so it's not really something I should be concerned about. And then she went on to explain that um, the many different products that contain liquid uh, most likely have uh, fluoridated water in, whether it be soda, um, concentrated uh, beverages, or beverages made from concentrate, um, you know, any of those kinds of things, soups and so forth that are processed come from areas where there's typically uh, fluoridated water. So um, the, the board looked at this issue and when they saw that um, the CDC was saying that the uh, fluoride was most effective when after cavities, excuse me, after teeth erupted and that it was um, effective topically, not systemically, um, the board pretty much um, felt like that was enough information to realize that the uh, city uh, of Green Bay was using it as a drug to treat um, cavities, to try to reduce cavities. And after looking at this and, and realizing and what explaining or having what my dentist explained to me that uh, there are lots of different ways that you get this fluoridated water, the dosage would then be uncontrolled and different people would be getting different amounts of fluoridated water, uh, especially people who um, might not be able to afford higher uh, uh, cost products. They might not be able to buy net natural juices. They might have to buy juices and, and sodas and so forth that had more fluoridated water. So it also became a, a social justice issue where people who couldn't afford to purchase uh, unfluoridated water and use those in their homes for things like um, infant formula, they were subject to um, no choice. They basically had to add, add fluoride systemically to their diet. 
and yet the uh, effects apparently were more, uh, if, if there was a positive effect, it was tough. So when my wife comes back home, who's a oncology nurse and, and talks about all the young people now that she sees in her oncology clinic with different kinds of uh, cancers, it's a concern to me that we need to eliminate just this extra uh, chemical that we're exposing the uh, citizenry to. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Okay. And next we have um, David D. Um, David D, can you please unmute yourself and give your name and address to the committee? Yes, uh, it's David Deschamp. Uh, two on Shoulder Street, Green Bay, Wisconsin, 54302. Um, I kind of just wanted to chime in. Uh, great conversation on both sides, and it's a very good learning situation. And I kind of, just as a citizen, really want to chime in of thought process of mine as hearing all this and, um, you know, really hearing on one side that this is the recommended amount that should be in the water to uh, provide perfect oral health treatment and that's just kind of really interesting because anytime you do go to the dentist they are still offering this fluoride as a purchase product um, to you know put on topical and if you really are getting the perfect amount as they say or well, why are they still offering additional fluoride at that time um, so it's just kind of another thought process of you know why do they keep pushing a product or something that's ready supposedly being offered at the perfect level, um, you know, what is determined to be safe. So that's all I have to add. And uh, just thank you everybody for their insight in uh, this topic. Thank you, David. David, I just have one question. As a citizen of Green Bay, would you entertain the thought of a referendum at all or not? Yeah, yes, I definitely think that's a very valuable thing. Um, I do think that would be a good route to go, in my personal opinion, um, as long as there was a lot of open discussions or forums where people could become knowledgeable about the subject. Right. Well, thank you for that. Thanks for uh, staying up. <laughs> okay. And next we have, um, well, Paul Connett has already, or Connett has already spoken. There's, uh, so I'm going to take him last. Um, there's Kim S. Who's next? Kim S. As in Sam, can you please unmute yourself and um, give your name and address for the committee? Yeah. So my name is Kimberly Smith, and I live at 775 Edenberry Lane here in Oregon, Wisconsin. And I just want to talk about something that nobody else is, well, I guess Dean Hager kind of spoke on this, the civil justice issue. In a memorandum back in 1962, um, it was said, Dr. Russell told me today that Negroes in Grand Rapids had twice as much fluoride as others. So this community has known that the black community is affected by fluoride at double, um, twice the rate as whites. So, um, you know, they're asking, should we change the optimum fluoride levels? You know, does this indicate more studies? Were there more studies done? Because I've never seen them. So I just wanna kind of leave you with a quote um, from Dr. Alveda King, who is the niece of Dr. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. She wrote, the fluoride gate scandal continues to unravel. All water fluoridation legislation should be repealed in all states that enacted fluoridation. Generally, people with built-in biases in support of fluoridation have been controlling the discussion about harm um, from fluorides. The Centers for Disease Control has clearly been trying to preserve fluoridation at all costs, but the fact about fluorides, uh, the facts about fluorides um, harm are coming out anyway. This is a civil rights issue. No one should be subjected to drinking fluoride in the water, especially sensitive groups like kidney patients, diabetics, babies in their milk formula, or poor families that cannot afford to purchase unfluoridated water. 
Black and Latino families are being disproportionately harmed. And I would like to expound on that. Um, I was a single mother in Madison um, for quite a few years, and I wanted fluoride out of my water. I knew, I knew the dangers, and it was expensive um, to remove. So, you know, fluoride works, but what, at what cost? How can we get the same results um, without damaging the rest of our body? And I haven't heard anybody ask that. I think it's a cheap way to, you know, fluoridate everyone um, versus pinpointing those that need it. It's the cheapest way out. And I think that really needs to be addressed. So I would like the uh, public health um, hygienists and dentists to stop speaking for people of color. Um, oftentimes we don't want that in our water. So um, thank you very much. It's getting really, really late. I need to head to bed. So. All right, take care. Thank you, Kim. Kim, I was gonna ask you a quick question. If you yeah. if you have any any information that you have that you could share with our with our alders. Yeah. You, you, if you could send it to our Green Bay City Council. I did send you guys a PowerPoint, just a brief. Oh, did you? Okay. I did, yeah. If you'd like uh, any more, let me know. All right, that, that may suffice, but uh, you know, just if you feel that there's more that we can look at, please send it. I will. Um, like I said, there weren't any studies to um, observe the, you know, twice as much fluorosis in the black community. Um, to my knowledge, I mean, I'm sure that there are other people who might know that better than myself. So. Okay. Well, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Celestine. Okay, um, now we have uh, Dean Murphy. Dean Murphy, can you please unmute yourself and give your name and address for the committee? My name is Dean Murphy. Uh, my address is 2835 McFarland Road, Rockford, Illinois. Um, I just wanted to give you kind of my take on where I was coming from. I wrote the book, The Devil's Poison, that the alderman had already mentioned. And it, it was just kind of the journey that I had gone through, and I wanted to just just try and briefly uh, comment on that in two minutes that I have. But um, I'm a practicing orthodontist; have been one for 33 years now. Um, and why I wrote the book was I I saw these marks on kids' teeth. That's what I do for a living. I dry I dry teeth off um, and I and I put braces on them, but most of the time they're they're dehydrated or dried and I can look at the enamel and I was looking at the enamel um, and I couldn't figure out what all these marks were and it's much worse um, than you see when the teeth are wet, um, how much damage there actually is on these teeth. Um, so I was giving out fluoridated um, prescriptions to my, a lot of my patients for bad brushing and that's what I was taught in dental school. And I was challenged one day by a mother and it so affected me that I started doing my own research. And I kind of, you know, I knew what I was taught the last, you know, six years of my education and I had to do my own research myself. Um, and that's where I got back, um, ended up doing research for about 15 years on the subject. Um, and I, I finally compiled it all, put it in a book and I wanted to teach the dentists, um, dentists that I know in my area, um, dentists that I you know, had gone to school with. Um, and that's a lot of my um, time talking is with groups of dentists now. Um, but in a nutshell, the little white spots, um, all the dentists, pro-fluoridation and anti-fluoridation would all say that it's hypocalcification and it is, but they never get any deeper than that. And the reason that those spots are there is because the substructure is faulty. The collagen that was laid down first by the ameloblast was faulty. They were poisoned. Um, fluoride is a metabolic inhibitor. Uh, it blocks cellular respiration. And that's why those cells in that collagen becomes distorted. And then when the mineral goes to attach to the collagen, it ends up being defective. Not only, you know, when you drink fluoride, does it just go to teeth? There's no magic bullet and it goes to the brain, it goes to the bones, it goes to all the different systems in the body. And that's the real problem um, with fluoride, um, is that it's a general poison, it's not a, a specific one. 
Um, and it, it's so small, hydrogen uh, radius similar to it, um, it ends up um, crossing the blood-brain barrier and the placenta. So that's what I wanted to bring up. It's all the time I have, but um, it is a poison. Look into it and you'll, you'll discover it yourself. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Murphy. Um, I, did, I did go to your website and take a look at a few things. And I guess one of the questions I had, I have a few dentists that you know, gave me information via phone, et cetera, that were afraid to speak you know, here and you, you're not. So I guess the question I had is, I think that maybe, is there a fear of retribution by some dentists maybe to speak on this because of the stance that groups my, have? My first talk to my local society, um, they wanted to stop me at the last minute. Um, the group of dentists got up in front and wanted me to just, um, they just told the president they want to stop me from even setting up this topic. And it was a group of you know, close to 100 and some dentists. And the president knew me and she knew my integrity. She knew my intelligence. And she said, no, I'm going to let them talk. And I did. And I kind of floored them all because of the information that I had in there. Um, and they started realizing that they really don't know um, the truth behind it. And they really don't know. We, we, we get so much information across our desks from public health, from the ADA. Um, and it, and it's, it is what it is. It's a lot of it is propaganda. Um, there's a deeper part to this uh, monetarily. Um, and if you start digging, you'll find it. And that's what I keep telling these people. Um, it's one thing to be told it, but it's another thing to start digging it on your own and looking for it, and you'll find it. Um, and then it starts to make sense. And it, it, how, long, you know, how long did this take? How long did this take, all the research for the book? 15 years before I wrote it. I wrote it in 2008. And at the time, I had told um, it, I one of the first dentists or first authors to say that this is a neurotoxic agent. And at the time that I wrote it, there was five um, studies, they're all in China at the time, that it was neurotoxic. And the reason it's neurotoxic is because teeth are derived embryologically from neuroectoderm. So there's a strong connection between teeth, which are nothing more than calcified neurons, and the brain itself um, and the nervous system itself. And by the time, you know, now today, there's at least 65 studies out um, saying that it's neurotoxic. Um, so I put my reputation, I put my thoughts and intelligence on the line back in 2008, and it's true. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons I, I wrote the book and got it in print was, was to say, look, these are facts. You can't deny it that way. Well, thank you for your testimony. Welcome. Okay, Alder, we... Uh Chair, we have no one else who's raised their what? hand. Come on. Rick North? Rick North is raising his hand. You want to Um, Unless I am not seeing him. There's a Rick North. He's a good-looking guy, blue, blue shirt. Okay. Oh, uh, I see. Okay. All right. Nice, li um, nice library. Just give me a second. Uh, Mr. You. North, please state your name and address for the committee. Yes, my name is Rick North. I live at 17070 South West Durham, Oregon, right outside of Portland. Go uh, ahead. I like to start by just introducing who I am. Um, I'm the chair of the advisory committee for the Fluoride Action Network, the largest organization in the world opposing fluoridation. And I've been a volunteer on this issue for 10 years. Okay. Um, my background, I worked for the American Cancer Society for 21 years in management, the last five as the director of the Oregon Division. And before I retired, I worked seven years for the Physicians for Social Responsibility, uh, heading up a nationwide safe food program. So I'm not a doctor or a scientist, uh, but I just work with them my entire life, just about. Uh, I always favor fluoridation until a friend called me about 10 years ago he said, would you actually just look at the science on this? I said, okay, I will. And when I did, I was just amazed at how many serious health risks there were. And the evidence was so strong that I just changed my mind. And the, the main scientist, this has been mentioned before, but here I'm gonna a little show and tell. This is the National Research Council's uh, study, 2006 fluoride and drinking water. 
Uh, it is true they didn't take a position on fluoridation one way or the other. But what they also did was look at the toxicity of fluoride. And of course, if you put it in the water, there's no way to control it. So um, uh, just a couple of quotes. By the way, can you see? You see the uh, <laughs> the paper clip? Those are all red flags that I saw in this. Just a couple of quotes. The unequivocal nature of these. Fluoride interferes with the functions of the brain and body, is an endocrine disruptor, decreases thyroid function, increases the severity of some diabetes. There was no doubt about this back in 2006. And still, fluoridation has continued. So I just wanted to bring that to light. And uh, just a couple other things, because you know, the narrative you keep hearing is that this stuff has been proven safe. Uh, for everybody. Well, no, it hasn't. I'm just going to address some of the points that have been brought up. Uh, the Calgary Edmonton study, uh, that's been, you know, the, what you've heard is the rate went up after uh, stopped fluoridation. It did. What you didn't hear is it had been going up just as much before they stopped fluoridation. Be happy to send you that. These scientists that have been quoted and I think misrepresented. Uh, I, I, I will give you the quotes of these scientists themselves that have taken part in these studies and let, the, let you hear from them themselves. Um, and uh, this one or two studies, that's all they've got. The original petition to the EA against uh, allowing fluoridation, 57 out of 61 studies. Higher the fluoride, the lower the IQs. So uh, thank you very much. Your time has expired. Uh, thank you, Rick. Um, if you care to send that to our council, I'd, I'd appreciate it. What information you have? I, I will be happy to send that. And you had talked about uh, the attacks on the dentists, the threats. I have, um, I've actually prepared three pages of evidence, short quotes on how many scientists and dentists have been attacked for their stances against fluoridation. And this has been taking their jobs away. Their Alder, Mr. North's okay. time has expired. That, that, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Just send the information. Thank I you. will send that to you. Thank you. All right. Anything else, uh, Celestine? Um, I do not see anyone else who is. Let me just take a look here. Um, unmuted. Uh, Oh, I do see one person, Keith Decker, whose hand is raised. Um, Mr. Decker, can you please uh, unmute yourself? I think you already are, and share your um, name and address for the committee. Okay, uh, Keith Decker, Bristol Mountain Trail. Uh, thank you for, you can hear Bristol me? Bristol Mountain Trail in? Green Bay, Wisconsin, 54313. <laughs> Go right ahead. All right, well, thank you for dealing with this important issue. Uh, please give it your thorough consideration and care, and please go to greenbaywater.org uh, to hear what I have to say about it beyond this time limit. Um, I'd, I'd ask that you please speak further with the internationally renowned experts that have joined in today, uh, Paul and Michael Connett in particular. They know this issue inside and out, um, including the details of the science and the law. Um, there's a lot of different angles you can approach the topic with and a lot of details to dive into but as I see it the, the bottom line is uh, that public water fluoridation is unethical unsafe and unnecessary uh, because number one that it is intentionally as in the whole purpose of it is to be a forced mass medication violating an individual's right to consent and disregarding individual appropriate dosage. That sentence alone is reason enough to stand in opposition to fluoridation. It, it should not be the role of government to, to force innocent people to ingest the medication against their will. No one should do that. Uh, fluoride is not a benign substance. It's not a nutrient. It's, it's not used to treat the water quality. It's a prophylactic drug intended to medicate children indiscriminately applied to everyone in the community. Uh, if a citizen forced a politician to take a drug against their will, they'd be in jail. 
because it is inherently a violation of a person's body and it is obviously wrong to act as if one owns the body of another person much less the entire population uh, if, if if there's anything a person can rightly own it's themselves and the, the sanctity of one's own body is, is why rape is wrong self-ownership and free will are something sacred and that's why fluoridation contravenes multiple major codes of ethics and law the very first sentence in the Nuremberg Code is the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. Uh, in, in UNESCO's Universal Declaration on Bioethics and Human Rights, it explicitly states, in no case should a collective community agreement or the consent of a community leader or other authority substitute for an individual's informed consent. To circumvent that is a moral crime. Uh, fluoride added to the public water cannot be avoided as it cannot feasibly be filtered out and it goes anywhere the water flows. If there is anything a person is entitled to, it's elemental sustenance. Water is a vital necessity of life and it, it needs to be available free from drugs. It, it's not an appropriate way to treat a disease and you cannot control the situation. So please stop it. If it's morally wrong, don't do it. So I have more to say, but Green Bay Water Thank you, Keith. We'll, we'll look at that. Yeah. Thank you. Celestine. Celestine, you there? Hello. Oops. I'm muted. It Don't is rather us. late. Don't um, leave us. Yeah, I know. So we, I know that you wanted to, a uh, couple things. Um, so I know Attorney Bungert wanted to address the hour. Um, and open meetings laws. And so I'm gonna give Attorney Bungert the opportunity to do that. Yes, so we have we have hit 11 uh, p.m. <laughs> and it appears our discussion um, or the at least the public portion is completed for on the fluoridation issue. Um, however, we still do have three ordinances remaining on the agenda along with two informational reports. So I'm not sure what the committee's wishes are at this point, uh, whether we'd like to recess um, or Alder Stevens. finish up the agenda. I wanted to say one thing quickly. I know Alder Dorf, you've been hanging on for quite a while for for your item. Are you okay with if we went to Thursday with that? I mean, that would be an excellent idea. I have quite a okay. bit of information and it would take a long time. Yeah. I. Yeah, that's why I wanted to check. So Alder Stevens, do you want to go ahead? Yes, we need to make a motion to close the floor. Okay. Why don't you do uh, that? I'll second it. Okay. Alder Stevens, seconded by Alder LaFave. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So because of the 11 o'clock hour, I suggest that we convene until Thursday. I would like to make a, uh, one statement, Mark, before we close. Yeah, go ahead. We should no, no, vote no. on. We should vote on the fluoridation tonight. After all this discussion, mm -hmm. I oppose the fluoridation in the water. I make that motion. I oppose it. I, I well, like you know, I was thinking about. I was thinking of uh, Alder. I was thinking about this. I mean, we're all real tired. You know, I, I think it would be nice to have some finalization tonight. But we are holding off on three other items. But, but I'm, we're talking about, we talked on this item, Mark, for a long time. I think we should make the, make the a lot of things will be missed. I heard the discussions tonight. I feel yeah. that we should we should All vote right. on this right tonight. We don't, okay, we're, well, we don't okay, have to can, skip around. Hold on, hold on a second. Okay, okay. just calm down a little can, bit. Can I ask a question, um, uh, Alder uh, Vanderlees? Would Thursday be okay? Because we're going to get all this information that these people are going to be sending us. No, and I want I want to vote tonight on this it. item. This item was 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 drawn out for a long a long session, and I want to vote on it tonight. That's only fair. I do follow his your reasoning on that. Um, I'm still awake. I, I don't. Alder Dorf, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I would, but I would like a full and rich discussion from the alders on the committee. Then it just shouldn't go right to a vote. It sh you guys should have time to discuss this and to think about it and to talk about it. So if you want to stay, you know, on and, and do that, yeah, that's do fine. Let's stay on and talk about this right now. I then. think it's not a good idea to do that. Um, 
I don't think you should be jumping to a boat. <clears throat> and I think you have learned so much information that to process it until Thursday might be a really good idea. Thanks. That's I an honor. Her. Uh, Mark, I'd just like to make a comment quick. Go ahead. I, I've, I've listened to all the arguments on both sides. I don't have to wait till Thursday to make a decision. My mind is, I'm tuned in on what's going on and what's been presented. I want to vote on this tonight, and I oppose the fluoridization in the water. And we'll be <laughs> taking it up at, at council anyway. But I, I oppose it, and I'd like to vote on it tonight. I make that motion. Well, let me ask Alder Stevens and Alder Lefebvre, are you up for this tonight? Yes or no? I'm not. No, no. Alder Stevens? I pretty, I pretty much know what I, I kind of know, but I'd like to uh, get some of this information and go through it yet. And I'm sorry, it is really late for me, and I have to get up early tomorrow. I have to go to Sturgeon Bay, and I want to be, I want to be awake. <laughs> You know, Alder Vanderlist, I appreciate your your uh, intensity on this, but uh, Alder Alder Dorf brings up a good point that you know we're going to be discussing this for probably at least a half hour. I mean, if we're going to do it right, if we're going to do it justice, I know you have your mind made up, but I've done a lot of research on this as well. I've got pages. I've done some as well, Mark. Right, I understand. I understand. I'm not diminishing that by any means, but I think it's important that we have a clear head when we when we decide on this okay, so i'm fine then that's all i'm willing to go do. i'm willing to go to thursday I'm, I'm sorry if that disappoints you but <clears throat> i'm willing to go to thursday so alder stevens did you want to go ahead i would like to thank you everybody for speaking tonight it was greatly appreciated oh, yes very much i would so. i would definitely like to wait until thursday okay make that motion so what time um, Alders, we do need to set uh, the specific date and time. My um, proposition would be 2 p.m. Um, because staff does need time yes. to go through the minutes. This is a very, very lengthy meeting right. Um, right. to prepare the minutes and the report in order for it to be ready in time for council report on Tuesday. Um, it's still going to be a bit of a race because um, we do not have any committee meetings on Thursday for that reason. Um, however, that's the only time that we would be able to do because of the other standing committees that are set for tomorrow and Wednesday. So my suggestion would be the latest 2 p.m. Um, oh, okay the me. date is the 13th, 14th, the 16th, 16th of July. 16th. Yeah. And it will be a Zoom Zoom format such as this. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right, Alder Stevens, that's, is that your motion? Two o'clock on Thursday? Yes. Recess yeah. to... 2 p.m. on Thursday, July 16th. Yes, Dean. Okay, just and I'll second that. Seconded by Lefebvre. Um, Ms. Sawyer, if I could comment. Yes, go ahead. Your committee, obviously, you can take whatever vote you want, but just remind the committee that we're here for the you're here for the public. You now, this is a public meeting. Many city council meetings have gone until morning hours. Two one, two in the morning. So again, your committee, but you have a lot of people on this call right now from all across the country with a lot of different perspectives and expertise. Uh, just be mindful that, you know, recessing to a later time, I don't think is appropriate considering the fact that you could settle this issue now having just heard a couple hours of public testimony I just well, think delaying it and pushing it again, well, not Alder, criticizing you all personally, but we answer to the public. The public right. just provided comments for several hours. I think you owe it to them to to Absolutely. settle this issue on and move forward. Well, Thank Alder you. Burnett, you know, if that's the case, then I would, you know, there were a couple of citizens that talked about a referendum. I would, I would opt for something like that. That was something I wanted to talk about, but I wanted to hear that out with a number of the, you have, motion, you have a motion on the floor to recess. I'm not trying to hijack your meeting. No, I'm just but I'm just saying. I, I would well, prefer you all deal with Alder that. Steuer, is that yes, your recommendation? Ahead. Yeah, that would be my recommendation. I would second that. Okay, we'll put it the referendum. Anybody else? It would be a nay on a referendum. I think we should address the issue right now. A referendum we can do in the future. 
we, we have we can get that in the done in the future. But I think we should deal with this situation right now. City Council should speak up and say what they want. Wow. Okay. I'm sorry, Dennis. I'm sorry. If the if the council then says, yeah, let let's uh, take fluoride out, then uh, <laughs> then there's no reason to have have it. I'm um, sorry. I'm I'm so tired. I think I, I think fluoride is a big issue, and I think the city council should weigh in on it. Period. Well, they will. Well, 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 right is a big issue. I say we should vote on this right now tonight. With well, all the people that chimed no. in on the public, I, well, I think we should vote on it right tonight. Why? And and get get the get the votes out right now. Well, all the Vanderlees like this. Alders, we do seven. have a motion. Alders, we do have a motion on the floor. Um, yes. Which was to recess until Thursday at. at yes, we'll, we'll just take a vote on that. Alder Vanderlees. I'm a nay. The vote, the vote will have. Hold on a second. The vote will be for Thursday to get this information out. I know the people. A lot of folks are here. They really want to hear what we feel tonight. I, th I want to make sure that we're of sharp mind and just then do it at that time. My, my thoughts are, my mind, my mind is sharp right now, and I can what? vote on wait till Thursday. Yes, yes we know. You're, I don't know what you had for dinner, but I could use some of it. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, like I said, no matter which way we go on this, someone's not going to be happy. Um, I, I know. Alders, would we like to do a voice vote on the on the motion yes. on the floor? Okay. Yes. Alder Stevens. Yes. Alder Vanderlees. Nay. Alder Stoyer. Yes. Alder Lefebvre. Yes. All right. The motion to recess to 2 p.m. on Thursday, July 16th passes three to one with Alder Vanderlees voting no. Thank you. All right. So All right. We will pick up the remainder of the agenda on Thursday, um, and that meeting will be noticed and um, agendas posted. Thank you all for all your you. in testimony and time, and you know everybody get a cookie and some milk or something because I'm going to. All right. Good night, all. Thank you. Not not <laughs> not, not a cookie. Not a cookie. Yeah, it's you're cookie. right. Help. Oh, brother. <laughs> is this meeting adjourned? <laughs> yeah, uh, you look, yeah. Well, it's, it's, oh. it's how can it's we, uh, how do we call it? How do we call it, Attorney Bunger? Just um, I believe because we are recessed, it's essentially um, a pause and then we would resume the meeting. Okay, okay. so this meeting is okay. officially okay. recessed. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yes, it's been yeah. recessed. Correct. Thank you.